Hi guys, welcome to Novum. The complete guide to Midsummer is almost upon us, but in thank you for your patience a little while longer, here is the full free audiobook for This Vessel Runs on Rage. I'd like to thank the immensurably talented Mr. Toby Longworth for being kind enough to lend this project some much needed gravitas. I cannot speak highly enough of his skill, dedication, and eye for detail, and I'm so excited for you to hear his performance. I'd also like to thank everyone supporting me on Patreon and Joggernaut, Bill, and Stacey Ann for supporting this project directly. Your assistance was vital and sincerely appreciated. That support goes right back into the channel and allows me to keep pushing the production value. So without further ado... This Vessel Runs on Rage Written by Novum Narrated by Toby Longworth Introduction Before We were living in a comfortable place during a conflicted time. A time that had not tested us, or presented anything but luxury in our immediate lives, yet it still seemed persistently in peril of collapse. Scarcity for some, but plenty for most. There were the usual problems with contemporary evolutions, some new anxieties that had been invented for us. Wars over doctrine, collapsing economies, degenerating ecosystems, riots against the injustices of those in power. Endless flumes over a pyre that meant almost nothing to our comfortable daily existence. A determined and nebulous monument that we were but distant spectators to. Trauma was always fresh, and dread was always looming. But always the dread of others, always the trauma of others. Perhaps that is how it always is, until it isn't. We had met at university through mutual friends. She was fierce and full of passion, a singular and unmissable beacon of beautiful light. Brilliant, sharp-witted. I had fallen for her immediately. I was awkward and juvenile, but for some reason she saw something in me. We graduated together, and pretty soon we had found a home together, our quiet haven in our own little slice of the world. We grew as close as two souls could, falling deeply in love in a way I had not thought myself capable of. We worked hard, and we prospered well enough. We surrounded ourselves with friends and comforting things. We bought art we couldn't afford, and books we would be forever too busy to read. We had no difficulty seeing joy in life, because we had already found it in each other. Every time I would turn to look at her, she'd smile at me, like she hadn't seen me for a lifetime. She would smile into books as she fell asleep reading them, and smile at the sky when she stepped outside. She would paint, she would write, and she would laugh. Even at my awful jokes, she would laugh, an honest laugh. A laugh that sang like bells, loud and unapologetic. Not at all delicate, as she was. She loved the world too much for that kind of restraint. And when she did sing, even just softly to herself, I would sit happily enraptured by her beautiful spring-flower melodies. She was capable of such joy, such warmth, that over time it had begun to change how I saw the world too softening my edges and allowing room for an empathy that was shamefully absent in my youth. I loved her entirely. She was everything I didn't deserve. My only grace. After a few years of living together, we both knew we wanted to be married. I proposed outside the lecture hall, where we'd first met, under falling amber that marked the beginning of her favourite season. I don't think I'd ever been so nervous, but she could tell. She'd said yes before I'd finished stammering out the question. We didn't wait long afterwards. Within the year we had shared vows, a small ceremony, and the promise to spend the rest of our lives with one another. And, just a short while after that, on one particularly beautiful morning, we found out we were going to be parents. There was new life growing inside her, life that it would be our duty to nurture and protect. 
we decided to throw a party, mainly because it was customary to do so, and invited our friends and family to celebrate the announcement of our new child. And it was that day, a day like you've had very recently, that everything ended. I'm a shade now. Something I don't recognize. Something grotesque. A vengeful monster dwelling on a broken promise. A pawn at the edge of the board swelling with false confidence. A punchline. I remember what joy was. I remember her face and her smile and the love that would fill me when I saw them. But as present as those memories may still be, I cannot feel them. They're hollow. Good art in a bad frame. I conjure the sound of her laughter, and I can remember the glow I felt upon hearing it, but that glow no longer exists within me. There in its place is red rage and quick whispers of hatred. The extreme malice of my long dormant reptile. If I had to guess, I'd say I've been here almost a month. But I doubt you would know what a month is. A month of stalking the shadows of this unknowable place. A month of torment and viscera. A month without her. It has reduced me almost entirely. The awful truth is, it has probably been a great deal longer still. There is no real way of knowing now. As painful as it is to picture, rage must need a reason. This one is mine. She was mine. All the agony I could have chosen pales into insignificance at the cost of her smile. So, despite all the unfathomable loss, the billions upon billions of separate motivations, here is where I will start. I start here because I think it is what you will need to hear the most, even though I know with almost certainty that you will never be able to read it. I hope you make a different choice, if such a thing is even possible. Chapter One The sky was empty, a complete field of azure. No mottling of white, nor any perceivable shifts in tone. It was a rare thing to see it so cloudless, to be so without interruption. We lived a good distance outside of the city, but still most days the sky would fill with pollutants. It seemed to be getting more frequent, but it had always seemed to be getting more frequent, so that didn't bother anyone that much. On that day, though, the skies were entirely clear beautiful, but completely void. I wavered underneath them, squinting upwards at our cerulean ceiling as I soaked in the sunlight. The longer I stared, the more I lost my perception of what it was, of its position above me. The plush monochrome blue filled every edge of my vision, and it began to feel almost as if I could fall into it, dive into it, as though it were an ocean below. There was something illusory there, and as I faded more into my thoughts, I felt the destabilizing lurch of vertigo pull me forward slightly before I caught my balance. A fuzzy combination of beer and midday sun lulling me away from equilibrium. As peaceful as the scene above may have been, our garden was at that moment suffering from the havoc of energized toddlers, and the bickering of family members who would only ever see each other at events like this. Guests had been arriving all morning, and our quiet haven, now almost at capacity, was distinctly lacking its usual serenity. They were mainly family, some friends, and select work colleagues. Everyone we were close to that we wanted to share the day with. Everyone we loved. We tried to keep invitations to a minimum, but 
as so often is the case, inviting one person meant inviting another, and before we knew it we were suddenly short on space. Still, we didn't mind it crowded, and the sunny weather gave us an excuse to celebrate outside. The garden was in full bloom, and currently surrounded by a violent parade of colours, eclectic blends of fuchsia and marigold, battling to overwhelm the flower beds they grew from. Above them ran a thick green hedge, not quite tall enough to obstruct the view into the neighbouring properties, all of which were equipped with their own identical hedges and their own identical lawns. From the hedge to the house there grew dark green vines that twined and webbed their way upwards, their creeping invasion of the brickwork still in its infancy. A low wooden deck provided a bright pine bridge between the house and the lawn, although it laid practically unseen beneath the chaos of chairs and unwrapping of gifts. Wherever possible we had adorned the decking with blue and pink bunting and balloons, but much of it had already been torn down by overzealous infants and parents inhaling helium. Above the throng of clinks and pleasantries I noticed two little birds dancing a skittish jewel in the sky, the sun bouncing back off from their vivid displays of plumage. The speed of their fluttering was too fast for my eye, the true nature of their labour laying just beyond my perception. All I could see was my mind's crude interpretation of it, the illusion of them effortlessly bobbing in the air with an impossible buoyancy. They seemed entirely unaware of the festivities below, or at least unfazed by them, consumed completely by their own affairs. I was stood at the far end of the lawn, manning the grill. I had argued for it to be placed on the deck, but had been promptly reminded that the majority of our guests weren't carnivorous, and may have been offended by the presence of perfectly burned flesh. We had then debated the purpose of using the grill at all, but we were concerned that would have brought on another set of complaints from our more red-blooded guests. And so I found myself stood away from the main congregation, idly turning meat and drinking too much. I told myself I didn't mind. I'd always enjoyed time alone, and the crowd presented challenges my midday drunk wasn't prepared for. Any kind of calm I may have found in my moment of isolation was quickly torn away by the impact of a toy laser gun to the testicles. Startled and slightly nauseous, I looked down to see a hysterical nephew attempting to climb my leg with the high confidence of a seasoned mountaineer. Scooping the boy up into my arms, I did what I would usually do in this situation, and went to find my wife, so I could displace him as quickly as possible. I quietly reassured myself that I'd feel differently when it was one of our own, while trying to walk off the worst of the shock. "'Shall we go find Auntie?' I asked him, in my attempt at a soft tone. The boy nodded and pointed the toy gun at me, in what I presume in his mind was an actual hostage situation. I didn't search for long. As I walked back across the lawn, with the mountaineer in hand, she was stepping out from inside the house, the sun illuminating her smile as she saw us. She was carrying a wobbly tray of brightly coloured cocktails that posed a legitimate threat to her white summer dress. We were just talking about you, I said to her. Snitch, she replied, holding my gaze stone-faced for a moment before bursting into a giggle. Let me refresh our wonderful guests and I'll be right with you. No, no, let me. You know you have a problem with alcohol, I replied failing to remember that children don't have the best understanding of sarcasm or the rules of pregnancy. Problem with alcohol, announced the boy loudly, swinging the laser gun round to aim at her. We traded the child for the drinks as gracefully as we could, while she began to explain to him why sometimes grown-ups say silly things, and I mouthed my apologies. She didn't seem to realise she'd got the worst end of the trade. If she did, she didn't care. She was at home with everyone, and children were no different. I watched her for a moment before I left, captivated by her, and still slightly in disbelief of my good luck. She acknowledged my continuing presence with a coy grin to the side, but never gave the boy anything other than her full attention. 
listening intently as he explained the imaginary functions of the laser gun to her. I milled around, trying to clear the burden of the tray as expediently as I could. I had never known her to mix a weak drink, and by the winces following first sips I could tell these were no exception. Everyone was quick to chime in with how happy they were for us, how important these next few months would be, how having a child would change everything. Ordinarily, this may have been enough for me to display a twinge of anxiety, but at that moment, amidst the blue and pink bunting of our interrupted idol, I felt very certain about everything. I managed to break away from the bombardment of pleasantries with the excuse of needing to return the tray, an item that so far had been of tremendous help in avoiding relatives. As I did, I heard my wife's parents beginning to argue about the spiritual benefits of introducing our child to their religion, a conversation I was all too glad to miss out on. Her mother was of the aggressively held opinion that our child should be introduced as quickly and as traditionally as possible, as was of no surprise to anyone in the crowd. Her father, who had been trying to distract from the issues as much as possible, was now seemingly one stiff drink away from telling her he didn't believe any of it. I traded the empty tray for another beer from the cooler and went to sit down next to a couple we were close with, two of the friends we'd initially met through. They were trying to direct their blindfolded, stick-wielding daughter towards a multicoloured cardboard animal filled with candy. It had been suspended from the lowest branch of the only tree in our garden in the hopes of making it easier for her to assault. While still a good distance away from her stationary target, the child was already swinging viciously at the air in front of her. Her mouth hung open, and her tongue stuck out to the side, as all her focus was in guiding her arms to continue swinging. There was no strength in her strikes, and the stick was long enough to send her off balance with every motion, but still she attacked with all the force she could muster, righting herself with every counterswing. Her head was tilted to the sky, as if encouraging some dormant supersense to kick in and guide her to her mark. Just a little further, sweetie, encouraged the girl's father in between sips and small talk. We chuckled as she swung her way closer and closer. Despite the adorable lack of efficacy, there was still something primal in her attack. A determination and ferocity provided by the promise of victimless violence that would otherwise be saved for moments of extreme barbarism. Eventually, her flailing waddle brought her in front of the rainbow-striped creature, and her first smack against it clearly weakened its structure, causing it to sag visibly at one side. There was an instant look of glee behind the blindfold, and for the first time since I'd sat down, she stopped swinging for a moment. Her expression quickly turned back to determined anger as she doubled down, lashing out at the point of her previous impact even more viciously than before. She struck at it again and again, but the side would not break. Her parents gave cries of encouragement as she wound herself up for her next attack. With a slight yelping noise, she arced the stick up into the creature's underside, tearing its card exterior and giving way to a deluge of multicoloured sweets and chocolate. For a moment it looked as if she had speared the underside of some great beast, spilling its vibrant innards over the lawn below. The girl giggled hysterically, and her mother ran over to congratulate her as she tore the blindfold off to observe her kill. Her father and I applauded the slaughter, from well out of stick range. Having ignored the grill for a reasonably dangerous amount of time, given the presence of so many untethered toddlers, I lazily made my way back over to it to continue in my duties. To my side I was vaguely aware of the argument escalating, as voices began to raise and my uncle chimed in with his blunt disapproval of religion in general. I kept my head fixed squarely forward, and did my best impression of someone who couldn't hear the very obvious disagreement occurring a few steps away from them. The sun was almost at its zenith above me, and my skin had begun to prickle slightly from the warmth. 
A gentle breeze did what it could to temper the air in occasional moments, but it was no match for the overbearing heat. I rolled the cold glass of the beer bottle against my forehead before arming myself with a set of tongs. After a short time searing and turning and drinking and serving, I was right back in my own little world. I found myself blurrily gazing at the marbled gradients sizzling in front of me, languidly pressing the meat against the bars of the grill. I was only shaken back to attention by the sound of someone asking me to refill their plate. I apologized for my blank ignorance, and as I obliged their request I silently admonished myself for not being present, for never being the welcoming and fun host that my wife would so effortlessly be. As I leant down to retrieve a bag full of bread rolls that rested by the side of the grill, I noticed a small regiment of insects marching towards them. Wanting to avoid any contamination of our festivities, while simultaneously being too lazy to move the bread bag, resulted in one clear course of action to me. I leaned down to watch them for a brief moment, toiling across inches of soil towards their gigantic bounty, unaware of the overwhelming risk they'd taken on in accepting such a quest. I felt guilt over the futility of their endeavour, and a surreal sense of unease that they couldn't see the danger I presented, despite me towering over their landscape, eclipsing the sun itself. Why did they not run at the sight of this unexplainably vast being? Perhaps they did not understand I was a threat. Perhaps they were not aware of my presence at all, and I was simply beyond their frame of reference. I slowly raised myself back up and stamped the sole of my foot down on the main brigade of would-be invaders, and a few more times, just to make sure none of them had survived the initial assault. I then poured a small amount of beer down the hole they'd crawled out of to ensure their reinforcements couldn't continue the charge. In an instant the beer frothed up to the brim of the hole, and through some abstract strand of empathy or terror, my brain began to conjure up images of the genocide from the insect's perspective. A horrendous and unknown deluge of froth drowning them and wiping away their home, everything they'd built and ever known, gone, without explanation. I moved on from the thought almost instantly and checked the bread bag to make sure none had got through. I had won the battle, but not without sacrifice. Now I found myself almost needing another drink. Through the corner of my eye, I saw my wife heading back inside to the kitchen, the bright white of her dress reflecting the sharp sunlight. Quickly finishing my warmed remnants of beer, I walked over to her in the hopes of stealing some time alone together, as well as a much-needed escape from the overhead sun. As I crossed the garden towards her, the calm above us was torn apart by the discordant thundering of a wave of fighter jets. They ripped through the sky directly overhead, with only a few moments of approaching rumble as warning. We lived near a military base, and their frequent training exercises hadn't been made known to us when we bought the property, though we discovered as much almost as soon as we'd moved in. As disruptive as the noise was, I always found something quietly reassuring about the sudden intrusions. They may have been terrifying supersonic weapons platforms with an unparalleled capacity for harm, but they were ours. A radar-defying statement to our superiority over other nations, and a welcome reminder of our security underneath their watchful eye. Hopefully our kid will think planes are cool, I joked. She signalled back at the several children in the garden currently clutching at their ears, and making strained faces. I stepped through the back door of the house and into the cool shade of the kitchen, watching her face become slightly more serious as I did. Did you hear my parents out there? she asked me. Yeah, um, your mother has some interesting ideas, I replied, wishing I had not downed quite so much beer, as it had a habit of limiting my ability to tread lightly. She's traditional, she laughed but it seemed to trail off into sorrow. 
I am just so exhausted by their arguing. It was all the time growing up. And he used to be so much worse to her, so angry. He was always... I know, I said, trying to interrupt as softly as I could. She took a moment before replying, quickly sliding her circular silver pendant back and forth across its chain. Something she'd been wearing since long before I'd met her. A gift from her childhood. A metal crescent comprised the edge of the pendant, wrapping around in an almost complete circle. A constellation of stars that represented her birth sign filled the interior. The two elements were attached to each other by thin links of metal, skillfully hidden behind the careful arrangement of silver stars. It was tarnished and dull now, weathered from two decades of fidgeting. She'd play with it every time she was nervous, any time she felt sad or stressed, sliding it back and forth along a chain with more repaired links than originals. Just promise me we won't turn into that, she said, glancing out towards the garden before looking back up at me intently. You know, now you mention it, I was actually considering turning into a seventy-five-year-old woman with an unmatched passion for God, I replied, trying desperately to avoid a serious conversation. You know what I mean. Her tone had become slightly sterner. People who fight all the time. Angry monsters. Our child won't grow up with that. Promise me. I promise, I replied, far too quickly, and with none of the care that I should have shown. I audibly gulped upon realising how terse it had seemed, and she smiled as she watched my realisation, kissing me softly to prevent the jumble of apologies ready to fall awkwardly from my mouth. We stepped further inside, so we were out of view of the garden, and I held her by the waist, resting the bridge of my nose against her forehead as tenderly as I could. The sun was beaming in through the open door behind her, illuminating her with a soft golden halo. The sounds of life from outside were enough to give our conversation privacy from our guests. That was the last time we said we loved each other. A moment I know I'll never forget. I slid a hand across her stomach and brought it to rest, filling with a new kind of joy as I imagined the tiny heart beating inches away from my palm. We shared a bemused little laugh, still completely unused to the life-changing prospect currently blooming into being between us. She raised my hand to her cheek, kissing it gently. We held on to each other for a few more moments, just a little more tightly than before. I whispered her name. But her name would not mean anything to you. So that is the only part of this story that I shall keep for myself. The sounds of arguing from outside were slowly getting louder, and I was beginning to worry we'd have to go play peacemaker. Luckily for us, they were again drowned out by the deafening approach of the fighter jets, presumably on their return journey. They must have been flying low, because the sound of their pass-by was enough to rattle the kitchen windows in their frame. They were single pane, and original to the house, and for a moment I worried the glass was going to blow out from the force of the reverberations. The sudden sound of wailing followed from some of the smaller children, and I remember being pleased that at least the bickering of adults seemed to have been interrupted. I think it's about to rain, she half mumbled. She was gazing quizzically out of the door, and I turned to look myself, noticing the register of unease in her voice. The garden was more muted now, clear daylight still, but suddenly lacking the same intensity it had carried through morning. We stepped back outside and peered up to find the same perfect swatch of never-ending azure, same overhead heat. Yet it were as if the sun had passed behind a cloud that wasn't there, and now everything was a tone duller. Tantrums and crying fits from the repeated intrusions of the jets were being attended to throughout the garden by doting elders. I saw her father kneeling down and turning toddler tears to excited laughter with a seemingly never-ending supply of sweets from his top pocket. I tried to mentally plot out the best route through the chaos to continue dodging everyone, keen to get back to cooking. I started to walk back over to my spot at the grill when I felt her hand grab mine. I looked back to her, and she was still staring at the sky. 
Want to come help me? I asked, hoping to distract her attention. Does the air feel weird to you? She replied, clutching my hand a little tighter and pulling it ever so slightly back towards her. She was right. There was a humming to it, a closeness, some barely perceptible static unrest. Everything was still, but not the stillness of placidity, the stillness of something about to shatter from extreme internal pressure, a suffocating stillness. The breeze that had been gently passing through had faded completely, and now the air around us felt a shade heavier, the heat a shade more intense. To me, it just meant a good chance of a migraine when I eventually sobered up, but she looked quite concerned. I saw her start to run her pendant back and forth along its chain, and I stifled any questions I may have wanted to ask about pregnancy hormones and suddenly getting upset with the air. Instead, I offered a reassuring hand on her shoulder and tried to improvise as banal an explanation as possible. It's probably just air pollution from the I was interrupted by the jets approaching yet again. Their approach was even louder this time, and I span round on the spot, trying to scan for their direction. I had a quick snap of concern as to why they'd be flying over multiple times before they came into view, skating low over our neighbourhood about halfway to the horizon. There were five of them, flying in a tight formation. Sunlight lensed across their canopies, providing a crisp radiance, a sharp shimmer of gold cresting the top of each craft. Below their golden crowns, their undersides lay in stark silhouette, the macabre arrangement of weapon systems hanging like broken black gallows. They were moving fast, the heat of the air behind them waning and distorting as they accelerated into view. As they crossed the skyline towards us, they seemed to fan apart slightly, peeling away from each other, as if beginning some acrobatic exercise they were dangerously low to attempt. There was a moment of extreme quiet, a fleeting moment that seemed to stretch out, lingering, hanging in the mind longer than it should, while the brain struggled to compensate for the trauma of reality. Then the planes began colliding with the ground. The three aircraft at the front appeared to land in a messy cluster, and an obscene roar of orange flame burst into the sky from where they had impacted. The several rows of housing between our garden and the crash site blocked any possible view of the destruction, but the explosion was large enough that the top of the plume was visible from our remote viewing point. Another moment later, and the two planes that had been further back in formation crashed into the ground, one exploding upon impact, as the first three had, while the other seemingly splintered apart a fuselage and single wing cartwheeling wildly from a clipped rooftop before thrashing back down at terra firma. A lone parachute was visible, floating above the distant carnage. Chapter 2 I stood slack-jawed. The garden turned to panic and screaming around me as I tried to take in what had just happened. Up until very recently, my life had been one of relative luxury. Conflict and danger have not been familiar to me, like they were to the people flying those planes. There was no heroic spring to action. I didn't feel anything other than fear and confusion. Simply dumbfounded by the absurd and horrendous spectacle that had just played out in front of us. When my senses finally gathered, I realized her hand was no longer in mine. She was staring at the distant glow and bawling her fists by her side. Her eyes welled with tears she didn't dare shed. Those poor people! What happened? she yelled, struggling to be heard over the outpouring of shock coming from everyone around us. I could tell from how her voice wavered that if she'd raised it any louder, she would have broken into a sob. I don't know, I replied. Maybe some kind of malfunction. All of them? It was a reasonable point, and one for which I didn't have a reasonable answer. I waited for the sounds of sirens and tried not to imagine the horror that must now be unfolding at the crash site. The streets were nothing but suburban homes for a good distance in every direction. 
Given the size of the explosions, it seemed impossible that the crashing planes had managed to avoid them all completely, and that said nothing of the four parachutes that had been missing from the sky above the crash. I shuddered at the thought, and quietly thanked the universe that we hadn't been hit. If the planes had stayed airborne for a few moments longer, it could have easily been our house. It was a selfish and useless thing to think, but in that moment it occupied me far more than anything else. I began to look around the garden, trying to assess our guests, to make sure no one was hurt or in shock, not that I would have known what to do if they were. As I did, I noticed a creeping whine ringing in my ear, almost imperceptible in its approach, but ever so slightly inching closer. At first I dismissed it as a fleeting auditory issue caused by the sound of the crashing planes, but as it gently worsened, I became concerned the explosions had been loud enough to cause some kind of perforation or other such damage. It seemed a likely enough explanation, but still confusing, considering I hadn't experienced any kind of discomfort when the sound had occurred. I pressed at my ear canals, jamming and wiggling my fingers into them, in a vain effort to either confirm the damage or somehow miraculously dismiss it. I looked to my wife, still staring across to the crash in the distance, still only just holding back tears, watching the grey plumes of smoke and violent licks of orange invade the perfect blue in the distance. She looked distraught, terrified even, but she showed no signs of any pain or hearing issues. I quickly scanned all the turned heads in the garden, and saw the same shock and discomfort my wife was displaying, but no one else clutching manically at their ears like I was. I must have looked insane, grimacing round at everyone that stood transfixed by the giant fireball lighting up the sky behind me, jabbing at my ears in search of relief. My confusion turned to panic when the ringing began to move. I could hear it, feel it, roaming slightly away from where it began, drifting from my inner ears to something more central, until it didn't feel like I was hearing it any more at all. It was more like a buzzing in the middle of my brain. I couldn't distinguish where the noise was coming from. If it was in my head or if it were something I was actually hearing and no one else could. My eyes were wincing, and I could feel my body beginning to tense up from the discomfort of it. I forced my hands down to my side, trying my best to ignore it in the hope I could avoid drawing further attention to myself. As I did, a sudden and stinging shot of pain flushed into my temples, and the ringing sound amplified rapidly with it piercing and horrendous, screeching claws tearing at the inside of my head. I bent double at the surprise of it, and immediately clutched back at my head for any kind of relief. I must have let out some exclamation of discomfort, and quickly after I felt her reassuring hand rubbing my back. Through the heat of pain and high-frequency wailing, I could make out her voice asking me if I was okay. The bright tones of daylight began to singe at my vision as the pain in my head continued to build. I strained my eyes shut and used my hands to block out the glow as best I could. I could feel my eyes fitfully flicking side to side, fluttering back and forth as the nerves around them overloaded. The longer the ringing continued, the longer I was forced to endure it, the more I began to hear something decipherable in it. It didn't seem to be one perpetual tone, instead some demented, shrieking chorus, screaming over itself again and again in manic succession. The distant moaning of some insane hive, agony and ecstasy, and shrill, skittering chaos, a siren song of sheer pandemonium, something crawling through my thoughts, a violation. I felt myself drop to one knee, and let out a guttural moan, as if to try and vent the pain from my body. The bone of my skull creaked under the pressure, and the fire between my temples built towards an unbearable apex, 
as the ringing grew louder and louder, as if something in my head was expanding, something sharp, as if my whole cranium were about to splinter apart violently. Every moment brought fresh torment, ripping through me in short, brutal waves. I reached out a hand to find another point of contact with the ground, my eyes still clenched shut. I let out another panicked moan and suddenly realized I could hear myself. Relief. The ringing had stopped. I blinked my blurry eyes open to her concerned face and tried to quietly reassure her that I felt fine and that whatever it was had quickly passed. But judging by the look on her face, I probably wasn't hiding the underlying panic I was feeling as well as I thought I was. I was dazed, but I was okay, and my fear began to recede quickly back into confusion. She helped me back to my feet as other concerned guests rushed over to see if I was all right. I quickly thanked them and explained away whatever had just happened as heat stroke or something similar. It took me a moment to remember the jets, and I had a terrible pang of embarrassment before realizing that the sound of passing emergency vehicles wasn't intended for me. Does it still hurt? She hadn't taken her eyes off me since I'd opened mine. No, not any more. That felt like it was going to kill me, or drive me insane if it went on any longer. Probably not the best time to joke about that, she signalled subtly to the distant carnage and the panicked crowd. I wasn't, I replied. She scrunched her nose at me, as though it would help her process what I'd just said. Her mouth opened and drew a quick inhalation, like she was about to respond, but she seemed to trail off, slowly closing it again as her head tilted up and away from me. I don't know what it was, but I felt it too. Something innate, some rare frequency of recognition stimulating a prehistoric survival reflex, a dormant part of the brain trying to surge back into usefulness. Whatever it was, I could feel it telling me, urging me, to look towards the sky. I craned my neck directly up, squinting, still wary of the mauling pain of daylight moments prior. Calm. Placidity. Our ocean above did not show any signs of care for the crash below. The fire and smoke too distant to invade our waters. I took a breath and tried to ground myself. I found the same stale placidity in the air as before, the same suffocating stillness. And then, as if some great seal had been pulled from the planet, the air around us seemed to surge forward, a rushing gust, and with it a distant expansive sound like cliffs of metal scraping against one another. Not a present sound, but a gargantuan one, a sound carried from very far away, as if the moon were letting out a grieving moan. I felt the dull ache of dread in the bottom of my stomach. And then, it arrived. I cannot say it simply appeared, nor did it seem to fly. If anything, it blurred or glitched into view. At first I saw a hazy, distorted outline appear where it was going to be, and then the briefest moment later, its physical shape seemed to rush into the sky behind and slide to a halt inside of it. The whole process occurred in an instant, which was inconceivable for something of such titanic scale. Everything about it was inconceivable. In my stupor, I think that was the first thing I could identify as a reason to be terrified. The everything of it. The sheer impossibility of the object I was now confronted with. It was mythological, biblical, something clearly not built by us. A kind of grandeur that we had not even thought to envision. It filled almost all of the sky in front of me, stretching off far above the horizon, unreasonably vast and effortlessly suspended, as if it 
had simply decided it was beyond the universal laws that kept such strict rule over us. My throat dried, and my head span as it tried to adjust to the new reality it was being confronted with. Its design was unlike anything I had ever seen before, certainly anything airborne. It was far longer than it was wide or tall, and shaped almost like a colossal, crooked staff. In length, it was at least the size of one of our largest cities. That was my best guess, at least. I realize such measurements are beyond arbitrary, but I truly have nothing else to compare it to. It was larger than anything we'd ever built, anything we'd practically conceived of, certainly any single vessel or building, and due to its size and dwarfing position above me, it was impossible to get any true frame of reference on it. I could roughly make out its entire form, albeit with one side entirely obscured by my viewing angle, but it was so dizzying, so overwhelming in magnitude, that it was difficult to focus on it all at once, and instead I found myself having to take in specific elements to get any sense of detail. What I presumed to be the nose of the craft, if it had such a thing, sat almost straight above us in the sky, with the rest of the vessel stretching off far behind. So immense and expansive that the far end of it began to fade into half-blue as it mingled with the distant sky. As I looked closer, I noticed the sides of the craft were sectioned into various misshaped compartments, or rather, what I presumed to be compartments, but from the outside may be better described as shards. Enormous metal plates that seemed to join together to form a cohesive, scale-like structure. They didn't meet perfectly with one another, with each shard being slightly higher or lower than the previous one forming flush but misaligned walls along the edges where they connected. They wound around its exterior, wrapping under and away from view, only to be replaced by another identical row curling around from the top as if it were an aging tree gnarling around itself. The nearest end of the craft tapered savagely to a flattened point that filled the sky in front of us. A towering black dagger stabbing through the perfect blue, casting our world into shadow. It hovered there, perfectly steady, entirely motionless. Even though I could clearly tell it was stationary, as I looked at it, I could constantly feel the flinching threat of it tumbling out of the sky, as if the most basic parts of me were misfiring, unable to comprehend this rebellion against natural law. Entirely transfixed with fear, I could do nothing but scour the skin of this leviathan. Scanning its surface for any telling detail, any sign of danger, as if the craft itself were not the most blatant sign imaginable. Searching for anything I recognized as a weapon, as if it wasn't the most advanced weapon we would ever bear witness to. If it had windows, then I was not close enough to make them out. But there were a myriad of minuscule dull lights spanning the craft that suggested the possibility. At first I thought its structure was built entirely from some kind of black metal, but then I noticed it glimmer slightly in places, bright scars shining amidst the pitch dark of its surface. As I looked further back along it, I saw whole sections that shone in brilliant silver. While I could not be certain, it seemed as though the black material covering the craft was actually an accrued build-up of dirt and dust, lifetimes, maybe eons, of accumulative debris covering something far more spectacular, something majestic in its cruelty, something we could not comprehend. The ship was at its lowest in the middle where the shard formation wound down fluidly to a slight but noticeable dip in its structure, giving the vessel its crooked appearance. What I presume to be the rear portion of the ship, the end furthest away from me at least, represented the highest point, 
curving upwards and hooking back over itself like a stinging tail or the reared-up attack of a striking serpent. A humongous spiked curl that sat above the back third of the craft, grading from soot black to a chrome-like sheen as it approached a point. Fresh waves of biological terror cut through me. Something about the shape that my mind recognized as uniquely threatening, screaming at my unused survival instincts to stay away, that it would pierce and deliver venom. The most notably bright part of the craft came two-thirds of the way along its structure. Between the hooked upward tail at the very back and the lower section in the middle, there was a gargantuan ring of shimmering silver metal that sat snugly around the craft. It seemed to fit perfectly against the structure while remaining entirely exterior to it, just like a ring on a finger. While the two did not connect, the spiked tip of the craft's tail rested in the air directly above it, as if protecting it from threat. I could not see the ring well due to its distance and the angle of the ship in front of me, but I could still make out what looked to be giant glyphs all along the visible face of it. They looked as though they were carved deep into the surface of the ring, and even now I shudder when considering the scale of those markings, the depth of those gouges, and the craftsmen that cut them. The back sections of the ship were such a great distance from me that I could only really make the glyphs out due to their ridiculous size. The skewed viewing angle and curved face of the ring prevented me from being able to make them out in any clear detail. What was clear was that they almost certainly represented some form of language, the use of which brought with it another pang of terror upon realizing that such a device must have operators. Operators far more advanced than us. And, judging by its size, there were likely many of them. I recoiled from the thought, a heavy gulp gathering in my throat. My mind was slipping away from me as it fell into shock. It tried to find any ledge to grab to break the rapid descent. Maybe it isn't hostile. I knew this wasn't true. If there is one thing that this craft was for certain, it was hostile. I could feel it. I'm sure you could, too. This vessel was built for purpose. And while I could never understand at the time what that purpose would be, I knew what the sight of it was supposed to instill in me. I knew everything about it was screaming at me that running would be futile, that resistance was impossible, that I should simply submit and wait to be culled. I did so, obediently standing frozen in place, stuck in sheer terror, staring at something that could not possibly exist. Abaddon wrought real. My thoughts spiralled into uselessness as panic took hold. Being confronted by something so deposing, so destabilizing to the senses, rendered me unable to make sense of all the threats at once. I was too terrified to know what to be afraid of, too overwhelmed to form any kind of rational assessment. But, even though I could not put it into legible thought at the time, I think in that moment I truly understood my own insignificance, my soft little vulnerability and pointlessness in a way that I'd never truly believed before. It all felt so petty, so fleeting, so much more fragile than it ever had previously. Like the whole world was made from glass, our accomplishments just falling sand. All of it put into perspective in one moment the craft's arrival heralding a new-found impotence to the monument we'd built. It wasn't simply fear of death taking hold of me, but fear for the significance and continued existence of everything I'd ever known. The horrendous recontextualizing of our entire experience crystalline in one impossible threat, a machine that's very existence seemed to make us a redundancy, Every fresh realization brought with it a new and unparalleled anxiety. This craft, 
this thing had a destination, and that destination was here. This thing had a purpose, and that purpose was here. This thing had a creator, pilots. I could feel the shrieking lances of distress needling my thoughts into submission. The rising sting at the base of the skull, as if a moment's more intensity would cause some permanent shutdown of the mind. This thing was death. I begged myself to look away, but I could not. It was too perplexing, too impossible. Standing in defiance of the most basic forces of the universe, things we thought immutable, to have command over such things as gravity, to suspend something this large with such effortless grace, was still the work of gods to us. At the time I could not imagine the builder of such a vessel, nor could I imagine what those inside it would think of us. But now I see so clearly how much they must have despised us. Whatever frayed threads of logic remained within me simply shouted, It shouldn't be here, as if my dull understanding of things had any application to this cosmic predator. I desperately continued my hopeless appraisal, searching for any plausible sign that this didn't mean our imminent destruction. Clarity came flooding forth in that regard, as the giant ring structure towards the far end of the craft began to revolve spooling up on a slow drum march to inevitability. Calm at first, but still impossible to ignore, as a deep thrumming noise permeated the sky with each passing rotation. As the immense ring churned its way around in its gigantic holding, different glyphs moved past the portion of it visible to me. The frequency of the symbols began to increase as the ring steadily built up speed soon becoming a blur as it moved towards some unknown and terrible crescendo. As it did, I could make out some kind of localized energy discharge around the ring, sparks of plasma frothing in the air with frantic vigor, bringing with them a new and horrendous sense of dread. Time seemed to drag out as we all stood mesmerized by the increasing revolutions. The spooling sound above was frantic, each thrum indistinguishable from the next. It was only drowned out momentarily when the same noise that had preceded the craft sounded again, the bellowing scrape of metal cliffs filling the air in front of us, and then around us, vibrating the ground below us, the sky filled with dancing frenetic purples, violent neon auras lashing at the surrounding blue crackling, surging energy, sparking away from the surface of the rapidly rotating ring, horrifying and hypnotic. I could see it starting to arc and draw its way through the sky towards the great spiked tail above it. Oscillating back and forth between the ring and its tip, its vigour building with every pulse as it moved towards some reaction of unthinkable power. A rapidly growing ball of purple plasma began gathering at the tip, barely tethered there as it raged spasmodically to be let loose. Whatever was coming, I had no doubt it would be the end. The thought pulled me from paralysis, and I turned to look at her, determined to feel something else in my final moments beyond fear. She was still frozen in the same upwards gaze I had been, her expression locked in abject terror as every certainty she'd ever known melted away. I grabbed her face with both hands and pulled her to look at me. She seemed to snap back to reality and immediately began trembling. My body began violently shaking too, the rush of adrenaline causing my jaw to chatter and my knees to smack together as my body failed to control the frenzy. I tried to hold her eye contact and bring her focus to me. I had no idea what I should say. I doubt I was even capable of speech. I knew, in that moment, that there was nothing I could do to keep her safe. 
I knew whatever was coming wasn't something we could fight or run from. I felt someone scrabble at my arm, and if not for the deafening whinny of the ring's rotation, I may have heard them scream at us to run. It didn't matter. I looked into her eyes for one last time. She was so kind, so full of life and joy and starlight. One moment looking into those eyes was enough to tell you everything about her. Her face had turned from terror to warmth. I couldn't hear what she said to me, but I know that she said it with love, that even then she was still trying to reassure me, still trying to care for me. All I could think to do was stare at her, take her all in as best I could. She held my gaze and moved in to kiss me. I just stared. Above us, the horn of an old god broke the sky, loud enough to make the very earth tremble beneath our feet, loud enough that the glass of the house shattered in a scream of shards and the brick behind her began to splinter apart, loud enough that her eyes turned to crimson. It was agony. I tasted bitter iron in my mouth, and I could feel my brain shaking, shearing, crackling like candy floss. She fell into my arms, erupting blood. Her body went still, as everyone I loved slapped to the floor around me in hideous piles. I stood there for a moment, wavering under my own bewilderment. Then, presumably, I hit the ground. Chapter 3 I do not know how I was spared. I do not know why I was spared. But I use the term spared purposefully, as this cannot have been the result of anything else. I awoke to darkness, demented by hunger, face down, on a warm slab. My cheek was pressed against the surface, and drool was running abundantly out of my mouth onto it. I jolted as I came to, and my body seized rigid with terror as the previous moments rushed back to me. I felt myself beginning to tremor, to hyperventilate. My mind began to reel. I could feel the hot rush of panic racing up the back of my brain, crippling and ferocious. I couldn't think, couldn't process any of it. What it had done to her. What it had done to everything. My family. Her family. Our family. I wouldn't accept it. I couldn't accept it. I refused to believe any of it. As the images mauled at me, I tried to convince myself they were hallucinations or some kind of waking nightmare. I told myself it couldn't possibly be true, doing everything I could to dive headlong into the salve of denial. I closed my eyes and squeezed them shut, begging, praying that I would somehow wake back into my previous reality. The effort was a useless one. In moments my body had entirely succumbed to the panic, and I was practically convulsing on the slab, sucking in air between insane wails of grief. Despite it all, some glimmer of rationality shone amidst the turmoil, and the realization struck me that wherever I was, it was not our garden. I had been put here. The thought froze me for a moment as I realized what it meant. I did my best to stop the shaking, to stop the terror response from overwhelming me, to be as still as I could and play dead. I grabbed at my shoulders with the opposing hands, trying desperately to hold myself in place long enough to take stock of the situation. Pain stung at me in every direction, and every slight movement was punctuated with the loud crackle of caked blood 
filling my inner ears. I was naked, entirely. Whoever or whatever had attended to me was likely still here. I tried to ascertain where here was, but all I had seen beyond my slab was complete darkness, and I was afraid to investigate any further out of concern my waking state would be noticed by my captors. I could only just make out my own body and the slab beneath me because of some very low lighting coming from the floor around the base of it. I tapped gently at its surface, trying to ascertain its stability and what it was made from. It seemed to clang like metal, as I cautiously hit my fingers against it, and my knuckles felt brittle and sore where they had made contact. It didn't really tell me anything, but it didn't matter much anyway. I already knew where I was. I just wasn't ready to accept it. I laid there, naked, crying, and shivering with fear, trying to convince myself that I was doing a believable enough impression of a corpse, trying not to think about her, trying not to howl with every agonizing recollection, with the pain of every new loss as it entered my head, telling myself lies, that she was here with me somewhere, that maybe somehow she could have survived, that if I was here, then they all must be too. Telling myself anything I could to stave off accepting the horrendous tragedy, the horrendous insult that had befallen us. Trying not to imagine how she looked right at the end, all blood and glass, and nothing of her left behind her eyes. Nothing of her joy or her compassion. Just meat. All her mystery and beauty and humour erased in one moment. I wished so deeply I had died with her. The thought stabbed at me again and again and my brain would flush hot with panic as each jab came, unwilling to accept even the smallest corner of what had happened. I'd slip back into shock as the questions crept in. How many did they kill? Were any of our family taken too? Who are they? Every new realization, a broken rung on the ladder out of hell, a new torment to fall into, a new terror I couldn't process. I dared myself to raise my head slightly meekly checking the black space that surrounded me, keeping the majority of my face tucked safely behind my arms. Small agonies stung at my joints with every minor movement. I couldn't make out a single detail, just utter black beyond the small halo of weakly diffusing light that lay below me. I imagined myself laid out in the centre of some grand medical theatre, Scores of beady eyes filling tiers of seats all the way to a towered ceiling, observing my behaviours through a darkness they were well accustomed to. Approaching a foaming academic ecstasy as they took notes on the minutiae of my grief. I tried lying to myself again, to find escape in a less terrifying explanation. That maybe this was just our government some secret branch of technology we'd been hiding for years, a test flight gone wrong? Would the lights turn on to familiar-looking uniforms? Or perhaps it was some other nation, some long-standing rival who'd managed to keep a weapon of this magnitude away from the reaches of our intelligence networks? Perhaps this was the first step of their invasion, and I was a prisoner of war. But... Any such delusions would quickly cause my mind to revert to the image of the gargantuan ship, hovering effortlessly above. Impossible and alien, and like nothing my people had ever built, like nothing we'd ever imagined. The ubiquitous supremacy of something so advanced, it may as well be the work of a god. I balled myself up as tight as I could, as my mind spiralled into terror as to what may be coming. I stopped fighting against it and tried to prepare myself, 
tried to immerse myself in the fear in the hopes of conquering it. I imagined some eight-legged monstrosity scurrying its way towards me, a cluster of little grey beings waiting patiently to study my vivisection, tools and teeth and talon clamouring to discover the novelties of my flesh. I don't know how long I laid there like that, drifting through terrified fantasies. I faded in and out of consciousness, the vivid blur of shock distorting my despair, hoping that something would come and kill me, while simultaneously being terrified that it would. I didn't want to live without her, without them. It kept repeating in my head, lancing at me between every free thought, my subconscious mind screaming out for a reprieve from the unending shock. It is a terribly conflicting feeling, not wanting to live while facing down the practicalities of such a thing. And, as time went on, the worsening demands of my physical ailments began to compete more ferociously for my attention. I could feel them all over the surface of me, numb alarms sounding across my body. You feel the hunger the worst. It had been long enough that nausea had been surpassed, and all that remained was the stinging pain of the stomach eating itself. The dehydration is more delirium, weakness, something you could slip away forever underneath. The other wounds fade out to the edges as your body tries to prioritize the lethal threats, punctuating every movement with savage little reminders. You feel hollow, as if everything that had come before was erased, as if it never had been. And now all that's left stewing in that void is sickness. A turmoil that you know will never leave you. You beg for it to end so badly, but the reality of what that means is a difficult thing to conquer. So, no matter how much I laid there and prayed for it all to stop, no matter how much I shook in terror at the certainty of that same prospect, that conflict never left me. It was the only thing that held true amid the chaos. The fight left within me. And at first, that's how I saw it. That the only reason I didn't just lay there and starve to death was sheer selfish self-preservation. But soon I would realize it was not a preservation born of a desire to continue living. Truthfully, I didn't care. While I may have been terrified of what they'd do to me, any kind of a will to live had died with her. No. This was a desire for something else entirely. A part of me that had been festering, laid there in the black. Something that was still to appear clearly through the haze of my extreme grief, yet had already found a firm hold around me something for which my survival was momentarily necessary. And so, after many days in that darkness, a thought crept into my head, one that quickly took root. They killed her. They brought you here, eventually, for whatever end. They will come for you. Find a way to defend yourself. Find a way to hurt them. Find a way to kill one. Make them feel what you feel. Even just a moment. Even just one. It was a fool's hope. A fantasy I needed to believe if I were to ever leave the confines of the slab. A lie, but a useful one. It was also the first and only cohesive thought I'd had since waking up here. The first glimmer of what I thought was rationality. The heat of confusion and desperation had been building into something else. Clarity, purpose, whatever possible route it could take to overcome the burden. 
the only possible outlet I had for such trauma, the only thing left to do. I would become rage personified. I would make a weapon from whatever I could, and I would stand as tall as I could, and I would kill whatever I encountered until whatever I encountered killed me. I would rip and tear and bite and scream at my enemy until my enemy knew they looked upon the face of rage itself. And the first step towards their undoing would be the first step from my point of convalescence and into the surrounding world of darkness. The terrifying void I now inhabited. Whatever tiny jolts of bravery I was feeling rapidly dissipated as I considered standing and stepping out into the black. Fear overwhelmed me once again, and I felt the sinking realization that any rebellion would be a hopeless one. My vengeance more likely a pathetic final gasp at the hands of a much stronger foe. As much as it had first felt like heroism, I quickly recognized it as the deeper entrenching of denial, the useless delusion of a broken mind. Instead, I laid there in the dark and waited for my captors to make the first move, waited to understand my fate. They never came. I tried my best to keep my thoughts on her smiling in the garden, and then I cried myself back to sleep again, rage personified. I was asleep for a while, I think, long enough to dream. Agony and exhaustion, and a gaping hole in my heart, all rending together, my waking state in complete shutdown. I dreamt only of her, of our last vacation by the ocean, of her skin shimmering gold in the sharp sunlight, the warm glow that would permeate through the edges of her dress as it billowed in the wind. We were sat on the beach together. A picnic we'd prepared lay half-eaten between us, and the constant shearing of the tide provided a gentle but ever-present metronome. She was writing our names in the sand, just as she had always done, slowly curving the edge of a love heart between them with her nail. A small group of insects buzzed at the food, which was spoiling quickly in the heat. I stared at her for as long as I could, and for a moment she felt tangible like she was still by my side somehow. Even in my dreams she could captivate me. Somewhere, in the back of my mind, I could hear myself screaming, wailing in agony over the loss of her. But whatever part I was in control of wanted desperately to remain in blissful ignorance, to touch her again, to feel her breath against me, to stay in this moment until my body crumbled and we were reunited among the stars. I did my best to cling to it, to tell myself it was real, that this was all the result of my madness, and she remained intact, beautiful, and unfazed by everything, just as she had been on that beach. She moved her gaze up to meet mine, and her finger continued tracing shapes through the fine amber sands that lay between us. I looked down to see the finished drawing, but the surface lay undisturbed, as if she had never touched it at all. My eyes darted back to hers, but they were gone. Jelly and claret running from the sockets in their place, this vile vessel hanging in the air behind her. I woke up screaming and quickly stifled myself in a panic. Other than my muted sobbing, this was the first time I'd heard my voice since waking up here. I sounded hoarse and weak. I sounded insane. My throat rasped dry, a choking tickle reminding me of my extreme dehydration. My head buzzed and spun as I accustomed to the disorientation. The crippling hunger had moved beyond maddening my grief doing nothing to quiet the stinging pain across my stomach as it made its last desperate bid for survival. 
I knew death was fast approaching, but any prospect of protest was overwhelming. I curled back up tight into a fetal position and waited for my captors to investigate the noise. I couldn't shake the fear that they were meters away, observing me from the black. Every passing moment allowed me to invent a new terror there, waiting for me. For a moment, I was reminded of a story our ancestors told, about unfortunate figures chained to a cave wall, convincing themselves the shadows they saw in it were their reality, all the while unaware of the world that lay beyond the cave, the eventual reprieve of daylight, representing their blossoming of wisdom and understanding. I knew I would find answers beyond the black, but I feared it would not be a wisdom that would serve me well. Still, in that moment, it was perhaps enough for a brief lapse in my cowardice. I knew that all my imagining was useless, that remaining in the cave would be a pathetic end. Terror finally gave way underneath the crippling realities of exhaustion, and with it, came the first glimpses of lucidity. I felt myself taking the first horrifying steps towards accepting my situation. Perhaps you could call it clarity, though I fear it was more adjustment to the insanity. At first I thought I was simply too tired, too weak to feel fear any more. But anger, anger was there loud and clear, rising, percolating, gnawing at every edge of me, the same questions screaming over and over, why aren't they here? Why would anyone do this? Why won't it end? The building frustration of not knowing became more unbearable with every repetition. White-hot spasms coursed down my arms and through my knuckles, ending reflexively in clenched fingertips that scraped hard against the uncaring metal of the slab. It's time to move. Let's make them hurt. Let's die violent. On our own terms. I did so, slowly turning myself over, carefully reaching out for the floor with one foot and touching my toes tentatively against the warm ground to make sure it was present. I lowered my other foot as I brought myself to a wavering seated position taking a worrying amount of time to find my balance, riding out the rush of blood to the head from bringing my body back to vertical. I put my palms flat to the slab and pushed myself upwards, and, for a brief moment, I felt ready to become the destroyer of worlds, ready to bring death to whoever had brought it to us. Unfortunately, my legs did not share in my optimism, and as I applied weight to them, they gave way immediately. I sank to the ground, confused as to why they'd refused their regular role in proceedings. As my body collapsed itself into a weak little bundle on the floor, the back of my head hit the edge of the slab, connecting sharply with the corner. I didn't feel any pain beyond the shock of the impact, but a quick finger check confirmed a good supply of wet blood from the wounded area. At first I winced in reaction to the sight of it, a programmed response. But quickly I realized that I was either too numb or too physically broken to actually feel it. I grunted in recognition of it, and some small aspect of savagery seemed to stir back to life inside me as I realized it didn't matter. None of it mattered. This was happening, and those parts of life I'd taken for granted, like comfort and security, no longer had any meaning. In their place, far more primal drives were beginning to alert within me. I pushed myself up from the floor, demanding my legs into action. With some support from the slab and a great amount of will, I managed to achieve a flimsy attempt at being upright. I stood there, wobbling for a moment, before hearing a soft click, followed by the sharp bombardment of a searing white light from above. I flinched backwards, shielding my eyes as best I could as I screamed out in pain. 
Expecting to be wrestled back onto the slab, I braced myself awkwardly, readying to be rushed and subdued. But nothing came. I felt back behind me for a firm hold on the slab, and stayed there, squinting and vulnerable, until I was finally able to force my eyes open and see where I was being held. It was small, embarrassingly small in comparison to what I had imagined, so much so that by the time my vision had adjusted I realized the spare hand I had held out to keep attackers at bay was almost stroking the wall in front of me. Between the slab and the wall there was maybe enough room for me to lay out on every side. The walls were scarlet red, bold and striking, regal even, and more than a little threatening. The shade had a maddening quality, the walls almost too bright, too intense. The harsh ceiling lights bounced around the metallic crimson cell in violent diagonals that stung at my squinted vision whenever I moved my head. Almost instantly upon my noticing, it had begun to feel oppressive, uncomfortable wherever I looked. A slight nagging claustrophobia and creeping anxiety. Surrounded by the unknown of the darkness, I'd been fearful to move. Now I knew what confined me, I needed desperately to get out. Feeling my desperation build, I quickly checked the room for anything I could improvise a weapon out of. I paused for a moment, only then really noticing the strange aesthetic of the space I inhabited. Other than the raised slab in the middle, there wasn't any furniture to speak of. Everything in the room seemed to be constructed from the same metal as the slab. The walls, the floor, everything was entirely seamless. No panels, nor edges, as if the whole thing had been machined from a single piece of material. Even the base of the slab simply flowed into the floor, as though the room were a giant relief sculpture. At one corner of the room there was what I presumed to be a door, which I would not have noticed as it looked identical to the wall and had no handles, but it was flanked very finely on either side by silver metalwork that flowed down fluidly from the ceiling and tapered to a point near the floor. They presumably marked it as an exit, but some natural aversion within me could not help but see them as fangs framing the tongue of a great beast. I stood staring at it, knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was on the other side of it. I returned to the security of the slab and desperately continued my search for something I could use as a weapon. I ran my hands along the walls in the vain hope I'd feel something I could tear away. I weakly attempted to wrestle the giant metal slab away from the floor, gripping it at both sides and planting my feet, but it remained stoic to my efforts. I kicked at it and swore at it and scoured every inch of the room and found nothing I could use. There was nothing, sleek and seamless. A good room to hold an increasingly violent prisoner in. I could feel hunger tearing my stomach apart, haunting every moment, the dehydration reducing me and numbing my thoughts to nothing. I attempted to call her to mind, to try and ground myself, to give me any kind of strength to carry on. But all I could summon was her in the garden, falling into me as everything turned red. Despite the pain of the images, it had the desired effect. The stomach quieted, the mind cleared back to a singular fury. I didn't think. I half-charged at the door, knocking loudly before jumping back immediately upon realizing what I'd just done. I gathered myself and tried my best to square up, to seem imposing despite my pathetic condition and complete lack of martial skill. I stared at the middle of the door, and attempted to ready myself for whatever may come. I tried to go blank and not focus, to not look at whatever it was I was about to assault. I would just see flesh. I would just see weak points. I would just attack. I would not try to see my opponent as a complete being. This would lead to fear, or maybe even empathy. Either way, 
It would mean weakness I could not allow. I stood flexed and taut, ready to spring should the door open, what I presumed to be a door, at least. I waited, trying desperately to ignore the tremor of depleted adrenaline coursing up my leg. Nothing came. I knocked again, louder this time, and jumped back a few steps once again. After a few moments I dropped my guard and began to doubt if it was a door at all. I tried pushing it. I tried sliding it in place and checking for any kind of mechanism around its edges, all to no avail. I slumped down against the wall opposing it, catching the sickly miasma of fear from my sweat as I did. The room felt as though it were gradually getting hotter, bit by bit, ever so slightly. The rising stress and encroaching claustrophobia of knowing I was trapped, playing wicked tricks on my senses. The discomfort of my situation becoming more nauseating the more I became aware of it. And then I began to scream. I screamed because I wanted them to come. I screamed because I didn't care any more. Much longer, and my body would have given up anyway. I needed something, even conflict, if I was going to have any outcome other than dying in that red box. Pushing myself back to my feet, I screamed my way over towards the door, hoping my voice would carry to whatever foul things now held me captive. I marched two steps forward, two steps back again, pacing the narrow width of the door on repeat making every graphic promise I could think of while remaining entirely terrified by the reality of having to enact them. Screaming every obscenity I could think of, every wild threat, every horrendous act I could summon to mind, until my speech was nothing but an upward blur of growled syllables. I begged and pleaded for them to open the door so that I could kill them. I lambasted their cowardice and their senseless brutality. I screamed her name, again and again, the mantra I would use as I took my revenge. Every so often my voice would crack, a tremor of reality, reminding me that I had no idea who I was threatening, nor any means to back up the threats. Or, worse still, an imagined footstep would cause me to freeze mid-sentence and shoot pale with fear. But before long I was just raving too entrenched in my rage to notice my waning grip on reality. I screamed until I couldn't scream any more, until my head span and my lungs felt as though they would heave free from their fastening. I howled and wailed and cried until it felt hollow. I cried until I screamed because crying wasn't doing anything, and then cried again when the screaming didn't either. I felt my throat croak dry and my body fall back into the realization of its bleak decline towards complete dehydration. As a final act of rebellion, I kicked out hard at what I had begun to believe was just a slightly more elaborate piece of walling rather than a doorway. I felt my ankle buckle as my foot connected with the smooth metal, offering no protest as I lost my balance and collapsed to the ground. As I did so, I heard a very noticeable click, and watched in amazement as the door in front of me slipped upwards and slid sleekly into the ceiling above. Chapter 4 I sat there in disbelief, panting, waiting, too scared to move from the supine position I'd fallen back into as I kept my gaze fixed firmly on the empty doorway in front of me. I could see a small section of corridor, red and regal just the same, but with a polished silver metal adorning the floor. The silver flowed up seamlessly onto the lower sections of wall. Its slightly mirrored finish seemed to be intermingled with abstractions of scarlet, dancing in shimmers as I tilted my head, the red of the corridor bleeding in reflections from every edge. I waited for the approach of footsteps, for guards or cries for help from other prisoners, for the introduction of whatever monstrous entity could do such a thing, or whatever being was capable of building such a craft. 
Nothing. Silence. I watched the doorframe with unease, studying it for any kind of threat. I had expected the door to slide back into place eventually, but it seemed content staying in the ceiling. Slowly, as lithely as I could given my feeble condition, I pushed my palms flat against the metal floor and began to raise myself back to standing. Terrified to breathe or do anything to break the oppressive silence, anything that might present a moment of dampening for an encroaching enemy. A part of me wanted to remain in the relative safety of the room, to not venture outside, to keep watching shadows and not seek out the answers that waited ahead. But that part of me had to die. That was the coward that stood and cried as we were culled, the failure that couldn't protect her. It had never been useful simply the product of an environment that had allowed for such comfort. Something born of abundance, not necessity. But now, now it was a millstone, now there was only one way forward, and it was not one of comfort. It was one of violence, and the next victim had to be this fragility. This blubbering vulnerability that could only have thrived amidst the grand lie we'd built for ourselves. It had no place here. Its soft little anxieties clung around me, and I knew if I was to see any success I had to strip myself of it entirely. I had to harden myself against what was to come, to become iron. As I made it onto one knee I felt my body refusing to move any further. The familiar grip of cowardice weighing me down, begging me not to walk through the door, to curl up and cry and put reality as far from my mind as I could. I growled and cursed at myself, punching at the side of my head until I felt the first fuzzy dislocations of consciousness and a temporary evasion from terror. I stumbled to my feet, begging myself to stop thinking, and charged out the door, ready for whatever abomination may confront me. Let dread be an ally. Fear is for prey. As I rushed out screaming, I quickly glanced left and right hoping to somehow perceive both possible threats at once, holding my hands up to my face to block any incoming attacks. Nothing. My scream fell abruptly into silence. I wobbled in confusion for a moment and took a breath that made my eyes bulge and wander from focus. To my left was a dead end to the corridor. A translucent tube ran from the ceiling and stopped about waist height, exactly where red met silver. Behind it, right at the end of the corridor, was a flat, white, rectangular surface mounted seamlessly into the middle of the red wall. It was fanged on either side by menacing silver leading down from the ceiling, just as the door had been. I regarded both objects with a wavering perplexment, entirely unsure as to what I was looking at. Groggily turning back to my right, I realized why my quick glance had caused me to wobble. The corridor appeared to stretch on endlessly, raising slightly on an uncomfortable incline, cutting off from view somewhere far in the distance, presumably where the angle finally became steep enough that the floor became occluded by the ceiling. But the ceiling was tall, seemingly far taller than it needed to be, and so that vanishing point was far enough away that the walls, floor, and ceiling all seemed to meet at the same impossible singularity. Looking directly up along it caused slight tremors of vertigo as my body struggled to become accustomed to the odd new perspective. It felt as though I were tilting forward, struggling to find level. I winced and shook my head away to clear my eyes from their confusion. I decided to investigate the tube first, mainly because I didn't want to consider the prospect of walking up that corridor unarmed. I didn't recognize the material. Perhaps it was glass and would break into shards. Or maybe it was hardened, something I could rip away and make some kind of club out of. I tapped at it cautiously, and it seemed sturdy enough, but it told me nothing more of what it was made from. As I inspected it more closely, I noticed an aperture at the tube's end, a little arched opening not quite large enough to comfortably fit my hand in. I paused in front of it and tried to consider any possible danger, before concluding 
I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at. Tentatively, I reached out and wrapped my hand around the tube. I couldn't see through it entirely, but I could make out the foggy blur of my pressed skin on the other side of it. I tried to pull it towards me, to wrestle it enough to cause it to snap somewhere, but it stayed stoically resistant to my stress testing. Deciding I needed more leverage, I reached down to the opening and slipped four fingers inside, intending to push forward and down with all my force to try and snap some of the tube away. As I pushed into the slot, I heard another click, followed by a pneumatic burst of air, and, a quick blink later, my hand was covered in warm fluid and what looked to be some kind of pink jelly. I tried to pull my hand back as swiftly as I could, terrified that it had been coated with some acid or poisonous material. Unfortunately, my reactions had not been quick enough, and my fingers came out sticky with the dripping fluid. There was no immediate pain or shock, and as I pulled my hand up to my face, I saw it was glistening and mostly clear, some milky tones of pink where it had begun to dissolve the jelly. I was disgusted, but so far gone that my senses seemed to fixate on the opportunity for hydration. I sniffed at it, tentatively, but there was no discernible odour. It almost looked like water, or maybe copious saliva. It was certainly more viscous, but in that moment my tongue didn't care. I sucked at my fingers to try and get all the moisture from them that I could. It tasted foul, perhaps unsurprisingly a lot like water that had meat dissolving in it. That realization may have been horrific on any normal day, but at this particular moment it filled me with optimism. I grabbed frantically at the hole in the tube, trying to get my fingers in enough to grab the pink jelly. I pulled it out and held it up for inspection. It was wet, dripping with the saliva water, and constantly trying to run away from my fingers, slipping and stringing apart the more I handled it. It looked disgusting, undergrown somehow, barely pink and slightly translucent in places. But I could see what I presumed to be a vein in it, and it was lukewarm. I threw it into the back of my mouth, and swallowed as quickly as I could. What little taste I got from it was enough to make me want to spit it out and die of starvation, but the actual biological prospect of that let me choke it down before my taste buds could accept the reality. The best way I can describe the flavour would be like coppery animal gelatin, with a bitter, acidic tang. It doesn't usually require chewing, so I find it's best to swallow it whole. I can do it without thinking now. I stood for a moment, waiting out the threat of poisoning or of retching and regurgitation. Aside from the disgusting taste that filled my mouth, it actually made me feel better. My body seemed to recognize it as nutrition, at least. I waited for a short while to make sure it was safe, staring at the tube, trying to understand my surreal predicament between paranoid glances up the corridor. Was I some laboratory animal, being observed and monitored. Where are the people who brought me here? More importantly, was this the only tube? I hadn't fully given up on my efforts to fashion a weapon out of it, but given it was my only source of sustenance, and I'd been completely unable to damage it in any way, I decided it would be better to leave it as it is. I let out a minor scream at the thought of what I was about to do, about how disgusting it was almost certainly going to be, and then I got on my knees and put my mouth up to the hole of the tube. Click. And a rush of chewed meat water was sliding down my throat. I licked at the excess as it fell out of the aperture and tried my best not to vomit. Click. The bitter jelly gets harder to swallow the more times in a row you do it. Chewier. More robust. I don't know why. I guess it needs a little bit of time to coalesce with the water. I let out a disgusted moan and lurched my body forward on all fours, forcing myself not to throw up from the vile taste. 
I knew if I did, I'd have no choice but to do it again. I laid down on my side in the hopes I would digest it quicker, and to my surprise I began to feel better rapidly, energized, strong even. My fresh lease made me look at the tube with a newfound optimism. Maybe I would be able to break it off, now I didn't feel quite so close to death. I looked behind me, back down the seemingly infinite corridor, and tried to weigh up my options. Given that I was on my way to an almost certain and violent end, it didn't seem likely I would ever come back. But, even still, I decided it would probably be best to leave my only source of nutrition where it was for now. I tried to give myself a reason to wait, to stay there a while longer before moving on, but I knew there was nothing in the room of use, and I had wasted enough time with pity. There was only one route left for me. I began to march down the corridor, far more boldly than I felt, but as soon as I did so, I heard another click behind me. I turned back round to check, presuming the meat tube to have fired off again. The white square on the far wall had sprung to life. At first it hummed with a bright neon white, but almost as soon as my eyes met its surface there was a lurid splash of earthy colours, a heady deluge of unmixed dyes. They seemed to dance and blend with one another for a moment, spilling into one another and creating more vibrant tones as they spread further outwards across its surface. In the briefest instant they jumped lockstep into position, colours separating fluidly into a crystal-clear image. It was a video feed. I felt a moment of minor victory upon realising I was looking at a screen, something I understood and recognised. That feeling quickly dissipated as I walked closer, trying to get my eyes to focus on the shifting images. The screen was showing aerial footage of the city close to my house, a skyline I recognised immediately. I could see smoke coming from some of the buildings and small fires beginning to spread between them. The streets were filled with stationary vehicles, a few that had seemingly smashed into one another. I tried to ignore the first gurgles of nausea and moved in to look closer. The stillness was harrowing. For as long as I had existed, this city had been bustling and chaotic, packed uncomfortably full from overcrowding. I had never seen it so empty, so without a constant tide of its occupants filling the streets. If it hadn't have been for the fires and billowing smoke, I would have thought I were looking at a still image. More than a million people lived there, more than a million lives gone. I couldn't take it in. I couldn't fathom that scale of death. But as I peered closer, as my eyes began to adjust, I started to make them out, littering the streets like refuse, some half-fallen out of vehicles, some that must have died sprinting, leaving horrid streaks behind them. Scattered piles of the broken dead reduced to pixel-wide taunts of grim cinema. I felt a breath punch its way out of me cold and panicked, as the dreadful reality began to sink in. Click. The video switched. More aerial footage, this time far more zoomed in. It was focused on what looked to be a school, but not one I recognised, not necessarily conditions that would have been acceptable where I lived. It looked to be somewhere far less developed, more rural. The building itself was extremely basic a one-tier concrete structure with a crude rainbow mural painted on a roof made of corrugated sheets. In the field outside it I could see maybe a hundred tiny bodies, all randomly dispersed, all framed with bloodstains that contrasted sharply against the verdant field they played in. The bright colours of the children's clothes and the dark crimson that surrounded them gave the impression of a strewn flowerbed, a beautiful spring garden violently chopped and scattered among the tall greens of the grass, their bodies melding into a singular grotesque abstraction. I felt the building churn of sickness. Whatever this was, it had affected a large area. Click. The feed switched again, 
this time to a famous landmark I recognized immediately. A giant statue that had been erected many years ago stood on a small aisle all of its own. My stomach dropped, and denial tried to claw its way back into control. This couldn't be happening. It wasn't even on the same continent as me. In the harbour next to it, I could see a crashed passenger plane, burning brightly. The area around it was littered with dead. This was global. I forced myself to look back beyond the harbour, to the burning landscape of cramped and stacked housing tenements that would have been so densely filled with life. Every building, every object, every street had told to us a hundred stories. The struggles of the architects, the tangled lives of the occupants, the history of the roads and settlements the cities had been built upon, and the blood that had been spilled to secure them. All of it was lost now. All memory erased. All that joy and strife and ingenuity, just the meaningless scrambling of animals in a pit. And now the pit is all that remains. The physical evidence that we were at least here once. Not a monument or a museum, not a grand empire spanning the stars, just an unmarked tomb littered with billions of nameless dead. I watched on dumbfounded, unable to take it in, refusing to believe what I was seeing, refusing to believe our story could end so quickly. I screamed at the screen for lying to me, for trying to trick me, that none of this could be possible. I couldn't look any more. I half fell to the ground, slumping onto my knees, broken and defeated, mewling to myself to stare into the floor, to not give them the satisfaction of looking. They had done this to everyone. That horn was the end of everything. We were all gone. But why wasn't I? Click. The sound hung in the air, seeming to stretch on far longer than it should have. I tried not to look. I really did. I told myself I had seen enough, that continuing to watch would do no good. I kept my eyes fixed on the floor as tears burned in streams down my face, stopping erratically as they coursed into patches of crusted blood. It seemed like the feed hung there for an eternity, not changing. I don't know what grim impulse made me do it, why I needed to see, but eventually it overcame me. Slowly, I craned my head up, trying to brace myself for the next theatre of atrocity. I'm not sure why I couldn't believe it, maybe because it felt so personal, so surreal. Maybe because denial was the only escape at this point. Either way, there was no doubt about it. I was staring at my garden. Our garden. Blue and pink bunting. And plants creeping up the now ruptured brickwork. A muddle of overturned chairs. The grill set away from the decking. Shattered glass and popped balloons. Blood. So much blood. No bodies. No bodies. I almost felt elation for a moment. Like somehow they'd managed to escape. Like salvation was still a possibility for any of us. But then the vivid recollection of her slaughter came pouring back in over the misfire of optimism, and any fleeting hope I'd conjured turned to disgust and confusion. I jammed my face up to the screen hoping I was mistaken. They were all gone. At least one thing was certain. They clearly hadn't just taken me. I shuddered at the thought of why they would want the bodies. I didn't want to guess the twisted motive behind it, yet the back of my brain couldn't help but speculate, spiralling rapidly as it played out every macabre possibility. Did they want to study us? Even in the haze of my grief, the gap in logic was clear. Why study something you've just made extinct? It made no sense to me. 
Were we some great hunting trophy, being prepared to be stuffed and mounted? Perhaps we were something as basic as food to them. Did some building block of our bodies function as fuel for their ship? Or, fouler still, had we simply been vermin, chaff that must be cut away, a wretched mould sullying the surface of their most recent conquest? I ran through more and more lurid and extreme scenarios as my failing brain tried to make sense of the entire absence of logic. Maybe they had taken us to farm our reproductive material, the genetic keys to rebuilding us and selling us as some intergalactic slave product, a drone race entirely unaware of their own history. I shuddered at where this thought had come from. Nothing made sense, and no explanation my brain could stumble towards explained why I was still breathing. Through the confusion and roving paranoia came a lone trace of what I thought to be sense. I could not hope to know the will of a god, nor should I try to. I rationalized that whatever beings had built all of this were so far removed from my experience that they could not possibly have anything in common with me. Their desires as advanced beyond mine as my fears were beneath them. That me trying to understand their will was as entirely useless as them trying to understand mine. While it may have made sense to me then, I see now that this was just another failure. The creators of this ship knew my nature all too well, as I now know theirs. Though my reasoning may have been born almost entirely of my own ignorance, truthfully, the why simply did not matter to me. She was gone. I didn't need a puzzle to solve. I needed bone to break and flesh to split. I needed revenge, sheer and unadulterated barbarism. And the more I let my rage continue to feed itself, the more I let myself drift into my own violent fantasy, the more I didn't want to understand them. I wanted to brutalize and murder them. Truthfully, that was all I knew for certain, and their sickening motivations were irrelevant. If she had been taken, if she was here, then it was all the more reason to find whoever did it and end their life, if only to keep what remained of her safe. Without thinking, I'd stood up, pushed my foot flat against the wall behind the tube and levered it hard up towards me with both hands. I felt a slight buckle of movement as it began to give way and yelled as loud as I could as I strained and wrought it towards me. The bottom of the tube gave way in my hand, and I heard a loud crack as the bottom section of tube splintered away, sending me hurtling to the floor when it finally gave out. I yelped in victory, and brandished the piece of tubing in front of me to see what I'd been left with. It was almost the length of my arm, and felt weighty enough to make an impact when I swung it. Thankfully, too, it had splintered where it had broken off providing a reasonable amount of jagged material at the end of it. I tested the sharpness of the shorn edge with a tender prod to the fleshy cushioning of my middle finger, feeling a healthy degree of discomfort as I did so. I smacked it gently against the wall. Then, harder. It didn't seem to have any give, nor did it seem brittle, and it made a satisfying enough of a clunk sound when it made contact with the wall. Maybe not the sword of judgment I was hoping for, but good enough to put holes in things I wanted to put holes in. I could truly feel it now, the venom. I couldn't see it yet, but I was leaving myself behind. I took one more look at the monitor, spat on the ground, and turned back to face finality, knuckles white with rage searing in my grip as I held my weapon forward. Now, to find one of them. Chapter 5 
To call it a corridor seems wrong. It's far more grandiose than that. Far less practical, too. More akin to an infinitely extending hallway, rather than a logistically functional or express route. It doesn't seem like it was built for people passing each other horizontally. It's almost too narrow for that. If I were to stand in the middle of it, my fingers could almost touch either side. But the height suggests either something giant moving one way, or traffic that would be split vertically, despite there being no treadway above me for such traffic to move on. Other than that, there seemed to be no logical reason for the extravagant height of the space beyond an odd brand of opulence. Harsh white light bathed the corridor in a sterile luminescence, bright enough that it kept me in a near constant squint. Bafflingly, though, I could never make out a point of origin, nor a single light source, despite being entirely saturated by it. As far as I could see ahead, the corridor continued in the same constant crimson, bold and oppressive, overwhelming, giving you no room to think, stretching on forever, yet still somehow closing in on you in a perpetual claustrophobic focus pull. The bottom section of wall on either side of me flowed harsh silver up into my peripheries, a buffed metallic finish that scattered the light back up at me in annoying and arbitrary patterns, every step causing the reflections of red to parry and shift. As much as I looked for one, there seemed to be no change between the materials, no seam or lip where they connected. As far as I could tell, as impossible as it was, the entire corridor seemed to be built from the same single piece of material, or at least with craftsmanship sufficiently advanced that none of the indicators of its construction were apparent to me. There was something about the blankness of the whole space, the odd psychology of being surrounded by the endless hall, its high walls of featureless design, that made me feel like a laboratory animal. My people would conduct scientific experiments on small animals, run them through little mazes, artificial scenarios to test their abilities, sometimes their limits. All in the name of scientific advancement. For a time here, I thought this to be a fitting analogy for my experience. I felt certain I must be being watched. That I was being observed and studied like a rodent in a plastic labyrinth. Some team of alien scientists watching my rudimentary decision-making with emotionless intrigue. Now, though, I am certain that the experimental phase, if there ever was such a thing, ended a long time ago. As I followed the incline ever so slightly upward, all I could see was the odd decor extending into the distance, disappearing beyond the ceiling far in front of me. The sharp border between the tones created a maddening false horizon that never seemed to change, disorientating me with a feeling of stasis as I ground my way towards it. Fully lifting my head and looking forwards up the corridor would quickly cause vertigo and destabilization as everything zoned into the same end point slightly above me, and so I endeavoured to keep my eyes focused on the bright shimmer of the floor in front. The incline was just enough to be constantly exhausting. My legs ached and rang, and after a pathetically short amount of time walking, I realised I was already trailing the tube on the floor behind me. It was difficult to put my finger on exactly what felt so unnerving about it all. At the time, it was impossible to feel anything other than shock and the absence of adrenaline, but subconsciously, I think I was starting to become aware of the high strangeness of this place I now occupied. That for the first time I was navigating something that had never been designed with my species in mind. Every choice seemed out of place and vulgar to my senses, and every moment there seemed to add another notch of tension, another strange stab of discomfort and anxiety. I kept my head low, and I did my best to keep moving forward. No more than a few steps staring at the featureless metal I now traversed, and my thoughts would slip back to her. Sometimes something beautiful I'd never see again. Mostly 
just the horror of what they did to her in our garden. They'd quickly be met with the gut-wrenching realization that she no longer laid in our garden. She was likely here, whatever was left of her, fulfilling some disgusting need or being cut apart and invaded by the monsters that were capable of all of this. The fear of it ran oppressively across my skin, slicing fresh terrors through me wherever it could. A feeling I couldn't ignore. The thoughts would become crushing, overwhelming. I'd slow to a halt and let the new wave of panic take hold of me. I'd brace myself through breathless dread as I felt the searing hot stress rush up my spine to seize hold of me. Pressed like a hot blade beneath my cranium, squeezing my mind with an agonizing grip as though it were building to a fatalistic climax. Some complete collapse as my mind and body gave their last refusal. It never came. The only escape I could find was in the hypothetical enacting of violence on an enemy whose face I did not know. A tantalizing escape, the only thing I had bandwidth for, given the near-complete shutdown of rational thought. Murder. Death. Kill. I repeated it as a mantra in my head, trying to use my fury to awe me forward towards my target, trying to stay above the surface of my sinking reality. Every time my grief would overwhelm me, and every time I would find my only catharsis through malice. It would buoy me for a while, and I could feel it getting easier and easier to slip into the incoherent fantasies of rage fueled revenge. The grim pleasure I would find in imagining all I had left to accomplish being my only distraction. The lurid anticipation of all the agony I would endeavor to cause. I felt no flicker of guilt as I conjured it in my mind. I didn't waste a moment justifying or rationalizing. Why would I? There was no morality left to debate, none that had any meaning to me any more. Everything that had ever mattered was gone. All I was capable of was hurt, and even that was just a fantasy. I started looking back up the corridor, just to encourage the vertigo, just to feel something other than the howling pain in the middle of my chest every time I remembered the lack of her. Each glance came with its own damning realization that nothing laid in front of me but more corridor more endless red and silver. I walked until my exhaustion became untenable, my vision blurring into itself as my body remembered what it had been through. My ankles felt close to buckling, and my toes were bruised and bloody from repeatedly tripping against the floor as I shuffled ceaselessly upwards. Every step rang a tremor through my body as a network of minor injuries battled for my attention. Before long, my hazing vision worsened, and I was forced to stop and catch my breath. I fell into a slump against the wall, and another spark of discomfort triggered in the back of my head, reminding me of how I'd smashed it into the slab. I jabbed my fingers at the area in a panic, terrified I was about to lose consciousness but to my relief I felt a slightly wet scab beginning to form over a very tender bump. I reasoned with myself that my blurry, ailing state was more likely a symptom of extreme exhaustion and dehydration. If I passed out unconscious with my weapon in hand, then my intentions would be very clear to my captors. The surprise would be gone, and with it any chance of an ambush and revenge, no matter how minor. The pink jelly had given me a boost, but it had been short-lived. I needed more sustenance, and to my shame I found myself hoping there would be another food tube ahead. I groaned my way back up to my feet, taking a few moments to brace against the rush of blood and lack of balance. I didn't walk far before I encountered another tube. As it turned out, they were relatively frequent. I think in my stupor I probably walked past a couple of them, 
They stuck out slightly from the wall, but their translucent material had been enough to slip by my fading vision. Once I noticed one, I started seeing them a lot more regularly. I fell to the ground underneath it and gorged on it immediately, thick spit water sticking to my face and half of the jelly falling to the ground as I was repelled back by the reality of it. I felt a cold slosh in my stomach, and my eyes began to tear up. I did the best I could to hold it back, but the violent impulse didn't disappear. I felt a slight convulsion in my belly as I hunched forward and evacuated the jelly. I collapsed, sobbing, considering the next attempt, wondering how many times I'd have to do it to feel strong enough to keep going. The next attempt was worse, tougher again, and I started to realize that it was better to leave time in between activations so that it would go down easier. I laid there for a while, crying, swallowing, vomiting, on repeat. After a while, the nausea became so familiar that I was able to keep a few mounds of jelly in my stomach without retching. Another tick of savagery, another part of me I hadn't needed, waking up to usefulness, some other piece evaporating without mention. I stared back at where I had come from, a casual descent towards another imperceivable horizon, scarlet and silver stretching back into silence. I swung my head back to look at my destination, the same maddening illusion on a different angle, although not so difficult to look at now that I was in firm contact with the floor. If not for the incline, I doubt I would have remembered which way I had been heading, but that wasn't enough to signal to me that I was being herded. Instead, my mind began to race with panic from the seemingly endless path I now found myself on, as though I was stranded between infinities, impossibilities, with nothing left to do but fester and survive. But in this misery I found my anger to be a balm, a reassurance that there was some small victory left to grasp. I could kill one of them, someone's husband, someone's child. It didn't matter. I would be able to make them feel it. And every time I imagined the barbarism I would enact upon my unseen enemy, I felt my current panic escape slightly. I felt lighter prepared for whatever I had to do. I risked another serving of jelly and meat water. Just from my hand this time, as my throat was burning from the constant regurgitation. After a few moments of deliberation, it seemed to stay down okay, and I set off with a newly reinvigorated pace. I swung my tube with intent, and marched forward, ready to break into a sprint at any moment should I catch sight of one of my captors. To say I lost track of time in that corridor would imply that I ever had any track of it to begin with. To say it ate away at my sanity would suggest I had any left. But, despite being impossible, both are seemingly true. Every step forward was another step towards uncertainty, a step further away from reality, and everything I had ever loved or been sure of. I struggled constantly to keep hold of reason repeatedly reminding myself of my situation, the perpetual march through the limbo of this alien tunnel. Beyond that, I had no way of telling. I presumed I was floating somewhere above my home, but truthfully, I could have been anywhere in the universe. Either way, I was surrounded by the unknown. Common sense had no place here. Fear had no place here. The options were clear. Keep walking towards death, or lay down and accept it. And so I kept walking, until I could no longer, towards the distant pull of vertigo, towards whatever conflict awaited me, drumming along the fixed path away from guilt and toward revenge, consoling myself with the knowledge that wherever I ended up, I would be back with her eventually. I don't think it had been a full day. Maybe not even half of one. I felt deranged from taking in the same constant, contextless surroundings. It was endless. My legs ached and had begun to cramp up at regular intervals. 
My knee and ankle were twisted up from kicking the door, and my head was pounding. But, as groggy as I was, I knew I was facing a different problem. Eventually, soon, I would have to sleep. However vulnerable I was, naked, alone, and injured, it was going to be even more apparent, laid unconscious on the floor of the corridor. So far, it had been entirely without an exit, entirely without any kind of signage or indicator as to how long it continued for, and certainly without any safe place to curl up hidden from view. As much as I didn't want to, I saw no other option. I decided I would rest at the next food tube and try to get some sleep. I had no idea how long I would be walking for, and I was steadily losing the battle against fatigue. The corridor wasn't quite wide enough for me to lay comfortably across it, and even if I could I would probably have woken up rolling down it. The logistics of the slope ensured I'd have to lay with my feet pointed downwards. I already felt horrendously exposed. Sleeping while facing away from the direction I was going made me feel even more vulnerable. As far as I knew, it was a total dead end behind me. I had no idea what lay in front. Whatever sleep I did achieve would be racked with the anxiety of some skulking being grabbing at my unprotected scalp. In truth, it did not matter. I was defenceless either way. But the practicalities of the situation continued to force me towards increasing danger. I took a helping of jelly, and almost felt reassured by the now familiar click from the tube as it shot into my hand. It didn't quiet my stomach. The opposite, in fact, but I hoped it would leave me feeling slightly less weak when I woke up. I examined the floor space below the food tube for far too long, given that there was only one answer. Certain I couldn't make it any safer for myself, I lowered my body down gently against the floor. It was warm to touch, something I'd forgotten as my feet had become accustomed and numbed by the constant walking. I jostled awkwardly between positions, trying in vain to find one that would allow me to relax into sleep. The solid metal of the floor provided no comfort beyond the warmth, reaffirming my injuries every time I rolled or readjusted. The slope was just steep enough to keep me uneasy and in fear of letting myself rest. Any time my body felt as though it were beginning to relax, the unnatural aspect of the flooring would cause a sharp bolt of panic to shoot through my legs and arms. I kept the tube tucked firmly under my arm, with the other hand gripping it tightly at the end. I'd given up on the concept of fully hiding it from view, and was now simply concerned with it not rolling away as I slept. As I laid there, trying to encourage the jelly not to come back up, I noticed I could very faintly make out an engraving on the ceiling, extremely finely implemented and carved in minor relief. Fine enough that it had likely been above me the whole way, remaining just outside of my ever forward focus. Tilting my head to look further down the corridor seemed to confirm it, as the carving continued until it faded out of view a short distance away. Its central design seemed to be two parallel swirling lines that ran the whole length of the ceiling that I had in view, dancing and curving with one another off in both directions. The lines were filled with alternating diamond shapes along their interior, some outlined, some in full relief. There was something about it I recognised, though I could not place from where. I could just make out a set of far more intricate details running along the outer side of each line, but it was high enough and small enough that I could only barely see the basic shapes of it. I had a feeling that the pattern may have used the same glyph shapes that I'd seen on the craft's exterior, but in my weak and hazy state no amount of squinting could confirm that. I considered standing to get a closer view, but I was concerned any sleep I was approaching would rapidly escape me if I did. Still, I laid there staring at it, perplexed by its nature, baffled by what it meant or who it existed for. The design made little sense to me, and the longer I considered it, the less it seemed to make any sense at all. 
it could have been an abstract form of mural, or some strange kind of calendar I didn't recognize, some record of their history, or even something more mundane like a maker's mark from those who built the craft, a gargantuan flowing signature with no deeper meaning whatsoever. Without any context, I had little hope of ever understanding it. But one thing was obvious just from looking at it. It was skilled and beautiful work. The realization brought with it the same lurch of dread that seeing the glyphs had, my mind stumbling over similar implications. Language implied something that could be communicated with, something that understood. But art said something entirely different to me beyond simply understanding and communicating. Art meant they had felt joy and grief and fear and love and all the things one must first feel to be able to then desire to express. But violence, on this level, of this design, seemed to be reserved to something higher, something unthinking, a force, not an enemy, certainly not something that was interested in carvings, in art. I couldn't reconcile the two ideas. How something so devastating could come from such advanced thought. How its creators were capable of such beauty, and yet seemed absolute in their pursuit of death. Despite our many failings, it had always been our understanding that advanced thought, civilization, these things pushed us further and further away from barbaric ideals. It seems that the creators of this vessel did not share our view. My people had always built machines for warfare, but this was different. This was a tool for extinction in entirety. What civilization would engineer such a device? Was it built from fear? For supremacy? The last-ditch effort to turn the tide of a grand cosmic war? Did these glyphs tell the tale of battles long since fought? Or perhaps they said something more sinister. Perhaps they described a certainty, a sense of supremacy. Perhaps this is the weapon a god builds to ensure that they remain unchallenged. I shuddered at the thought, and was suddenly reminded of my vulnerability in the middle of the brightly lit corridor, wondering if some slavering beast would come and seize its opportunity to pounce on me. Or oh, something slithering, something more primordial. My mind reeled as it tried to imagine the face of our destroyer, the form of whatever being could commit such a soulless act, yet still be capable of such advanced feats of engineering still motivated to carve these intricate designs. How could I hope to fight such beings? Would sheer ferocity be enough? Would my feeble frame carry enough force to even damage them, whoever they were? Or perhaps the opposite is true. Perhaps I would best them easily. Perhaps that is why they needed to build such a weapon. Not out of strength, but out of weakness. I hoped it was true, but everything I had seen of them so far hung like a lead weight in my chest. Whoever built this craft, this weapon, they were not weak. They were of a power magnitudes greater than anything I had ever known. But if they were flesh and blood, there was a chance, a chance to rip at them and cut at them and cause some level, any level, of pain before meeting my end. And if one of them snuck up on me while I slept, so be it, I thought. I'd see her again, all the sooner. That thought no longer brings me comfort or assurance of any kind. But at the time, in that corridor, it was enough to carry me off to sleep. Chapter 6 My recent head wound, rubbing against the hard metal, caused me to shoot awake. The sudden jolt made my legs spasm slightly, 
and I grazed my thigh against the jagged end of the tube. I let out a muted yelp and quickly span to face up the corridor. I checked the impact site for damage, and sure enough, there were five keen little slices dotting my inner thigh in a half-circle formation. At least the tube had the capacity to draw blood. I'd kept clutching it tightly as I slept. Apparently my sleeping mind was as terrified as my waking one. While I'd told myself it was a vain attempt to cover it from view, to not let it roll away, truthfully, I think I just needed something to cling to. My eyes struggled to open fully, beaten into a squint by the harsh luminescence of the corridor. It had been a tormented sleep, filled with images I'd rather not dwell on, and some that I wish I could exist within for ever. Still, it had provided me some level of rest. The warm floor had provided a reassurance of comfort, and despite the new cuts, I'd awoke gripping my tube as securely as when I'd gone to sleep. The jelly had seemed to bring some strength back to me, too. My body may have felt slightly reinvigorated, but my mind was struggling to cope. With waking comes the remembering of one's own misery, and the sharp lighting that stung at me quickly forced grogginess to give way to an unwelcome lucidity. The fury and the terror had been replaced with hopelessness once again, and I sat there for a good while, screaming down the corridor for my invisible enemy, commiserating my pathetic condition, before eventually getting to my feet. I realized I would have to take care of some pressing bodily urges before continuing. I thought for a moment about where best to do it. The corridor provided no corner or nook that seemed suitable. I quickly understood that my desire to carry this out as politely and discreetly as I could was yet another part of me that didn't need to exist any more. Disgust turned to smug satisfaction as I protested, as vividly and as widely as I could. I stepped back and admired my horrendous handiwork. If that was it, if I was struck down at first contact and that became the apex of my rebellion, at least it would be there. At least some small piece of this place would be sullied. Worse, because of me. What a pathetic, unimportant little being I am, I thought, as I stood there, smiling at my own shit. Another tick towards savagery. Another piece gone, without mention. I turned to face my destination once again and any small victory provided by vandalistic defecation was quickly erased by the crushing reality of what now awaited me. The same endless march to hell. I tried not to think about it, but as I took the first step I could already feel my legs weigh heavy and reluctant. My mind jumped back to its contextless loop as I pushed ever so slightly upwards. I stopped at the first food tube I could, deciding to get the horror out of the way as quickly as possible. As I approached, I heard a click, and on the wall opposing the tube, another white screen blinked to life. Perhaps there was some small part of me begging not to look, but truthfully, I longed for any break from the singular monotony of the corridor, something to focus on that wasn't the infinite scarlet and silver claustroscape that stretched out in front of me. More than that still, I wanted to know. I wanted to understand the scope of what had happened, of what they'd done to us. I stood there, blankly, transfixed by the horror of what was playing out in front of me. Mouth hanging open as I stared glassily through countless tableaus of our complete decimation. Death on a scale that became meaningless. Most of the shots were so distant that all of those who lay dead were nothing more than abstract patterns on the ground, spilled paint, fallen leaves, sporadic verdigris, a webwork patina of decomposition and fading final moments. Scene after scene, street after street. Every so often there was one close enough that you could make out the hair or clothing, or in many cases just the red pulp where those things should have been. 
it didn't take long before I was certain of the truth. I'd probably already known it from the moment I saw this vessel appear in the sky, but now there could be no doubt. It was everywhere. It was everyone. From what I could tell, it had hit every continent. At least it had hit enough places that I recognized to know it was worldwide. I saw small villages, tribes that lived in our most extreme climates far away from any center of civilization, laid waste to all the same. A military site with an entire regiment laid dead on the parade ground, all their preparation useless in the face of such a weapon. I saw awful things. I phased out there for a while, fading beyond lamentation as I absorbed the tapestry of our fall, when some rare movement caught my eye on the frame in front of me. It was another image of the city I lived near, the pedestrianized center of it. The street below that filled the frame was half littered with bodies and half bloodstains, as if half the victims had just got up and walked away. A white, egg-shaped object was hovering slowly down the street towards the bodies. As it approached them, it appeared as though one of them rose up and began to float towards the egg. Just before the feed cut to the next shot, I saw two more eggs follow into frame behind it. I can't be certain, but looking back now I presume it was also these eggs that the video feeds were coming from. At least that's my best guess. I've seen no indication there were any crafts other than this one, but there must have been tens of thousands of eggs to recover all the bodies. I screamed down the corridor for as long as I could in a single breath. Maybe they'd hear it as a battle cry. Maybe they'd hear the truth. I wanted death. I wanted it to end. I could no longer tolerate the purgatorial incline, the gradual ascent into the unknown. I just couldn't bear to let it come without taking one final swing for my species. I couldn't be that hopeless. If I was the only one, the last, then let me represent the worst of us. Let me show them our capacity for harm. Let me make a mark on the history of whatever limitless race now held me captive. A mark in our name. Whatever lay in front of me would be kept waiting no longer. I set off running. And I kept running. Food tube after food tube. Screen after screen. Click. Click every time I passed by. The momentum of my weapon swinging along with me. I tried not to focus on what the screens were showing me. The horror. The disgusting epitaph left of us. Discarded and defiled in the places we'd once called home. Our grand monument brought to a crushing halt in one click of a god's fingers. Click. And I considered stopping to try to smash it. Click. And I keep running. Don't look. Keep running. Despite my likely pathetic pace, it felt as though the screens were getting more frequent. As though the ship were trying to turn the heat up on me. To remind me of the overwhelming and unbeatable adversary that awaited me. I focused on running, on the possibility of an end to this maddening treadmill. Click. Was that my garden again? Nothing mattered. Just keep running. Just keep running. I started to acclimatize to the incline to the nothing point in front of me. I blinked sweat from my eyes as the point began to swell. I skidded to a halt and double-checked. Somewhere in the distance, it was widening. I stalked the rest of the way, trying as best I could to quiet my labored breathing and mute the padded claps of my sweaty feet against the metal floor. Ever so gradually, I could feel the ground below me beginning to level. The silver metal that flanked either side of the corridor began to taper away towards the ground. The corridor maintained the same height, but began to spread further apart. I skulked alongside the wall as silently as I could, holding my tube close to my chest, coiling all the tension I could in my arm, waiting to strike. A short distance in front of me the corridor opened into a circular hall. 
The silver floor of the corridor flowed into a thin ring around the edges of the hall, surrounding its scarlet interior. In the center of the floor was a silver circle, engraved with intricate designs in a style similar to those on the ceiling. Beyond the hallway I could see more corridor stretching into the distance, seemingly level, but equally endless. As I moved into the hallway, I was confronted with a door on either side of me, noticeably different to the rest of the architecture. They were enormous, grey and industrial, standing sharply against the stark scarlet that surrounded them. They were the full height of the hallway, ten to fifteen times wider than the door I had left the room through, and wrapped into the concave structure of the circular hall. Standing at one side of the giant room and craning my neck upwards, I couldn't take the whole door in as one. I stood there, dwarfed by them, bewildered by them. They seemed suited for large machinery, rather than anything organic. Unlike everything else, though, there was a clear frame to the doorway, built from dull industrial metal like the door itself. There were no markings on either door, no writing or indicators of what I might find on the other side if I were to get them open. I should have thought about it longer, but I think the outcome would have been the same. The corridor was a prison, and so any exit represented a potential escape. I wound my leg back and kicked forward hard, extending my foot as I swung to meet the door with as much force as I could muster. No click this time. No sleek disappearance of the door. Instead, grinding, the guttural wail of heavy metal in motion. The door began to raise. If it hadn't been so dark, the vastness of the space may have been reassuring to me after the claustrophobia of the corridor. I stood clinging to the doorframe, peering round at what lay before me. It was dim, but there were muted lights running in strips inside the ceiling. Eventually, they lost the battle against the dark, stretching off beyond the black distance. There was an awful stillness permeating the chamber, the stale void of a tomb long undisturbed. I took a few steps inside, which each produced a loud hollow clang against the metal floor. I stopped as softly as I could, terrified that something would spring at me from out of the half-light. As my eyes adjusted to the gloom, I tried to get a better sense of what I'd stepped into. It seemed to be a huge, empty utility space, industrial and drab. I couldn't quite make out the limits of it, but it must have been the largest single room I'd ever been in. We built enormous open-air stadia for people to come watch sporting events and athletic competitions. My guess would be it was easily the size of one of those. I took a few more steps further in, hoping that I'd make out another exit or find something more lethal than the tube. I thought about yelling to test the echo, to bait something out of the dark at me, but as I gulped in preparation, I felt my courage abandon me. My heart beat far too loudly in my chest as the familiar sweat of panic began to race down my back. The tube felt silly, pathetic in my hands as I stood there dwarfed by darkness, surrounded by the solitude of the vast, empty space. However monotonous and surreal the corridor was, at least I would always be able to see threats coming. Here I was prey to anything more accustomed to the dark. I glanced back to the bright corridor behind me and decided I'd be better off checking the other door, then quickly moving on. I trod lightly back out of the room, and into the safe light of the hall. There was a wailing groan from the blackness behind me, and I jumped forwards in a panic at the first sound of it. The grinding metal of the immense door closing followed immediately after, and my terror quickly fell into relief. I paused for a moment, as I realized the silver metal circle in the center of the room was now just in front of my feet. I made a quick check down both corridors to ensure nothing was coming, and then squatted down to investigate extremely aware of my naked vulnerability as I did so. The centerpiece of the design was a large outline of a triangle with two small parallel lines overlapping each of its vertices. 
in the interior of the triangle was what looked to be many intricately carved lines of text. Symbols, really. The spacing was equal between them all, both horizontally and vertically, and so I reason that each symbol may represent its own word rather than a single character. This seems likely, given that I only saw a couple of the symbols repeat at any point. If I had been told before this nightmare that someone had a triangular formation of alien text to decipher, I would have likely jumped with glee. But in that moment I felt no kind of interest in its translation, academic or otherwise. Something far more basic clung to my stomach and continued to gnaw me into sickness. I felt dread, disgust. Whoever did this had their own culture, their own laws and desires. This was what they had wanted. This hopeless atrocity was their judgment. It wasn't the mindless act of a barbarian or the thoughtless calculation of a machine. It was the clinical procedure of an elevated society. It was a product of research and deliberation and thought far advanced from my own. And this was their conclusion? I didn't care what those symbols meant. I knew what they were telling me, that this was the design of an unthinkably advanced civilization, and yet, despite all that advancement, compassion seemingly had no value. If they possessed notions of morality, then they certainly had not extended to us. And looking at the Herculean effort this vessel must have required to build, the eons of accrued dust adorning it, I very much doubted it was built with just us in mind. For whatever reason, they had chosen to become agents of extinction. The thought hung in my mind, red-hot and terrifying. I tried to distract myself from it, and kept scanning the large circular emblem for any possible clues about my captors. Exterior to the triangle were twelve large circles, arranged at random in both distance from and orientation to the triangle. Several of them were closely orbited by one or more smaller circles. My best guess was that it was a minimalist representation of a solar system, the larger circles representing planets, the smaller circles moons. Despite their arbitrary positioning, perhaps because of it, it was an immediate link to make. Formulations and patterns that I recognized. Similar basic designs of our solar system had permeated our artwork for centuries and had been ubiquitously familiar to us, even to young children. As I mused on it, I allowed myself to wander again into fantasy. Perhaps, I thought, it was the home system of my enemy, a prideful signature of the vast shipyard responsible for this vessel's construction. And that may be true but given my entire lack of understanding as to their language and culture, it could just as easily have been anything else. And if it were a solar system, then I am at a complete loss as to what the triangle in the centre could have meant. Some great structure they had built around their star, or simply their aesthetic solution to housing inscriptions and a floor carving. Anything I might glean from its meaning was just as likely to be total misinterpretation as it was some clue to my captors. Around the inside of the outer edge of the design ran two engraved circles with many finely carved lines etched between them, intricately etched diamonds making up a larger chevron pattern. My eyes followed the flow of it round and upwards, and froze as they met the top of the silver circle. This was something I recognized. It wasn't two circles. It was a serpent's body. At the top I saw the head, devouring the end of its own tail. It was a symbol I understood immediately. I didn't, I don't, know how such a thing could be possible. There were only two real answers I could fathom. Either it was chance, which it could have been, among my people there were a great many different religious groups and esoteric sects and so on that had adopted it. Perhaps it was just something universal that crops up everywhere. I tried to ignore the logic that an animal that evolved on my planet almost certainly wasn't universal. The other option 
seemed more likely the longer I considered it, that there had been some previous contact between us and whoever had created this ship. They were clearly aware of us. They had come to eradicate us after all. Perhaps at some point we were aware of them. For us it had been a symbol of life and death, rebirth and even reincarnation. As I stared at it in the context of everything they'd done, I couldn't help but feel as though it meant something different to them. Another pang of acknowledgement hit me as my eyes glazed over on the diamond pattern adorning the serpent body. I rushed back to focus, remembering the diamond shapes visible in the ceiling relief. Looking up, I could see it so clearly now, although it was still only barely legible from my crouched position, the swirling parallel lines making the two sides of the snake. It flowed around the entire outer edge of the tall circular ceiling, warping and undulating slightly before wrapping back underneath itself and continuing its way along the corridor. I gulped as I considered how long it may continue on for, and what lay ahead at the serpent's mouth. I was about to pull myself away when something else struck me as odd. The metal shone bright and brilliant. There was no dust, no scuff marks, or signs of aging from being walked over again and again. It looked as though it had been attended. Everything did, in fact. Now I was back in the corridor, I was suddenly aware that everywhere I'd been except for the empty industrial space behind me had been spotlessly clean. And while the exterior of the ship had shone brilliantly in parts, just like the metal I saw inside, most of it seemed to be sullied with the deep tones of a crude dirt. I puzzled on it for a moment, unable to decide if this was a special kind of metal or if this was a maiden voyage. Perhaps there was a cleaning crew I was about to run into. I let my mind drift for a few moments as I fantasized about butchering them, swinging effortlessly between them with the skill of some great warrior that I knew I did not possess. Catharsis turned back to paranoia, and my head darted madly left and right to make sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I'd wasted enough time asking questions I'd never have the answers for. I squared my jaw and marched towards the unchecked door, kicking purposefully at the middle of it. The vast plain of metal ground up lethargically in front of me. The smell of death flooded out as soon as it began to raise. Vivid effluence mingled with sour decay and hit me in a vulgar wall. This room wasn't empty. As the metal churned upwards, I felt my stomach knot with dread. I took a step backwards and impotently tried to shield myself from the smell with my free hand. I couldn't take in what I was seeing at first. I squinted and wiped the sweat from my eyes, but I didn't dare move any more than that. There was a hostility to the darkness and a foul reek in the air. Something was wrong. I kept peering into the blackness, waiting for something to lunge out and drag me into the void. The longer I peered, the more I thought I could make out something. Something grotesque and irregular. Something vast. I told myself I was just seeing things in the dark, that my mind was conjuring shape from shadow. But the longer I stared, the more I was sure I could make out the outline of some giant slumbering beast. Some inconceivable ogre resting in his own disgusting foulness after the slaughter of my kind. I tried to rationalize, but rationality no longer held any use. Nothing about this was rational. Just because such a humongously proportioned being seemed impossible to me, it didn't mean that it was. None of this felt possible. But, like it or not, this was my reality. I couldn't make out any movement, no gigantic heaving breaths. I could barely make out an outline, more just a definite edge of something running horizontally along the room, a subtle change in the depth of the darkness. But that, combined with the malignant odour stuffing the air, was enough to freeze me in place with terror. 
not just terror over what I was looking at, terror over what I knew I had to do next. If this really was my enemy, then I had to know. The sound of the door opening hadn't seemed to rouse anything. If I could take a couple of steps into the darkness, then hopefully I'd be able to make out what I was dealing with. Knowing what I had to do didn't make doing it any easier. I stood there, frozen, silently retching, tears streaming slowly from the smell. Eventually I managed to convince one foot to tear itself from the floor, and slowly, shakily, I planted it back down in front of me. I inched my way inside of the room, gently grabbing the door frame to distribute my weight and keep my steps quiet. What a fool I would look to anything lurking in the dark, illuminated and framed in the doorway, easy prey, announcing its arrival. Stood just inside the door frame, I still couldn't make out what I was looking at. I tensed up and tried to control my coursing adrenaline. One more step over the threshold. Click. The whole giant space shone brilliant with blinding white light. The sudden brightness consumed my vision for a moment. As my eyes adjusted, my mind recoiled, struggling to make any sense of what it was now seeing. It was filled with bodies. Thousands upon thousands of bodies. Maybe hundreds of thousands. The scale of it was inconceivable. I stared up in bewilderment as my brain fogged back over. I heard the tube hit the ground, but I didn't register it falling from my grasp. I'd been right in my estimate that the rooms were the size of a small stadium. Standing at the middle, where the entrance was, I had to squint to make out either end with any clarity. But it was clear that the pile of dead was almost filling its full length. Vertically, it stretched about a third of the way up to the ceiling. There was no care to it, no order. Bodies were simply littered across one another, lying every which way in a profane mass. Desecration and sick vulgarity, all heaped in a pile, like compost. Our form reduced to something lesser, the fodder for some sickening slaughter scene, strewn out in grim parody. I felt hollow, that any grief I was possibly capable of could not do justice to the unimaginable atrocity I was bearing witness to. I howled out of despair. I wanted every lifeless body there to hear the fury I carried for them. I wanted them to be something more than the unending pile of meat that now lay in front of me, even if the only thing left was the rage I held in their name. As the acoustics of the vast space echoed my cries around its walls, I thought for a moment that they were replying to me, my wavering grief reverberating back to me as an almost chorus. I sucked in air to let out another scream, and my lungs were reminded of the foulness surrounding me. The large inhalation of it immediately caused me to bend double and evacuate whatever small amount of watery sustenance was still in my stomach. The pile began a good distance in front of me still, not close enough to make out faces, but close enough to see that a good number of them didn't have heads at all. The mass was flecked with patches of dark crimson pulp, leaking onto bodies lower down, sickening highlights making them readily apparent. There were atrocities in our past, dark moments in our timeline best left unspoken. In some ways, this reminded me of them. Seeing us all piled there, without a burial, it called to mind the worst parts of us I'd ever seen. Moments we'd used to teach ourselves about the depths we're capable of reaching when we allowed ourselves to let go fully to the beast within. Moments we tried, at least, to learn from. But never had we dreamt of anything so total, so undiscriminating and without reason as what I bore witness to in that room. This was the grim reality of an extermination, where the dead were measured logistically, 
and all morality had been long since abandoned. The thought made me immediately disgusted, but I knew that I had to approach it. All the bodies were still clothed. There was a good chance I could find something useful, with even a quick search of pockets. Painkillers, perhaps. Maybe a folding knife if I was lucky. My shame receded for a moment as I began to fantasize about all the home comforts I may be able to steal from my recently slain kin. I decided to start small and stay relatively close to the door. Between where I was stood and the edge where the pile really began, there were maybe twenty bodies laid around at random, presumably ones that had rolled all the way down from the top of the pile. The two closest to me were both missing their heads. I felt like that would be easier. I didn't want to look them in the eye while robbing their grave. I began to move towards them, and was reminded of the hollow clanging beneath my feet. The metal felt springy and light, and it was difficult to disguise the sound of my footfall. As I got closer, I could see they were an older couple, wrinkled arms and paunched bodies. The woman's blouse was stiff with dark dried blood. I tried not to focus on it. I quickly checked the only two pockets she had and found nothing. Her arm lay over the man's chest, badly broken and contorted. I thought I could see something in his shirt pocket, sticking out from underneath it. I checked his trouser pockets first. Nothing again. I let out a prolonged shudder and tried my best to gently peel her arm away from him. Her body was rigid. It didn't move easily. More alarming, though, was how warm she was. The floor here was heated slightly, just like the floor in the corridor, and apparently it was enough to keep the body at a normal temperature. With more force than I had originally cared to employ, I managed to move her arm slightly away and gain access to his pocket. I let out an excited little yelp as I pulled out a handful of miniature-sized candy bars, falling back and chuckling to myself with excitement. I ripped one open and felt a sudden lurch of anguish as I remembered my father-in-law would carry mini candy bars in his top pocket to hand out to the grandchildren. Grief flowed into guilt as I looked back up to the grotesque monument and was reminded of a loss far greater than my own. Or maybe the loss, in its entirety, was simply mine to bear. I was its lone survivor, its last witness. Still, kneeling there, I felt guilty. I felt ashamed. I felt like I should crawl in amongst the pile of dead and wait for my frail state to fail and wither into them. Accept the fate I'd been spared from. As pathetic as it sounds, I wish that I had. I wish I'd seen this for what it was. I wish I'd seen myself for what I am. I slid the miniature candy bar into my mouth and bit into it, expecting a small dose of comfort. It tasted of nothing at first, no sugar rush or pleasant dose of dopamine. As I chewed at the gooey caramel, I noticed a slight stinging sensation around my jaw, a hot, high-pitched feeling, like the nerves around my gums were being lanced at. I tried to chew it quickly, but it didn't want to go anywhere. It just seemed to get stuck between my teeth, while the hard edges split the brittle flesh of my dry inner cheeks. My mouth ached and stung after only a few moments of chewing, and what little of it I could taste was entirely disgusting. It was as if my brain or body were trying to alert me to a poison. I weakly spat it out onto the floor next to my small pile of vomit and knelt there, weeping for a while. After more time wallowing in pity than I care to describe, I gathered my resolve and decided to try checking more of the bodies. I was trying my best to look at them as little as I could. A quick glance ahead confirmed there was another female. She was still in a straight line from the door 
if I had to escape. I walked up slowly, staring at the floor in front of me. Every step closer to the pile seemed to worsen the noxious odours. The taste of death clung in my throat with a choking, nauseous aggression. As I sensed I was getting close, I let my eyes up a little, being careful to keep the mass of dead above my line of sight. There was a tremor of pins across my heart as I saw a white summer dress loom into my view, drenched red from the top down. My mouth fell open, and my brain slipped back into the suspended haze of occurring trauma. Her pendant, her face, her hair, not her eyes, just broken red glass. Her expression was contorted, angry, confused, frozen in that moment where nothing made sense but fear. Look at what they did to her. I fell to the ground next to her, and held her body so close to mine, it felt as though we'd meld into one. I howled and wailed apologies to her as I rocked her lifeless frame back and forth against my chest. As pitiful as it was, I was grateful to the heat in that flooring, grateful because it let me tell myself one last lie, grateful for the last moment in which I would ever feel any kind of comfort. The thought had been in my mind as soon as I'd opened the door to the corpse wall. To tell the truth, it had been plaguing me ever since I'd seen her absence from the garden. What did they want with her? I still didn't have the answer to that question, but now I saw the reality of it, of her. A crumb at the foot of a mountain. Maybe I felt a spark of relief. It felt somehow less personal now. Personal. That word hung in my mind, and as I held on to her, I looked around at the other bodies strewn away from the main pile. I allowed myself to take them in, to see their faces. It only took a moment once I was looking for it. There lay my friends, our close family, our entire world. Minus the children, it was the exact attendance of our garden party. The party to celebrate. I howled again and clutched her stomach. I was wrong. This was personal. Entirely personal. They hadn't rolled here, or fallen into position. This wasn't an accident. They had been placed here. Just as I had been placed on the slab. Placed here for me to find. Someone was doing this to me. Someone wanted me to see this. A rational mind may have asked itself why that was. To me, in that moment, surrounded by the husks of everyone I held dear, all it meant to me was that there was someone to kill. Through the lens of my anger it made perfect sense. Whoever had done this was evil incarnate, a tumour on the belly of the universe. Of course they would want me to suffer. Of course they want me broken. They did this to cause pain, and this is what I would provide them in return, in as large a measure as I could muster. I unlatched the pendant from around her neck, rubbing my thumb against its face, to feel the texture of the star pattern that adorned it. It was half covered in her blood, the chain too, and for a moment I considered cleaning it away with my thumb and saliva. But even that, even that small piece of her, I couldn't remove. Instead, I decided I would carry her with me, wherever I went. I fastened it back around my neck, fumbling and crying as the sweat on my hands mingled with the blood on the chain. Any hope of lucidity or forethought as to what I should do next was quickly abandoned as the metal floor beneath me began to vibrate violently. Over the hum of it I heard the sudden and intense slapping of meat as the middle of the corpse wall began to sink into itself 
like a great plug, had been pulled from the room. I stared at it, dumbfounded for a moment, wondering where the bodies could possibly be falling to. Suddenly, the slapping sound stopped, and the slow sinking turned to a rapid waterfall of corpses as the gap in the middle of the pile became wider and wider. The floor was moving. A growing chasm was now present in front of me, and hundreds of bodies were pouring into it in a constant stream. For a moment I was frozen, trapped, staring at the gratuitous abstraction I was forced to bear witness to. I snapped too when I felt the ground below me lurch, leaping up in reflexive panic. The floor between my position and the rapidly diminishing corpse wall was continuing to slide away underneath itself in large, rectangular sections. All I could see below was empty dark space, with a constant flow of bodies tumbling through it. A deluge of bodies falling into the black. I didn't need to think. I wouldn't lose her again. She wouldn't be a part of whatever this was. She had endured enough of their insult. I summoned all the strength I had and picked her up clumsily by the waist. She was heavy, stiff and awkward. Everything she hadn't been. I tried my best to run, but it was impossible with her under my arm and across my body. Behind me I could hear the sliding metal getting closer. As each section slid back underneath me, I felt the open threat of the chasm below snapping at my heels. I was losing ground, and despite the relatively short distance back to the doorway, I was moving desperately slow with her in my arms. Ahead of me, I heard the guttural lurch of the door beginning to close. I tried my best to break into a dash, but as I did the metal underneath my back foot disappeared completely. I fell almost straight downward into nothing, my front leg scraping sharply along the edge of the metal as it moved out in front of me. I tried. I couldn't fight the instinct. Without thinking, I released her and grabbed at the ledge of remaining floor beneath me. Her head clashed violently against the edge of it before she disappeared into the black below. I should have just let go. I waited for my grip to fail, for the floor to move one last time out towards the edges. It never came. The whirring of machinery had stopped. Even the door in front of me had stopped closing halfway down. I wanted to let go, wanted so badly to join her. But something malignant drove me forward that same prong of violent desire. Someone had to answer for all of this before I did. I could feel my fingers starting to give way to exhaustion. Reluctantly, I pulled myself forward onto the ledge, while my legs wriggled and flailed awkwardly at the empty air beneath me. Once I was safely up, I rolled myself fully onto the small piece of floor left between the chasm and the doorway, and broke back down in tears. I should have just let go. Chapter 7 I laid there until my tears would no longer flow. Again I had failed her. Again I was alone without her. I sat upright and moved the pendant back and forth along its chain, compulsively, as I stared into the chasm for what felt like an eternity. It was a surreal and impossible scene. The vast arena of bodies entirely removed. Just a giant, empty space, surrounded by harsh, white lighting. All below me was black. I couldn't make the opposite side of the room out in any detail, but from what I could tell, there weren't any other doorways leading off. I could hear a distant whirring of machinery from far below almost too faint to hear, but ever-present. I sat there delirious, running through every depraved possibility as to where she had gone. What were they doing to her? What were they doing to all of them? I knew it was likely we had been the source for the pink jelly that was keeping me alive, but I tried to put that far from my mind. I still do. But keeping me sustained wouldn't require such gargantuan effort 
as to bring so many bodies aboard. I knew I should move. Not only was my position on the slim remaining edge of floor precarious, but it was a constant battle against my own weakness to not jump in and join her. I looked at the tube laid to my side in the doorway. I knew what it meant, what picking it up meant. I looked away and back to the obsidian ether below me. I failed her. I couldn't protect her. I couldn't even keep what was left of her safe. Now she was part of whatever vile process was happening around me, whatever machinations I was too ignorant to see. My leg was bleeding badly from where I cut it against the ledge, but even staring at it, prodding at it, I could barely register the pain. Everything just felt numb. As another well of sadness rose up within me, I welcomed it. But try as I might, the tears would not come. I even tried to force it, scrunching up my face, trying to burrow back into my heartbreak. But nothing happened. At least the sorrow had felt like I was doing something, a slight moment of catharsis from expressing the grief. But now there was nothing. I felt nothing. Dull. Dead. I gazed at my surroundings, trying to ignore how poisonous and selfish I felt for attempting to cry. I considered suicide for a final time. The pull of the pit was tempting, to be sure, but I was being pulled by something else, something even deeper. I could feel the shifting discomfort, the rising frustration. I could feel all of what was left inside me. Rage. A burning ember in an empty pit. My gaze fell back to the discarded tube. It felt even more pathetic now, after being confronted so closely with what my enemy was capable of. I stopped myself for a moment before shaking the hesitation away and snatching it towards me, using its leverage against the floor to pull myself up. The door was still half-closed, but that was still high enough that I could walk under it freely. As I did so, it began to shut fully, and I heard what presumably was the floor sliding back into place behind me. I didn't jump, or even flinch at the sounds. I felt calm. With her gone, I had nothing at all left to lose. Now I was simply living to kill. Not a predator. Not killing to survive. Instead, an executioner. Killing because it was duty-bound. Killing because it was deserved. Because we had been wronged. And because I had nothing. No other move to play. I was far removed from reason or rationality. Or repair. This was revenge. And I would see it through. I set off in a freshly determined march further down the corridor. I came across more of the same huge metal doors. Some were empty. Some were equally full of thousands of dead. I managed to scavenge some fitting clothes, the notebook and pen that I write to you with now, and a small instrument for telling the direction of magnetic poles, even a leather shoulder bag that I could keep anything useful I found in. I found a bottle of water, too, but every attempt I made at sipping it had ended in disgust. It tasted harsh, like the candy had, like it was poisoning me, burning at my throat as I swallowed it. The clothes were encrusted with blood, but having them on I felt less aware of my vulnerability. Despite far too much time wasted searching, I found nothing more that could help me. No firearms or painkillers, or bladed weapons. Only the dead. Hundreds of thousands, and millions of aspirations and desires and loves extinguished. For what? The further in that reality sank, the more I felt my frustration compensate, the more I could feel denial and rage and fantasy become propellants to my cause. 
After a while, I stopped opening the doors. Despite losing her, in some small way, I still felt as though she was there with me, standing by me, walking alongside, offering a reassuring hand on my shoulder as though she were buoying me forward. In my madness, I would see a glimpse of her, standing there in the distance in front of me like a silent sentinel. In quiet moments, I would talk to her, and sometimes, in between the slap march sound of my bare feet against the hallway, I would even hear her reply. That soft spring flower voice calling my name, calling out for me to turn around. I'd stop and look back to an empty corridor and be reminded once more of her absence, the crushing realities of my condition. At times I'd wish so dearly she was there with me, that she existed somehow beyond my failing mind. But whatever small part of my sanity that remained, prayed dearly that she wasn't. As I moved deeper into the ship, I noticed carvings similar to those that wound along the ceiling, appearing in the silver metal of the lower walls. What I now recognized to be a large serpent shape sat mostly central between the floor and where the wall broke from silver to red, but it flowed up and down slightly as it went, making room for and overlapping other elements of the design. It was mirrored on both sides of the corridor, and every so often the serpents would bow down into the flooring, though never coming so far into the middle as to touch or overlap the other. Now much closer, I could pick out the intricate glyphwork that ran along the outer edge of each snake, a flowing single line of what I presumed to be text, all the characters with exact and equal spacing from one another. The entire design of the carving was replicated perfectly on both walls, so much so that despite searching far too long for inconsistencies, I never found one. Perhaps that was a sign of the craftsmanship being machine-driven, but it seems equally likely that it had been carved by a craftsman of incomparable skill. However it had been achieved, the symmetry was flawless. Even the glyphs that ran along the serpent's body were mirrored exactly, although how one would know which way round to read them puzzled me greatly. Given how infrequently I saw the glyphs repeating themselves, I was almost positive each character represented its own word. So perhaps, rather than reading from left to right or vice versa, the characters were meant to be read forward, as one proceeded ahead along the corridor. But if that were the case, then what of something coming the other way? Would they simply be reading the same story backwards? I couldn't shake the feeling that there was some deeper symmetry there that I was too primitive to understand. Exterior to the serpent, the main focus of the design, were varying depictions of architecture I didn't recognize, and figures with features and proportions unlike any I'd seen before. Strange assignments of limbs and baffling head shapes. It seemed to be a collection of different scenes, each new scene beginning as the serpent's body wove its way down or up, filling the empty space where the serpent wasn't. They all began the same, with an almost diagram-like depiction of two figures, followed by a larger grouping of the same figures intermingled with depictions of their buildings, or other abstract illustrations of their daily lives. Each scene would end as the serpent wound its way down to the floor, cutting it off. As it made its way back up, a new one would begin. The carving wasn't crude by any means, the opposite in fact, but the figures weren't cut with any particularly fine detail or artistic intent. Certainly nothing similar to the filigree that made up the serpent's scalework or the glyphs that ran along its flanks. The architecture wasn't overly intricate, just simple geometries cut in far bolder lines, basic shapes along an ever-changing scene. 
If anything, it seemed like this simplistic style was designed to highlight the differences between each set of buildings and figures. Flat focus was put on their biological details and unique traits, and little else was included. For a while, I studied it with interest, hoping it would give me some clue to my captors, or, at the very least, an answer as to why this had happened to us. But after a short time trying to follow what it was showing me, I became increasingly frustrated. It seemed lacking any kind of linking narrative. It was just the endless introduction of different cultures, different sets of beings that I didn't recognize, and weren't ever repeated. There were odd elements I recognized, features that would pop up sporadically, things that I presume must be ubiquitous solutions to engineering problems, bridges, dams, even a set of pyramids, although they appeared to be partially occluded by clouds. Even in the figures I would see occasional similarities, shapes that felt familiar to me, several times my own, or at least beings very reminiscent of it. Some with oddly elongated heads, others that appeared to walk on all fours. In a few other examples I saw things that at least called to mind aspects of our animal kingdom, something that caused a deeper shudder than the pyramids had. Again, I presume that some solutions are ubiquitous everywhere, nature being no exception. I never saw anything resembling a serpent, though, other than the vast one that framed the entire design. I began to tell myself of some myth, of hundreds of civilizations banding together to create a vessel capable of wiping out threats before they fully emerged, threats like we might one day have been. But something about it just didn't ring true. This vessel, this weapon, told me a different story. It hadn't been built out of any desire to protect life. It was built out of a despising of it, a raw hatred for it. It wasn't the product of unity or collective self-preservation. It was the angry judgment of a god far removed. After all, what advanced league of beings could agree to such devastation? What superior power would advocate for a weapon brutal enough to bring about destruction on such a total scale? Only a power to whom such destruction was trifling. Only gods. And so, the only story I was left with was something much darker. A record of their wars a tapestry of seemingly endless extinctions, the history of this craft's creators told through their conquests, each of these scenes another race of billions, gone without mercy, the snake's path through them signalling their decimation at the hands of my captors, a scale of loss far beyond anything I could reasonably fathom. I clung to the hope that it was merely decorative, how one might adorn a building of religion or worship, with signs and symbols that would always be significant to it. While it made little difference to my fallen kin, I despised the thought that our adversary had been successful this many times, that our slaughter had been somehow mundane to them, just another carving on the wall. Without meaning to, I began to fantasize about their home, what it might look like. Perhaps some magnificent floating city, as I had seen in a few of the carvings, scarlet and silver spires shimmering under a sea of seven distant suns. Or perhaps a grand university at the centre of the cosmos, this ship their answer to some great equation. Or maybe this was it. Maybe I was still in the underbelly of what they called home. A great caravan of nomadic genocide. I could feel the rage rising fresh within, burning more fiercely the longer I looked at it. It told me nothing of them I could use, no weak point I could exploit, no likeness I could recognize as my enemy. But at the same time, it told me everything they wanted known about them, their power, their dominion.
their ability to remove life. My blood boiled, and I did my best to rid myself of the useless imagining. Part of me felt sick from the thought of their callous superiority. Part of me didn't want to understand something I intended to murder anyway. There was mystery all around me, likely answers to questions far greater than I could ever conceive of. But I told myself I didn't care, that those answers, that knowledge, they weren't important any more. It didn't seem as if there was any function to me knowing them. We had been the sum of our shared experiences, everything we had learned as a species. With that gone, with just me left, and soon to join them, it just didn't seem to mean anything any more. Knowledge is a luxury for the survivor. For the soon-to-be-extinct, revenge was the only concern available. After a while, I stopped looking at the carvings. The corridor seemed beyond endless, but each circular break in monotony, flanked by doors full of dead, signalled to me I was making progress. Perception of time was almost impossible. I slept only in short bursts, huddling into the wall wherever I decided to stop. The repetition was maddening, hallucinatory, and surreal. As soon as my walk would recommence, I'd struggle to remember how long I'd been moving for, how recently I'd slept, or when I'd last forced myself to eat. Any estimation of how far I'd travelled was beyond useless, and soon I became certain that there would never be an end at all. A part of me was beginning to think I was entirely alone here, that all my lurid fantasy was for nothing. How had I not encountered them? Why hadn't I been stopped, dragged back to my slab, executed like everyone else? The questions spooled over in my head constantly, and the only answer I could find to sate them was the vivid picturing of retribution. I fell again and again into fantasies of violent catharsis against blurred enemies, I pictured wounds gouged in alien skin, blood and bodily damage I would inflict, and frequently I found myself pulled back to reality as I slashed and thrusted the tube against an imaginary enemy. Teeth gritted, body flexed, a terrifying prospect for the thin air in front of me. It was during such a lurch back to clarity that I found myself confused by the scene in front of me. No more endless corridor. Instead, a vast and regal door of scarlet metal, with a ring of shining silver in its centre. To either side, there were smaller corridors disappearing off in opposite directions. I never gave them a second thought. I heard it first. A gurgling, panicked noise, followed by glottal, burbling sounds. I froze still. Laboured breathing and what I presumed to be wet, slapping footsteps. Slow. Irregular. They sounded to be pacing back and forth. I clenched the tube tight, staring transfixed at the centre of the door. I felt a surge in my chest. Excitement. I wasn't alone. This march through madness hadn't been towards nothing. My thoughts raced a new wave of sickness and fury as I tried to process the existence of the attacker. There they stood. Whoever, whatever deranged being was responsible, one of them, at least. An opportunity. I was awake now, more than I had ever been. I coiled my body tight and took controlled, silent steps towards the side of the door. My heart beat loudly in my chest as anticipation threatened to overcome me. I slipped the leather bag from my shoulder, teasing the strap away and lowering it to the floor as gently as I could. I held my breath and minded the blood flowing around my foot as I placed it down. The cut on my leg had split back open. I felt no pain, no fear. In fact, I felt clarity. 
purpose. As I reached the doorframe, I heard a couple of quick slaps move towards me on the other side. I froze, and I felt whatever was on the other side freeze too. The rasping breaths ceased. It knew I was there. I took the tube in both hands and raised it as slowly as I could back above my head. Unthinking. Steady. I stood there, ready to unload. The howl of a species curled tense in my wrists. I stood there for a lifetime waiting. I stood there excited for what I was about to do. Every so often, a panicked rasp from the other side would break the silent standoff. I guessed that it sounded pained and urgently stifled. But the truth is that it sounded like nothing I recognized. For all that I knew, it stood ready as I was, barely holding on to its orgasmic frenzy as it waited for the door to slide open. I felt my arm sag slightly. I felt the first vein of doubt creep in as I began to imagine the creature that would make such a noise. I imagined teeth, hungry and snarling. My mind cycled through fur and scales and skin, trying desperately to patch together a blueprint of the threat I faced. I flushed the images from my thoughts and let my eyes glaze over slightly, focusing only on what I could hear over the rapid coursing of blood beating loudly in my ears. Another panicked rasp, not stifled this time, though. Instead, it broke out into an almost coughing-like sound. For a moment, I thought it was trying to communicate with me. I considered responding. Maybe it would give me the opportunity to strike first. Before I could come to a decision, though, the almost coughing turned to something I did recognize. Sobbing. At least, that's what it sounded like. Soft at first, but quickly approaching full-blown wailing, all shrill and full of grief. I told myself I was wrong, that I was misinterpreting something I couldn't possibly understand. This was a war cry. This is an invitation to die violent. This is what you've been waiting for. Two more slaps, this time against the door. I jumped back a step, darting my eyes down to confirm the door raising. It didn't move. Another sad little war cry from the other side. Another two slaps. I inched closer to the door. I was starting to gain confidence that whatever it was, it didn't have the strength to activate it. I took a long breath out and flexed my upper body, trying to convince myself of prowess I did not possess. I raised my free hand into a fist and brought it down in three definite thuds against the door. Click. I tensed my body and held the tube back in preparation to strike. I didn't want to see my enemy. Not properly. Not closely. I knew whatever it was, its differences, its obscure vulgarity, could deter me could grab hold of me and seize me with fear over the fresh repulsions I was now encountering. Instead, I filled my head with thoughts of her. In those fractions of a moment as the door clicked open, I forced myself to see her, to bear witness once again. Solace was impossible, but vengeance was right in front of me. My eyes scanned the section of floor around where I'd heard it standing. A slight puddle, stained wet metal. Then a foot. Or what may have been a foot. The door scrolled open past a globular deluge of greens and browns. It stood in front of me, heaving back and forth, rasping and wailing. It looked to be down on one knee almost, slightly shorter than me, and leaning to one side. Without meaning to, I found myself making eye contact, an array of black beads staring straight back at me. I felt terror and confusion, but something behind that, something scarlet and burning, suddenly became alert within me, 
I lunged forward and swung the tube downwards at what I judged to be the monster's neck. It put up no defence, and the tube landed with a wet slapping sound. It seemed to hit with less force than I'd hoped for, and I quickly stole a glance at the area of impact. Its skin looked almost translucent, slippery and wet, like it was melting away from its body with a horrid patina of vein networks clearly visible. I altered my grip on the tube, securing it with both hands, and lunged again, this time breaking through its hide, driving the weapon firmly inside the creature. In the blur, I saw it scream at me. I screamed back, focusing my strength on pushing the sharded tube end towards it, tearing into the muddy woodland shades of its meat. Watery fluid began to spurt out, and it shrieked loud enough that I felt myself lose balance. I gripped at the tube to prevent myself from keeling over, and I found it to be embedded nicely. My enemy lurched in pain and dragged me back towards upright. I tore downwards, ripping the tube back as I did in an effort to wrestle it free from the creature. A large chunk of flesh tore free and slipped away to the ground as I did so. Sheets of watery brown fluid pulsed out calmly behind it. I saw the shape in front of me recoil. At the edges of myself I was aware of the continued shrieking. But I could barely hear it now. I was hot with glee. I burrowed my focus into the point of previous impact and stabbed the tube in again with full force. To my surprise, after a slight amount of resistance on impact, the tube slipped inside the creature like it was sliding through syrup, so much so that I lost my grip and left the tube behind, deeply embedded in what looked to be the shoulder. It let out a deep moan and fell backwards to the floor, spasming rapidly. I didn't think. I threw myself down after it in an effort to hold it in place and landed with my face slapping against the slick green leather of its chest. I began punching it wherever I could. I kept my chin tucked and my eyes clenched in an effort to shield my face from it and punched wildly at where I hoped its head would be. The punches landed soft, skating off the disgusting wet material of the creature's face. It was wriggling violently enough from the pain to almost buck me off, but it didn't seem to make any motion to attack me. I knew I had to end it quick. The creature's foul kin could already be moving to stop me. I just wasn't sure exactly what would kill it. I brought my fist down in a hammering motion, slamming again and again at the cold, moist meat, but I could feel the ineffectiveness of my punches still. I howled in fury and disgust, and began clawing at its skin in front of me. I dug my fingers in as hard as I could, and felt them begin to break through the surface. I pulled and peeled in a frenzy, gobbets of wet flesh and watery fluid wept from it like pulp. I howled again, this time in excitement. I laughed like a maniac as I dug into its chest cavity with both hands. The beast thrashed wildly below me, and I screamed her name as I pulled away its muscle like wet paper. I felt something solid, and presumed I'd found bone. I dared myself to look, and saw the bottom sharded end of the tube protruding back out of the hole I'd dug in its chest. I scrambled up the creature and grabbed the far end of the tube, yanking it back towards me through the remaining flesh that covered it. It was more gelatin than skin now, stretching softly before tearing entirely. It let out a hollow shriek and fell completely still. I seethed through clenched teeth and let out an insane gurgle of relief and saliva, pushing myself back up on my knees, trying to distance myself from the mess below me. I was drenched in its fluids. My breath was running away from me, and my heart beat loudly around my head. I began to shake as the last drops of adrenaline drained away, and felt myself falling, quickly propping the tube against the floor to keep myself vertical. It was slippy with the creature's blood. My head and chest sunk low with fatigue as my arm held on for balance.
amidst the exhaustion and disgust. I felt something beautiful blossoming, rage transforming to a transient joy, something short-lived but beautiful, fulfilling. Knowing this horrid thing died with the same terror she did, a feeling like I'd brought some minuscule right to ten billion wrongs. For the briefest moment, I felt sated. I vented my satisfaction with a scream at the ceiling, followed by a mad darting glance to ensure I was definitely alone. I thought that with catharsis, the rage in me would subside a measure. But that wasn't true at all. It felt addictive. It felt like a good start. But something else too. Underneath it all. Something contradictory. A small stone of unease. Why had this destroyer of worlds not fought back? Why was I still alive? Taking a sick little gulp in preparation, I hoisted myself up to my feet, letting the tube carry my body weight. I had tried my best not to look, not out of fear, I told myself, but because I didn't want anything to deter me from what I had to do. Empathy and compassion were irrelevant now. From everything I'd seen, I reasoned they were concepts interior to our species, and so far that had served my survival well. Now, though, now I needed to look at it, to see it. For all I knew, there were thousands more on the way to rip me to pieces. I may have had no wish to understand my enemy's motivations any further, but in that moment, understanding its physical makeup seemed practical. Anything I could glean that might give me an advantage, although I hadn't left the body in any fit state for an autopsy. I suppose there was something beyond that, though. Something more urgent. I wanted to stare into the face of whatever demented monstrosity could do something like this, and tell myself it was prey. Erase all doubt. Tell myself it needed to be slaughtered. In the end, though, I didn't require the reassurance. I didn't feel guilt. I felt pride. A foul stink of death hung over it already. Vulgar emulsification, sulphur, and mould. It smelled like it had already begun decomposing. It was melting away from itself, liquefying and shedding, cell by cell. The puddling stain around it grew slowly, but visibly. I forced my head to turn, feeling a churn of preemptive revulsion in my stomach. I glanced and flinched away, a sheer and primal disgust flooding my senses. I stifled a wretch and forced my eyes back once again. It was more similar to me than I'd first thought. Two arms, two legs, a head with a face. There was no kind of neck that I could see, its head jutting straight out between hunched shoulders. No visible genitalia, or nothing I recognized as such. Its back seemed to be covered in hard, ridged plates, but I had no interest in touching it long enough to turn it over. It must have been down on its knees when I'd attacked, because now I saw it fully laid out, it was clearly taller than me. I felt another twinge of discomfort, and again had to force myself to adjust my gaze to focus on its face. It was a ready pink shade. The skin seemed brighter, more skin-like, only mottled with the green and brown tones that covered the rest of the creature. The eyeballs laid in a strange arrangement, two opposing diagonal formations of three black, beady little eyes. The lowest eye on either side met near each other towards the centre of the face. The following two eyes on either side flanked up and away towards the edge of the face, forming a V-shape. They reminded me somewhat of an animal we have in our oceans. More like an insect, really. 
tiny, nothing like what laid in front of me, but I recognized a certain similarity. Perhaps my brain was just trying to make this insane tragedy of form familiar in some way. Underneath the lowest set of eyes, in the center of the face, were three small slits that I presume functioned as a nose. There were no visible ears, but there were long ridged flaps on the side of the head that may have been used for respiration or hearing. And there was a mouth orifice, with little tendrils of wrinkly pink skin hanging over it at irregular intervals. It hung open, and I could make out row upon row of minuscule white razors, barely protruding from the grey-green sponge of its gums, far too small for the chewing and tearing of meat, but deeply unsettling nonetheless. The longer I stared at it, the more I couldn't believe it. A crude, wretched thing, an evil I couldn't fathom. All the joy and light and culture my people had brought into the world, all of our potential, destroyed by something like this? For what? When I first saw this ship, I thought it must be the work of a god. Looking at the pitiful thing that now laid in front of me, I found certainty that there was no such thing. This was the architect of our destruction. Had this been the foul whelp that had pulled the trigger? Its mouth hole spurted out a final, wet little gurgle. I whispered her name once more, through heavy breaths, then stamped its head into mash. I wavered there, blinking in confusion, staring at the abstraction of meat and pulp and blood water the splintered remnants of its ruined skull. I felt something tear in the back of my mind, some wildfire of neurons as I failed to make sense of the scene in front of me. A final separation from everything I'd previously understood, of my place in things, of what it had all meant, how it had all fallen away into this, ugly and surreal. I let myself collapse backwards, aware that if I stood for much longer, I would pass out anyway. It was only when I looked for the door frame to rest against, did I pay any attention to my surroundings, the shelf of daylight that cut across the room ahead of me, and the great throne that sat in the middle of it. Chapter 8 I made a laboured scan of the room terrified that my tunnel vision had left me vulnerable. My heart was racing, and I was trying desperately to stop myself from sucking in air. My eyes flicked back to the muddy green mess laid on the ground in front of me, and I let out a giddy exhale of victory before letting myself look at the throne properly. There was nothing else to call it, really. A single great chair sat central in the large circular space. The floor was sunken slightly. Around the edge of the room ran several slight steps leading down to it. Despite the odd angle of my slumped position, I could still see that there was nothing underneath attaching it to the floor. It was simply there, levitating, with seemingly no effort whatsoever. Neither suspended nor supported, entirely motionless and unreasonably large. It looked to be made of plain black stone smooth and uniform, without abstraction or abnormality. It was difficult to be sure from the doorway, but I say it was roughly three times the size it needed to be to comfortably seat me. Light bathed in from the portion of the room that still lay behind the doorway. The circular room caved outwards, and from my position of collapse in the doorway, I wasn't able to see the source of the light shining in. It didn't matter. After so long without daylight, it felt like water in the desert. I traced its rays down across the empty room, back onto the throne that occluded their majority, swallowing the bloom in a hungry black. It was then I noticed a thin stone pedestal standing in front of the chair. It was difficult to see with the harshness of light cresting it, but it looked as though there may be a small red glow emanating from the top. Other than those two features, the room lay entirely bare. 
I wasn't certain what I was looking at, but somewhere in the bottom of my mind a festering thought began bubbling to the surface. Part of me felt joyful, satisfied even. I had exceeded my own expectations. All of this power, technology, millennia upon millennia's head start, all I had needed was a stick and my bare hands. I spat at the mangled pile in front of me. Count one. One dead, against billions, but it's still more than zero. It's still one for us, one less of you. It was difficult to think of it as a corpse, as anything more than a thing. It was even more difficult to think of myself as a murderer. It certainly hadn't felt like taking a life. It felt like crushing an insect, like cleansing away scum. I wouldn't let it be like us in my mind. I couldn't. It was trash, waste, a stain that needed removing. It had been feeble in comparison to me, inferior, scared to even fight back. Perhaps that was the answer to this riddle. Perhaps weakness is the only catalyst for building a weapon such as this. But as the moments passed, I felt the encroaching grip of reality. Before, I hadn't known. Now, it was clear. I wasn't alone. This would need to be answered for too. Violence begets violence. I couldn't have long, and death was certain. It would be okay to submit. There was no one left to see me give up. But truthfully, I didn't want to. I wanted to keep going. There was a taste for it now. I dragged myself back to my feet, a sharp pain ringing up my right leg from where it was cut. New injuries became apparent all over me as I rose. Despite my clear victory, such close-up brutality had taken a toll in many small increments. The creature may not have offered any direct resistance, but it had not died easily. It had writhed and jerked horrendously underneath me, and I was covered in the cuts and grazes of its death throes. My already death-stained clothing was torn all over and soaked through with the creature's blood. I started to retch again, and quickly began tearing it from myself, fearing it may be corrosive or somehow poisonous to me. I sincerely hoped it wasn't. My face was flecked with it, my hair was matted with it, and under my fingernails ran disgusting clumps of brown and green. Despite having loathed it before, I now found the prospect of nudity to be far more comforting. More natural to the alternative, with the added benefit of the fluid-logged fabric not constricting against me and reducing my movement. I cast the moist pile of clothes aside, without any thought to their replacement. The bag I picked back up and slung around me. It still held the potential for usefulness. I stood there, heaving, head lolling around low between my shoulders, as I tried to summon what energy I had left and ignore the quickly worsening exhaustion. It wouldn't be long now. I waited for the slapping of rapidly approaching steps and a hail of beady little eyes charging me down. They were bigger than me, but if this one had been anything to go by, it didn't seem to transfer into physical superiority. Why had it even been in here alone, if they knew I had escaped? What was it doing on the other side of that door? Standing guard? If it had been, it didn't seem to be very adept at the task. And the room seemed too grand for a guard post, too open and regal, minimal but opulent. It was impossible to discern from my frame of reference. This creature could have been a pet, a protector, a pilot. Pilot. The word hung in my mind, like the daylight hanging in the stale air behind me. I salivated at the possibility, but still couldn't see it with full scope. Initially, I simply felt uplifted by the thought that it was this disgusting creature that had the responsibility of sounding the horn. 
that my revenge had been as direct as it could have been. But underneath the rapid chatter of my inner monologue, there was a part of me, a part far too reduced to form its wants cognitively, a part that had been there for a very long time, a part that said, you could kill them all. And the longer I stood there, the more I started to hear it. I shook my head and bulged my eyes until they returned to focus. I was fading. I strengthened my grip on the tube, begging death to arrive soon, before my energy escaped entirely. I heard a slight whirring in the near distance. Opposite from where I stood, far across the room, a section of wall slid upwards to reveal a darkened corridor and a giant floating egg. It was crisp white and entirely silent as it hovered down the steps and past the throne towards me. I watched it, transfixed by the tranquil, effortless glide it made in my direction. I recognized it from the screens in the corridor. I'd seen a glimpse of machines just like it, clearing out streets of the dead. It was entirely smooth. Like everything else on board, it seemed to be completely without any seams or visible signs of construction. The white glossy material shimmered as it passed through the beams of light, as if it had been freshly waxed. It was about double my height, and floated off the floor at roughly the level of my knees, never dipping lower than that. As it came closer, I noticed a small black circle indented at the very top, just under the zenith of the egg. I guessed that it was a lens, or a sensor of some kind, something that showed the egg, or whatever was controlling it, where it was going, and what it needed to do. In different circumstances, I would have marvelled at the simplistic beauty of its design. As it continued towards me, it made no indication that it was aware of my presence. I remained still, until it came within striking reach. I arced the tube hard into its side, swinging with my full range of motion. I felt a sharp connection with the air a few inches before the egg that set my wrist ringing with shock as an unseen force slammed me out of the doorway, throwing me through the air and back down onto the floor of the corridor. My head made contact first, and a thick vignette of black began to close in around my vision. As it did, I saw blinked frames of that foul creature's body being lifted into the air, its fluids and torn meat orbiting around it in a helix motion. When I awoke, there was no sign it had ever been there. No remnants of the mess it had left on the floor, no staining or signs of our scuffle. Not even my blood, and my leg had been letting out a healthy sluice of it before we had made contact. Had they come to claim their dead? Why had they not come for me? I groggily made my way to my feet and tried to orient myself. I was dizzy weak and confused. But I wasn't scared any more. I was aware I was cut in several places around my body, but I could barely feel it. In fact, in that moment, to my shame, all I felt was a craving for a nice full serving of pink jelly and meat water. A numbed panic hit me as I realized the door to the room ahead had closed and my tube was nowhere to be seen. I presumed it must have rolled to the other side of the door, as all around me was stark blank flooring. I needed it. I would investigate the room ahead first, and then try to find the nearest food tube. I half expected the door to open to a regiment of eyes and claws and revenge. For a moment I thought I could hear the same skittering chorus that heralded the ship's arrival, and a flash of white-hot pain fired through my cranium. I winced slightly, grunting dully in recognition of it. Then I kicked the door in front of me, waiting blankly for it to slide up. An empty room. No sign of my tube, and a further twinge of panic from its continued absence. The daylight had shifted, so it now shone in a harsh diagonal onto the far wall of the room. I was confused as to how I hadn't seen a doorway there earlier, 
but even looking closely, I still couldn't see it. The wall was featureless scarlet metal the whole way around. As I stepped across the threshold inside, the door closed behind me more abruptly than any of its counterparts had. The room was still, silent. Menace hung in that stale air. I checked the strap of the shoulder bag and grabbed at her pendant around my neck, sliding it back and forth a few times to reassure myself of its presence. I scoured the floor around where I'd entered for any signs of my tube or my successful conquest. I examined it as thoroughly as I could, but it was as though it had never happened. The floor was perfectly clean and dry. There seemed to be no signs of the conflict whatsoever. It was then I realized that from this side there was no doorway. As it had on the other side of the room, the wall had simply sealed back up with no sign that it was an exit. If I had woken up here instead of the slab, I doubt I would have ever found a way out. To my right there shone a glowing letterbox of erupting daylight. The window spanned roughly a quarter of the large, circular room. Crystal clear blue sky, small tufts of cloud floating by leisurely, entirely ignorant to my peril. As I walked up the steps that circled the room, I saw the ocean come into view below. Vast, beautiful waves carving their way across the surface, rolling up majestic and powerful, folding back into the heaving blue when their energy was exerted. I don't remember ever feeling the ship move, not that I'd necessarily have known if it had. Our house was a long way from the nearest coastline, far further from the nearest ocean. I surmised that the ship simply stayed where it was in relation to the planet, while the planet continued to spin underneath it. Through the slow fog of concussion, this seemed to be the best rationalization I could come up with. The ship was too high in the air, and my view too limited to make out any aquatic life. I stood there and watched for a good length of time, and I didn't see a single bird. I would have expected hundreds to be circling the top of the ship, as it likely presented the sole perching point for many miles. Perhaps I am wrong, but at the time I took that as a clear sign. Still, I didn't mind the emptiness of it. In a lot of ways it was preferable. No harrowing scenes of our genocide. No ruins of what was. Just a vivid patch of the same cerulean sky I'd always known. A small unblemished canvas that I could paint with lies for a moment or two. I waited there for a short while longer staring out in mute witness as my body dealt with another layer of shock. I only pulled free from it when I noticed myself being gradually overwhelmed by the aches and agonies of my ailing body. I could feel it giving up underneath me, growing weaker by the moment. I felt hunger transcend into stinging stomach pain, and I looked around the room in desperation. At the far side, opposite the window, I recognized the familiar translucent blur of the food tube protruding down from the ceiling. I was disorientated, without my weapon and beyond weak. If anything attacked me now, I would be entirely hopeless. I stumbled down the three slight stairs that circled the raised edge of the room and shuffled my way to the throne. My vision was fading, and my head buzzed in confusion. Once I could be certain I was in range of the great chair, I let my body lurch forward and caught my weight on the stone of the seat with both palms. As I made contact, I felt a small crackle of static energy run across the torn dry skin of my hands. The seat of the throne lay roughly between my chest and stomach, and I realized I would need to push myself up off the ground slightly to be able to sit in it. The prospect of rest was tempting, but the necessary clamber up was daunting in my frail state. My movements were languid and laboured. I forced myself back anyway, feeling a slight static break as I did, and continued on in a stupefied stumble towards the tube. I fell down next to it, and began greedily sucking at the fleshy water mix. At first it was pleasant, and I felt my body recognising much needed nutrition, but before long I began to feel nauseous 
and noticed the room starting to spin on an uneven tilt. The mist of concussion seemed to be worsening. Self-preservation had long since been abandoned in mind, but chemically, biologically, the disorientation proved a difficult feeling to overcome. I tried to plan out next steps in an effort to keep myself focused. Feed, tear tube, kill more. Keep going until they stop you. I told my body to use the rage to drive itself forward, to let fury be the engine. With a withered groan I got back vertical, but I was in no shape for combat. Truthfully, I don't think I had ever been. I looked back over to the blank wall and unstained floor and doubted if my unlikely victory had even occurred beyond my own mind. I shook the thought from my head and turned to face the wall, gripping the tube with both hands ready to shear it free. I planted my foot against the wall as I had done originally and levered it back with everything I had. It didn't budge. I tried again, but I felt weaker still. I ragged at it, forward and back, but it didn't bend or snap or shear, and each exertion felt more feeble than the last. I felt my body wanting to collapse back down beside it again, but I wasn't sure I'd ever get back up. I didn't feel good without a weapon. I had finished the kill with my bare hands, but without the tube I didn't know what chance I would have stood. I wavered there, completely lost, and trying to weigh up my options. I wonder now, if I'd have tried to get out, would these blank walls even have let me go? I let the memory of murder wash over me, balm me, and again I told myself its story. I tried to imagine what it had been doing here. Pet, protector, pilot. Another flash of chittering chorus pierced me like an arrow in the head. The pain flows underneath me. I ignore it and try to stay submerged in my deductive fantasy. What if he was the lone occupant? Or the tip of some galaxy-spanning armada? What if it had been sent ahead to destroy and make way? What great beast now lay unattended at my feet? Try the chair. Touch the pedestal. A surge of excitement coursed through me as the scope of my revenge blossomed outwards exponentially. I slouched over towards the throne. As I approached its rear, I reached out and touched gently at the surface of the stone. There was a soft heat permeating from it and a slight tactile grain to its surface. As I moved my hand toward and away from it, I could feel a small prickly disturbance in the air, tickling at me in small hot spikes. It wasn't painful, or uncomfortable even. In a way it felt quite pleasant. Tracing my fingers over the surface I stood in silent regard for this strange object that towered so imposingly over me. If I strained my neck all the way up I could just about see the entirety of it. The back fanned out wider the higher it went, the top edge protruding upwards dramatically at both sides and falling down in a soft curve towards the centre. I couldn't quite identify what about it caused so much unease within me. Perhaps the subtle modes of the aesthetic that I again found something serpentine within, or maybe the power it seemed to exert over a room built solely to house it. Something about it felt intensely threatening. Foreboding. The seat of a power dark and ancient, the jet-black cathedra of an unmatched destroyer. I made my way around the throne, supporting my weight with it as I went. I took a moment to examine the tall pedestal that stood in front of it. It seemed to be made of the same featureless black stone. It was a thin pillar with a wide plinth set on top of it, rising out of the ground to the height of my shoulder. In the middle of the plinth there was an inset orb carved from the same material. Around the orb ran a crisp ring of mesmerizing crimson inlaid in the stone. It pulsed ever so slowly, almost imperceptibly. 
I ran my hand over it, expecting something to happen, but it seemed to be inert. Not at all sure what I was doing, I hoisted myself up onto the throne. As I did, I felt the hot, crackling aura around it engulf my body. It's difficult to put into words. I didn't feel as though I moved into an area it occupied, so much as it sensed my decision to sit and swarmed across my skin. It danced and prickled across me in the moments it took to wrestle my way into a comfortable sitting position. The initial shock of the sensation may have caused a rapid wave of concern, but that quickly gave way to how pleasurable the feeling was. Warm and pleasant, rejuvenating almost. I felt the ringing in my head dissolve. The sharp pain of my cut leg was replaced with the renewed feeling of a well-stretched limb. The fuzziness of exhaustion and trauma and dehydration all washed away with a glorious call to clarity. I felt my face contorting strangely, and I noticed for a moment that it had crept into a smile. Some automatic response from the first positive feeling in a long time. I was ashamed by it. It felt ugly on my face, and I had to fight the urge to tear it away with my hands. I must have looked demented, legs dangling from the giant throne, bleeding all over and fighting my own expression. By the time my body had relaxed completely against the back of the throne, the crackling sensation had calmed to a level where it was almost entirely imperceptible. There was, for the briefest of moments, a fleeting glimpse at serenity, a reassurance I didn't deserve. I let my eyes close and almost allowed my body to relax when I suddenly noticed the light behind my eyelids had started to wane. In front of me, the wide rectangle of daylight had begun sliding silently down, easing the room into darkness. I was so absorbed by the strange sensations that I'd only become aware of it when the horizon line of the receding light cut across my vision, followed by the downward encroachment of an imposing gloom. I held my breath as the final strings of light scurried from the room and let out a nervous little exhale as the darkness enveloped me completely. I was likely terrified, but I think such a concept had lost all meaning to me. I was certain I could be victim to no worse a fate than I was already condemned to. Instead, I felt excitement. Something was happening. Good or bad, if it took me one step closer to conflict with these vile vermin, then I was happy. I felt far stronger than I had even a few moments prior, perhaps stronger than I'd ever felt before. It was remarkable just how quickly my physical condition had improved. Whatever the chair was doing to me, it was working wonders. Were I to be disrupted now, I felt as though I could perhaps even fight without my tube. The chair had given me renewal, lucidity from my ailing state, but not calm, not passivity. All my energy was just further fuel for the rage boiling inside of me. My thoughts were scattered, manic and filled with red, rip and tear, kill them all, stamp them into grease marks. I sat there, in the darkness, eyes glassy and unfocused, chest heaving with the heavy breaths of anticipation, waiting for whatever would come next. Perhaps I'm playing the innocent still. In truth, I shook with excitement as I felt those clawing hopes of an eye for an eye begin to bubble over and take form. Maybe this was an opportunity for a grander form of vengeance. The only thing visible was the glowing of the crimson ring hovering in front of me, level with my seated position. I quickly grew impatient with whatever process was occurring around me, and I reached out to see if the orb on top of the plinth would respond to me now. It seemed to glow stronger as my hand moved towards it, and I felt a resurgence of the crackling sensation around my arm as it got further from the chair. 
Just as my hand reached the pedestal, there was a sudden surge on my finger, similar to an electric shock, and with it the glowing crimson abruptly vanished, and the room lay entirely black. Not darkness, just black. After a few stale breaths in the void, a myriad of small green lights began popping into the air all around me. First tens of them, then moments later hundreds. The vast space was littered with them, softly diffusing illumination like hovering fireflies. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust, but once they had I could see even more begin populating the air toward the far sides of the room. The orbs seemed to continue appearing far beyond its confines, giving the impression that it had become an endless obsidian space, with just the grand throne and pedestal at its center. Even at middle distance the small pulses of emerald seemed to blur and distort around their edges. As I moved my head forward to try and get a closer look at one hovering a few feet away, I noticed further peculiarities within the sphere. A dark green marbling flowing around its surface, mostly occluded by the bright emissions gathering in an aura around it. From what I could tell, or at least what I could liken it to, the whole scene seemed to be some sort of holographic projection, although I couldn't perceive any possible source for it. I looked behind me to verify the lights covered the whole room and saw a similar scene of suspended effervescence. I looked down over the wide brim of the chair, and below me was nothing but black and an infinite network of glowing green lights gradually fading away far beneath. I felt the pull of vertigo and quickly leant back into the safety of the chair while reminding myself it was just a projection, albeit a very impressive one. As beautiful as the light show might have been under different circumstances, I was growing impatient and paranoid of interruption. I half expected the lights to disappear when I rose from the chair, but to my shock they remained after I had slid my way back to the floor, tapping my foot on it first to make sure it was still there. Whatever I had found here at least seemed important. I needed to figure out what I was looking at as quickly as I could. I focused on a light a couple of meters away that sat in the air at roughly the level of my eye line. I walked over to it and moved my hand around it to test if it was a projection. No matter where I moved my hand, the light never dimmed. I thought perhaps it was being projected from multiple sources so that it couldn't be so easily interrupted, but as I tried to brush my hand through it, I was met with a solid surface, rubbery almost. I pinched it with my thumb and finger and was surprised I could grab it. I tried to drag it away from its position and it moved ever so slightly before providing complete resistance and becoming immovable. After holding it there for a moment, it began to grow bright orange, and I felt it begin to vibrate slightly between my fingers. In a panic, I released it, and it sprang back the small distance to its original position with a slight bounce of unseen elasticity. As it came to rest, the orange light turned back to green. We had not yet even begun mastering the navigation of space. Really, we had only taken the first steps in exploring it. Primitive and crude designs mainly achieved through large amounts of combustion. Nothing close to this. But we knew enough about its formations and patterns that as I thought more about the placement of the lights, the almost infinite networking of them, something about it became suddenly familiar to me. I froze for a moment and then looked around myself in awe. I was looking at stars. This whole room was a map star after star, planet upon planet. Astonishing and never-ending, I marveled at the scope and beauty of it, beginning to buzz with excitement at what it might mean. I still had no idea what I was doing, what I had at my fingertips, or how a map would help me necessarily, but I would soon realize that my instincts were correct. This was the pilot's seat. If this ship had found its way here, then it could find its way back. This throne would be the seat of our revenge, the hangers of dead 
would be dais for my fallen kin to better view the slaughter. And these vile creatures, they would see who we are, and they would know terror in kind. Chapter 9 I stood dumbfounded among the green warm glow of the fireflies, neon emeralds glittering like the bioluminescent shoals of an alien ocean. There were easily thousands of stars filling the space around me. If I peered into the distance I could perceive the blur of millions. Some clever trick of the projection, I presumed. The further away from the throne I looked, far beyond where the edges of the room must still have lain, the more the stars seemed to both fade out and yet become more dense in their dispersion. Like grains of sand gathering to form a distant beach. I reasoned that I was only viewing a localized, albeit vast, area of space, and even grander heavens lay beyond it in every direction. As one looked further afield, and depth became irrelevant, the more the stars began to cluster and become indistinguishable. Now I understood I was looking at a map, it was both humbling and terrifying. My mind reeled and dizzied as I gazed up at the infinite ceiling, and I tried my best to remind myself I was stood on solid ground. Craning my neck higher, I noticed thin beams of emerald light, barely perceptible strands, suspended taut like webbing, tracing in straight lines between the stars above me. They weren't visible from every angle, but as I shifted my body and tilted my head, some would reveal themselves against the black. Others would scatter from view, shimmering in and out like green silk in moonlight. As I brought my gaze back down, they all became lost in the glow, too fine to be seen among the thousands upon thousands of shining beacons. It was far busier than it had ever looked staring up at our night sky, a myriad of starlight stretching off into an infinite and directionless distance. It was endless, immaculate and disorganized, and anything but empty. Perhaps a being more advanced than myself would be able to recognize patterns within it, the very blueprints of its creation obvious to their eye. But all I saw was chaos. As my feebly experienced mind tried to struggle its way around the scope of what it was now witnessing, I noticed a sudden disorientation, a hot swell of fresh confusion. Without registering it, I had lost all sense of the room around me. I had simply been stumbling around within the projection without more than a second thought as to the physical realities of the space. Upon my realizing this, however, I noticed the projection beginning to confuse my grounding more and more, a growing dissonance between my movements and my equilibrium. Suddenly unnerved, I did my best to stay balanced and find my bearings, to focus only on what was close and ignore the impossibilities of the surreal cosmic void I now stood inside. The brief burst of panic lapsed quickly as my eyes caught sight of the throne. An odd monolith sat sentinel and vast in the middle of the deep space, threatening to consume the stars and the very blackness beyond them. A strange impression, but a welcome beacon to navigate by. It was a very peculiar feeling hovering there, in a black ocean filled with green starlight. Now I was fully submerged in it. It looked as if I were actually stood floating in space. A believable enough interpretation of it anyway, although glimmers of the room danced in and out sporadically, betrayed through reflections within the viridian overlay of rays and stars. As I took in more of the distance, I noticed a layering of cosmic dust permeated the space seeming to gather most abundantly around waist height, but always remaining at least at a middle distance from me. It was next to impossible to make out in my immediate vicinity, but the further away I looked, the more it seemed to accumulate and fill the void. As I leaned and adjusted my head, I could just make out grains of it close around me. It seemed to mingle with the actual dust that floated in the recently disturbed air of the room, visible in the luminous twinklings of ambient green. So realistic was the effect that the closer I inspected it, the less sure I was that I could distinguish between the two at all. 
I was dumbfounded by the technology, almost completely unable to grasp what I was experiencing, or what its limits were. The projection was so clearly advanced that it could map particles in the air, that it could make light tangible and tactile. I am still uncertain, but if I were told now that this was no mere map, rather a live realizing of the actual cosmos, down to the granular level, I wouldn't have much difficulty believing it. I slapped at a green orb dangling in the air in front of me, baffled by the hard light object, and trying to test the limits of its mobility. It would bob slightly from the gentlest touch, but no greater amount of force could move it further than that from its original position. I poked at it, trying all manner of gestures in a blind effort to make it do something. After a few attempts at awkward sign language, I tried closing my hand around it so it was entirely covered. As I did, I noticed the light begin to shine more brilliantly through the closed cracks between my fingers, quickly changing to a violent orange. I felt a slight but frenetic vibration building in my clenched palm, and, after a brief moment, it came to a crescendo, as intense rays of amber starlight shone brightly out from my tensed fist. The moment the glow reached its apex, the ball of light shot clear through the back of my hand without a hint of resistance. It was as if I'd never grasped it, as if it had just decided material form was no longer necessary. I watched on, entirely perplexed, as the light sped through the air towards the throne. It came to a stop perfectly central over the glowing crimson ring that crowned the top of the pedestal. As it did so, it quickly swelled in size, with several grey orbs populating the space around it that I presumed to be planets. I could see it as it actually was now, a huge, bright, orange ball of angry flame and plasma. Although I was a slight distance away, I could still blurrily make out the marbling of storms that swarmed its surface. Despite their infinitely unique patterns, the vast reactions that comprised it seemed to undulate in their intensity, heaving in and out with a slow and eerie rhythm, terrifying and hypnotic, far too perfect for something so incalculable. I quickly checked my hand for any signs of damage, half expecting an orb-sized hole to be cartoonishly punched through it. To anything that understood this technology, I would probably have looked like an animal confused by its own reflection, but at the time it seemed like a reasonable concern. Once I was certain my hand was intact, I diverted my attention back to the orange star hovering over the crimson light of the pedestal. I couldn't tell for sure, due to the distance and its spherical shape, but from what I could make out, it seemed to be oscillating rapidly, or warping at the sides, perhaps. I could make out slight glitches and inconsistencies, as if it were spinning or tilting violently, and exposing imperfections in its seemingly round edge. Its orange hue started to shift into scarlet, as the light of the ring beneath it began to gently pulsate with a swelling power. First came a sound. Something I'd heard before but couldn't place. Something that filled me with dread. I didn't hear it as I would normally. I more just recognized its presence, as if only my unconscious mind had heard it. As if it were a whisper in a sleeping ear, burrowing its way into a dream. Something felt very wrong about it, but it was too fleeting, too transitory to grab hold of and give shape to. Looking back, it was probably the first sign that I'd never left the chair. It was dampened, muffled, but something far away was reeling up, gathering strength. I felt the floor shake beneath me, and for a moment the lights that filled the infinite void of the room distorted and flickered. Then a definite bang, a cannon firing on a distant hill, and the stars around me surged across the room. I began to walk back towards the throne, timidly seeking stability. The next few moments become difficult to describe conventionally. The entire star map around me shifted at a great speed, altering itself to a new layout 
that correctly aligned with the star which now sat central atop the pedestal. Across the room, stars disappeared into the black, and behind me, new ones shot into view. If I were to guess how long it took to fully change position around me, I would say only a matter of moments, but that cannot have been the case. As I attempted to walk, I noticed myself moving so slowly I could barely register the movement at all. It took me a disturbing amount of time to lift my hand in front of my face to be able to look at it, and as the moments passed by, things seemed to be slowing even further. As it dragged lethargically upwards towards me, I saw it blurring into double and triple vision. There seemed to be a constant trail of blurred hands in the air where it had just been, as if it were being traced by segments of its past. All the while the stars around me whizzed towards their new alignment, something that somehow managed to be both instantaneous and mind-achingly sluggish all at once. On first glance, they would appear to be shooting instantly toward their destination. A blink later, and I would see them slowly trawling across the air, drifting through the same stasis I occupied. Time seemed to be blurring around me, trudging and fraying at its edges, tearing as I waded through it. I turned my focus to the pedestal and saw the ring now pulsating violently creating an upward spotlight of sharp red as it did. I could barely register my movement at all now, so quagmired and gradual as to seem like an entire halt. I could feel my muscles tensing, the sensation of trying to move, but the reality of it was so maddeningly infinitesimal that the feeling was quickly overwhelmed by an intense physical frustration. There was no constriction, no pressure, but the feeling of my attempting to move through the stasis made my muscles scream with a previously unexperienced anxiety. The body-wide claustrophobia of almost total paralysis. My panic was only momentarily quelled by the realization that the pedestal was still pulsating at a regular pace. My internal monologue and the blinking of the light seemed to be the only things functioning at a relative speed, and so I did my best to let the pulsing calm me, to try to breathe in time with it, but that came with the horrendous realization that the heaving of my chest was moving at the same imperceptible crawl, and there followed a period of terror where I simply waited to see if I would suffocate. Trying to stay fixated on the pulses, I reassured myself that time must still be moving, that I was still alive. The bedlam loop of my thoughts, fluctuating between a near certainty of death and surreal departures into memories far away. And then, all at once, and perhaps never at all, I began to see glimpses of myself, brief frames in between the pulses, fleeting images of myself sat there, still occupying the throne, catatonic, emaciated, and bathed in crimson. Pain wrestling behind hollow eyes. One pulse and I'd be there, another and I'd be gone. As I stared longer at the empty throne, the distance between the light flares seemed to grow wider and wider, the dreadful anticipation dragging those moments out even further. It became more fleeting as the process continued, but every now and then I'd see myself there, gaunt from this extended ordeal near comatose and pathetic. I'd stopped trying to move now, and instead just stood waiting for the next appearance, deathly concerned by what it meant. I flickered into view once more, and this time the mirage seemed to hold a moment longer. I saw its eyes bulge open, as it lifted its head languidly up towards me, as if I had noticed myself staring. Another pulse and the chair laid empty. Another pulse, and there I was again, staring back terrified. Stars slurred and surged and slowed in the air around me, as if stuck in some surreal loop. The space wailed between light and shadow as the ever-shifting fireflies danced between opposing possibilities. Everything seemed to be accelerating exponentially, yet grinding to a halt. I saw a final flicker of myself sat 
on the throne, reaching out to me, looking as if it were watching its own death, looking as if it were about to scream. I felt the familiar crackle of warm, nervous energy at my finger as everything shot to black. My eyes blinked open to a familiar darkness. I was back, sat on the throne. I let out a deep sigh that felt constrictive and cathartic at the same time, as if I hadn't taken a deep breath in days. There was only that brief moment of calm before a pinprick of astonishing light shot across the room, aimed right at my chest. I stared at it, dumbfounded, slowly following its mesmerizing path up toward its source. My gaze was only halfway lifted, but that was enough. On the wall, far in front of me, a wide rectangle of blinding sunfire began to quickly emerge, a horizon of light searing the room with a laser-white purge, a hot knife in both my eyes. I flinched back into myself, throwing my arms up in front of my face and curling my knees in front of them to try and block out the horrendous transition. At first I was convinced of the worst, wailing from the pain and certain my vision had been scorched beyond repair. My eyes clenched and fluttered as their closed lids filled with obscene after-images, floating strobes and pocked purples. However, my panic receded somewhat as I came to terms with the fact that, in reality, my eyes may not have been open for a good length of time. I did my best to relax and breathe through the discomfort. After a few more moments I was able to squint my eyes back open, still guarded by the back of my raised knees. The entire room was illuminated with an electric neon white. As my eyes adjusted to the painful brilliance, I finally dared move my head to get a better view of the source. I felt my stomach churn, and my breath gripped tight from shock. This wasn't just a map. It was the whole navigation system. I was staring at a star. Not our star. Likely not even one we had a name for. Some splendid sphere of unimaginable power that had never even laid within the scope of our awareness. Something unfathomable and vital, and yet entirely unimportant to our story. Now my eyes had acclimatized to the unparalleled intrusion of light, I realized that I could look at it directly, with only a mild degree of discomfort. Clearly some filter to the window or trick of the screen. Another marvel I had no hope of understanding. Everything I knew said that the heat, the emissions, should have been enough to kill me a hundred times over, long before I'd ever opened my eyes. And yet here I was, staring at a wonder I'd never thought possible, close enough to steal fire from the gods. It was pure chaos. Indescribable beauty and devastating power. I feared that one or the other would drive me insane, that gazing too long would be akin to staring into madness. I kept staring anyway, entranced entirely by its infinite cascade. After a few more moments, I began to notice a shift, the unimaginably piercing white beginning to lessen slightly, becoming less sharp, less painful to look at. The screen seemed to be tempering it, filtering the overload of light into a wild blend of reds and oranges. As it did so, I began to see the star far more clearly, no longer occluded by its overwhelming aura. I could see its edge, its surface even, roiling with a terrifying potency. It sat just far enough away so that it didn't quite fill the screen from left to right, although much of the top and bottom was cut off from view. It was close enough that I could clearly make out the enormous churning maelstrom that comprised the surface, endless swirling storms of unimaginable energy in a constant battle of consumption. At first it appeared to my mind as one surreal mass, something like the golden fur of a gargantuan beast being blown by a meandering wind, tufts billowing in uncoordinated directions as if being pulled by an unseen tide. But as I stared longer, my eyes began to decode it for what it was, unthinkably large fractals of crimson and maroon, lashing and swelling against one another, 
crackling back to laser white in moments where the screen's filter became overwhelmed. I watched whips the size of a hundred moons lash out and away from the surface, the pressure presenting no other outlet but to escape entirely. Helical vortices rising like impossible towers before disappearing into their apex in the blink of an eye. Oceans of burning gases tearing away from it at regular intervals, in nuclear displays so violent I feared they would breach the space between us and consume me entirely. But just as quickly as they had exploded outward, they would be lashed back into the endless storm. They arced and danced in vast, curving trajectories, before either dissipating completely or continuing back down to rejoin the infinite factory of the star's surface. Veins of iridescent whites and yellows coursed and flashed as they sprang to life, only to die a moment later. I trembled as I watched one pulse its way through the network of torrents, webbing its way towards exhaustion, the building blocks for the next reaction in a system of endless reactions. I tried my best to not consider how maddeningly large that single strand must be, how it would dwarf everything I'd ever known. It pained me that I was the one seeing it. My understanding of science far too rudimentary to appreciate it fully, to even attempt to explain it to you. Too far removed by my own anger to truly recognize the obscenity of its splendor. I had gone further than any of my species ever had, or ever would, but so much of it was wasted on my eyes. There is such grand, unthinkable beauty that we will never lay our gaze upon, such wonders we will never experience, and I was too poisoned to appreciate any of it. How I wished that she could witness it with me, under circumstances far removed. I felt a grating on the back of my neck, and only then did I realize I was holding on to her pendant so tightly I feared it would snap away. I could feel her with me then, still standing by my side. Only softly, though, as if she were slipping away, as if she no longer clung so tightly to me. I caught myself welling with sadness at the thought, grief drying my throat like a punch to the gullet as the haze of remembering descended again. But this time I didn't succumb. I didn't lose focus. I had everything I needed. I had a way to hurt them like they had hurt me. That was more important now. A way to take everything from them, just as they had done. All I required was a way to make their machine show me where home was. The sight of the star had been so singular and overwhelming that my other pressing concerns had momentarily escaped me. As I recalled the time blur, a fresh burst of panic hit my chest, and I scrambled my arms to feel at my body. Terrified, I was the emaciated version of myself I'd seen sat on the throne, with its pallid skin hanging in waxy sheets. I breathed a sigh of relief. I definitely lost a reasonable amount of weight since waking up on board, but nothing close to the skeletal visage I'd witnessed during the time blur. And, despite all of that, I felt strong, well rested. I felt no pain in my head, and when I checked for the gash on my leg, there was no sign of it, no disturbed skin, no sign of trauma to it at all, in fact. I was slightly hungry, but other than that, I was more energized than I'd been in years. That thought brought with it more concern. Just how long had it taken me to get here? Thinking back to the interminable stasis of the time blur, I'd have guessed anywhere between a few moments and a few days. But such a thing, to travel however far I had done, cannot be possible in such a time frame. My leg had certainly healed. It seemed equally impossible for that to have happened in such a short span, too. I touched at my face, trying to use my stubble as a gauge for the journey. Strangely, it seemed to be no longer, no scruffier than it had felt previously. In that moment, though, the timing of events represented the least pressing element of my confusion. 
From everything I could tell, I'd just maneuvered a floating apocalypse between several solar systems, and if there were more on board like the one I'd killed, then there could be no doubt that they would be on their way to wrestle back control. On the other hand, if that was truly the case, then they'd had days, decades, millennia maybe, to come stop me. I reasoned that if they were on board, they would perhaps be caught in the same time blur and subsequently unable to interfere. But there was something about it that didn't sit right in my stomach, and for the first time since waking up here, I became extremely perturbed by my solitude. As the moments passed by without interference, I became more and more certain of it. Sitting alone in the vastness of the room, I felt unnerved by my isolation, not relieved by it. The silence that surrounded me was the same as it had always been, but now it felt different, like I was the only being in ten trillion miles. I stared at the sections of wall that I estimated to be where the doors had been, part of me praying they'd burst open to a quick death. It never came. I felt another soft pang of hunger, not sharp enough to warrant getting up for more jelly. If it had been an extended period of travel, my stomach would surely be far beyond growling in protest. I'd likely be dead from starvation. I didn't let the thought linger. I was being driven by a very different hunger, one close to being finally sated. No sense in delaying the inevitable. I leant forward once more and pushed my hand towards the pedestal. Chapter 10 A moment later, and I was stood back in front of the throne, in the exact space I had been occupying previously, an unseen and frenetic energy scuttling away down my arm. Behind me the light was obscured once more, and stars shot back into life all across the room. I had to be quick, but I had to be careful. I was beginning to get some grasp of the monumental force I now wielded, and the slim odds of my success, certainly my survival. I needed to be more thorough, to find a more measured approach. The gravity of what the first unplanned jump had meant for me had not yet fully sunk in, but I was beginning to understand. I was committed now. No way home. No home at all. I knew there must have been a more refined way to navigate than blindly jumping to the first star I took hold of. I approached the nearest firefly and gently closed my hand around it. I saw it light up orange, and as soon as I felt it begin to vibrate, I let it go. It grew rapidly in front of me, as several grey planets populated the air around it, orbiting it on fine emerald rings. The star had expanded to maybe four or five times the size it had been previously. I could see its surface in much better detail now, the planets that circled it too. I was able to make out land masses on some, and others with large moons, even an asteroid belt, but nothing that signalled any kind of marker for home. No markers of life at all, in fact. I grabbed some of the closest stars at random and activated them for finer inspection. Most of them were yellow or orange, but a reasonable amount glowed red, and many more shone sharp white and bright blues. Nearly all of them fostered planets, all of which seemed equally devoid of life or any indicator of my enemy. I stepped back and gulped. I was surrounded by infinity, with no idea where to begin. This at least gave me a way of looking before I leapt, but it got me no closer to where I desired to be. I reasoned that on such a vast, perhaps even infinite map, a marker for home would be clearly visible, that there would be a shortcut, or at least an indicator, to the place you'd be returning most frequently. Unfortunately, what I deemed to be reason had very little significance when faced with such an alien technology. I was an insect, trying to understand a microscope. I tried to come up with any panicked logic I could beyond simply checking them one by one and hoping for a glimmer of extreme luck. I decided I needed a system for determining which stars I should check and how I would keep track of them. Firstly, the stars far above me could be ruled out. The only way to access everything there would be to pick a star above my head, but still within reach, 
and then jump the ship to it, thereby shifting the whole map downwards. Perhaps I could do that if my search came up lacking. Up was as good as any direction, but for now they were ruled out by their inaccessibility. The same could be said of the endless floor of stars that lay beneath me, although I preferred not to look at them entirely. Presumably, many of the stars that lay far away from the throne were actually projected beyond the confines of the room, and again I wouldn't be able to reach them without shifting the entire chart. To that end, I drew out an imaginary circle around the throne, which I would check fully before deciding to move on. Any further, and I may risk walking into the walls or tripping on the surrounding staircase. By that point, I hoped I would have found some clue or signal that would mean only one more jump was necessary. Beyond the placement of the stars, the only real defining feature I could differentiate them by was their colour. That I could see as soon as I grabbed them, without needing to wait around for them to enlarge. Our star had been orange, and from somewhere in my scattered knowledge of solar bodies, I recalled that they represented the more habitable mid-range of stars. It certainly had served us well, I seem to remember that redder stars were generally at the end of their life, and that white and blue stars presented such extremes that they were far less likely to foster habitable planets, both seemingly things that an advanced race would have avoided. I resolved to only check the orange stars, at least for the time being, hoping this would drastically reduce the total amount I needed to check. For a moment it felt like I'd made some progress, but the crippling reality of this impossible task shone all around me. My endeavour was an unlikely one, and I knew I had to work quickly. I did my best to ignore the impossible odds of my mission, and began frantically dashing round the stars I'd allocated for checking, grabbing and enlarging them, scanning through systems of planets in the vain hope of seeing some sign of their civilization. At first I sped through them as fast as I could, manically flitting from star to star, ever aware that my enemies may burst in and tear me to shreds. As time went on, though, I became more confident, more comfortable. If someone was here and wanted to stop me, they'd surely had time to. I began to conduct my search more patiently. I paced myself, and was more thorough in my examinations, taking care to avoid missing some stars and checking others twice when I wasn't certain. I had no idea what I was looking for, but that made it all the more important I didn't miss anything. Before long, the process became maddening. Not that a sound mind was something I still enjoyed. I was rambling around the room for what felt like days. But, despite the constant frustration and unending scale, my obsession seemed to carry me through. The venom I bore for my enemy, the thirst I could not slake. I would search for one hundred lifetimes, if that's what it took. A lost giant, striding across the very fabric of the universe. I didn't tire, or grow hungry. The slight nagging in my stomach never seemed to worsen, anyway. I didn't question it, instead remaining focused completely on what I needed to do. This ship had been built somewhere, that creature had been born somewhere, and surrounding me lay the map to everywhere, the answer to their end right at my fingertips. After a long time examining the stars, I was confident I checked most, if not all, of the ones that lay within my reach. Despite my careful planning, I suspected that I'd ventured further than I had originally intended to. Turning to try and confirm my suspicions, I realized that I'd lost myself again, no longer having any bearing as to where the throne was, or from which direction I had come. I frantically ducked my head around the nearby stars, hoping that the glare was simply occluding my view. The knowledge that I was in a confined room did very little to combat the terrifyingly surreal nature of the illusion I inhabited, nor how utterly and immediately lost I'd just become. I began worriedly stomping back and forth, the anxiety of my error clouding my senses as worry rose rapidly within me. I must have looked a fool, wading across infinity 
on the jellied legs of a terrified titan, my head swiveling madly as I searched for a lifeline. I pulled myself back from panic and did my best to ground myself despite the lack of grounding. Letting out a wavering exhale, I focused my eyes to the middle distance and began carefully scouring from left to right, rotating step by step until eventually I caught sight of the throne once more. Now that I saw it, I noticed an ever so slight radiance of light around it, so mild as to only be tangible when highlighting the apparition of fine particles and debris that floated all around, like silt. This time I couldn't feel relief when I saw it. The dark stone throne floating there, in the middle of the void, half hidden among the black, some ancient totem of death, sat alone for eons in the drift and dust of deep space. It was somehow more ominous, more threatening, now that I saw it as a distant spectator. The banner of an approaching army on an opposing hill. Orienting myself towards the throne on shaky feet, I was surprised to find myself such a great distance from it, farther from it than I had thought possible, as though I'd walked well beyond the confines of the room. I'd clearly let obsession get the better of me, and checked far more than I'd intended to. Now I had the throne in view, I was scared to let it leave my sight, lest I lose track of my surroundings again. I pointed my toes towards it, and dug my heels into a floor I could not see, only then risking a glance downwards, looking for any sign of the slight staircase that circled the room. Unsurprisingly, I couldn't find it anywhere around me. It seemed as though I had already ventured much too far for that. I needed to be careful. For all I knew, it was possible, plausible, that one could walk far enough away that they might never find their way back. I began to feel very uneasy, not only about what I had to do next, but also regarding this strange space I inhabited. It felt as real as anything, but I was becoming increasingly uncertain of that fact. I began walking back over towards the console unnerved by how many stars I must have checked given my distance from the throne. I tried to think about it, to recall a rough timeline of how long I had spent searching, but what little I could remember was a maddening and singular blur. Where I'd been and what I'd done were mostly abstractions to me then. Vaguities morphing into a red cloud of confusion. Where I was going, though, what I had to do. That burned hot and clear in the front of my mind. I could only see one possible course of action. I had to make the ship jump again and start the search over. I winced at the thought. This jump would likely be much farther, much longer in the blur. The first time had been beyond unpleasant. I imagine it would be to any normal mind that was subjected to it, to me, though, every groan, every creak the ship made as it spooled itself to frenzy reminded my body of what it had endured. Salt in fresh wounds. My mind recalling the panic and the terror. This foul ship in the sky. Remembering her. What they took from me. Nails on a chalkboard. Pain that wouldn't leave me. Anger that stung stronger with every note from this craft's vile orchestra of aches and moans. And that was to say nothing of the disorientation, the hallucinations. Despite my many reservations, I knew it didn't matter. I knew I'd do whatever it took. The punishment and the prize were all that remained. Any pain I had left to endure would surely be inconsequential any further trauma merely a droplet against the swelling tide within. After all, what was there left to lose? I gritted my teeth and resigned myself to the decision. Sanity had long since been abandoned, a concept that required context to exist. Context like society and kinship and anything other than entire and total isolation. What did it matter if I lost my mind? What did it matter how little remained of me at the end? Now I was alone. She had mattered. 
our legacy matters. I wouldn't let us be remembered as victims. I felt my knuckles clenching to white and let out a slow exhale, trying to allow clarity in, trying to find the scattered roots of lucidity between my fractures of rage. The first jump had been accidental, and I had lost my bearings several hundred times over since then. But I was reasonably certain our solar system now laid somewhere behind the throne. Other than that, direction seemed almost entirely meaningless. I stared blankly in indecision, wondering if I should jump as far as I could to give myself more new ground to cover, or somewhere closer where I could hopefully retain my orientation to my star. I laughed at myself in pity. Close had no meaning here, and my star had nothing to return to. I tried to think more pragmatically. Perhaps the fuel was finite. Perhaps I should scan the room and see which direction was the most densely populated with stars. It sounded practical to my addled mind, and after deciding on a vivid cluster of stars in the distance, I started towards them, being ever mindful to keep myself oriented to the throne, ever fearful of losing my bearings. I returned to where I felt marked the edge of the room, and, a few steps further, and the vivid arrangement of stars seemed to begin spreading out in front of me, becoming less clustered as I moved closer. I reached out and grabbed at a violent tangerine shade, letting go once I felt it beginning to activate. It swelled in the air, and a small cluster of four planets popped into being around it. I told myself I was checking to make sure it was safe, but truthfully, I had no idea what danger would look like. After a few moments stood mesmerized by the simulated sunfire, I shook myself clear and took a deep breath. I was not looking forward to the jump. I brought my palm to rest on the top of the star, a trick I had learnt while scanning the room. I felt a soft, resonant hum that lingered on my hand before it shrank back to its original size. There was a wave of nausea at the thought of seeing the ghoulish visage of myself sat in the chair again, at the prospect of enduring the time blur again. This time, though, at least I knew what to expect. I considered my situation a little while longer, scanning the space behind me for anything I may have missed, trying desperately to find a better solution. There was a very brief window of time between my selecting of the star and the jump being made. If I was quick, I lied to myself, I could sprint back to the throne and at least go through the ordeal seated. Perhaps the throne would prevent the hallucinations, or better yet, just black me out for the whole trip. I felt my back teeth clench together and my heels flex instinctively into the floor as I let the anger flood back in, hoping for any burst of energy over the coming moments. I took a final heavy gulp and quickly scanned around the room, wondering if it was worth checking the intermingling stars I'd left out. Perhaps I had missed something essential, some obvious waypoint I hadn't considered. Maybe it had been a mistake to jump so far already. Maybe my target had been far closer to my home. I knew what this was. I knew I was looking for any reason to stay in the relative calm of this glistening bastion. I swallowed my fear, and forced her image into my mind's eye. Not the beautiful lines of her face when she laughed, nor the longing, desperate gaze of our intimate moments. Instead, I focused solely on her lifeless frame, strewn out in front of everyone I had held sacred. The grotesque parody of her that this ship, these disgusting fucking things, had left me with. I kept it in my mind, until my teeth creaked audibly from the clenching of my jaw, until my heart burned and my feet itched, and all I could think was red raw hatred. I noticed the vibration getting heavier in my hand. I'd grab for the star without thinking, my subconscious providing the courage where my waking mind was lacking. Just as before, the star shot through the back of my hand, and after a few moments of delayed reactions, I broke into a sprint back after it, 
had barely begun to stride towards the throne as the star came to rest on the pedestal. I surged towards it at the fastest pace I could muster, but by the time I'd crossed half the space in between, it was already oscillating manically in position. Next came that far-away sound. I could hear it slightly clearer this time. The horrible chorus of scraping metal, the reminder in my gut of what came next. I tried desperately to shake free from the memory of our extermination and focus solely on getting to the throne in time. Fear clung to me, drenching my movement into laboured and sluggish strides. Every step felt heavier than the last as I closed the final stretch to the throne. Then came the bang, an immense exhausting of power, unmistakable and sharp, but muffled, or far away at least. Either were possible, given the vast practicalities of the vessel. I knew what the bang meant. I had no time to gauge if I was close enough to the throne, and instead I flung myself forward into the air in the vain hope of landing on it before the jump. As my feet left the floor, I was aware of the stars beginning to move around me, the surging, swirling confusion of the time blur. I was caught in the air, effortlessly suspended halfway through my forward leap. My first thought was for the ground, and I began the slow, anxious process of lowering my head to look below me. It was a sickening, frightening feeling. No point of contact with the floor, combined with the suspended stasis of the time blur, made it feel as though I were falling forever, while still stuck in paralysis. I was held captive mid-air, with nothing to do but slowly complete my awkward dive. The thought panicked me. Albeit slowly, I was still moving towards something, with no ability to stop myself. I reversed my crawling neck movements, desperately trying to crane my head back up to judge my point of impact. After an indeterminate and bewildering amount of time, I was able to lift it high enough to see the bottom half of the great throne. Without any awareness of my current momentum, it was difficult to appraise, but it seemed likely that I was going to plant face first into the awkwardly high stone seat. Disgusting tension came reeling from the realization. The red-hot anxiety of knowing your face is about to be impacted. Inescapable and uncomfortable. I tried to force my arms out in front of me, screaming internally as I impotently attempted to push them through the air to block the collision, as if my sheer strength of focus would be enough to overwhelm the physics that now held me hostage. Despite my best efforts, my arms continued to glide languidly at my side, their imperceptible movement essentially unchanged by my efforts. For all I know, it was decades suspended in that purgatory, a spectator in my own body. Perhaps it was only a moment, though I doubt it could have been. I tried my best to avoid the question, but I had an uncomfortable amount of time to ponder it. It was long enough to go insane all over again long enough that it felt like a torture that had been designed just for me, long enough that I ran through every happy memory I had with her, every morning kiss and every boozy supper. And still I floated, prisoner to the stupidity of my own decisions, waiting for the crack of reality to hit me square in the face. Around me the stars danced through dimensions, flitting back and forth, swelling and strobing, terrified of obeying any kind of order. The flickering conflict of lights made the room shift frantically between emerald bright and jet dark, shadows fighting shadows and all battling the light. And, in between this eclectic battle of binaries, I was once again confronted by my own grim rendition, the ghoulish mirage of myself I had seen during the previous jump. It was sat motionless on the throne in front of me, like a centuries-old guardian, a blank stare aimed right down towards me from the hollowed pits of its stricken visage. I was much closer than last time, uncomfortably close. My upward craning head was slowly coming level with its stomach, likely close enough to feel its breath, if such a thing had need to breathe. It was easier to recognize myself sat there 
impossible to deny now that I could see it in such detail. I say recognize, though, because this hallucination, this imprint, was not a perfect representation of me. Now I could make it out clearly. It was far easier to see the monstrous degeneration all over its body. Its skin hung in greasy sheets from its bones. It looked pallid and frail. It looked like the very verge of death, eyes bulging and cheeks pinned back in contortion. I hung there, terrified, with no escape from my mid-air prison in front of it, held in stasis, staring up at the ghoulish reflection of my tormented state, unable to look away. I tried my best not to look at it, but closing my eyelids to free myself from the image seemed as though it would take lifetimes. And even had I been capable of it physically, the fear and adrenaline coursing through me would no doubt have been enough to keep me staring in horror. At first I'd been certain that it was not aware of me. I was difficult to ignore, suspended right in front of it. But other than staring right towards me, it seemed to show no acknowledgement of me whatsoever. Its eyes seeming to look right through me, glassy and disinterested. As I remained fixed on it, though, I began to notice small movements, twitches around its gaunt jawline, small spasms almost too subtle to perceive. I wasn't certain at first, as the strobing of the room cast an ever-changing mask of shadows across its death-struck face. But, as I continued to watch, I saw a sludgy tear running from the well of a blood-milk eyeball. From my state of stasis, the speed of the droplet coursing down its sickly skin seemed like lightning striking the sky. I felt the first motions of a gasp begin to occur, a slight tightness developing around the bottom of my ribs, and I tried desperately to squeeze my eyes closed once again, sensing what was about to come. Without any further warning, its eyes peeled wide open, seeming almost to tear at their seams as they bulged down at me. There was focus in them now, a resolve that had been absent before. It shot forward on the throne, entirely unhampered by the stasis, leaning as close as it could to my face. Its jaw slung low on failing muscles, and a deep moan issued forth from somewhere far within it. It was not words, not a noise I recognized in myself, not a natural noise at all a long blur of sound that didn't seem to make any sense to me. Whatever this monster was, I told myself, it wasn't me. It had stolen my form. It was masquerading as me. Some security system of the ship designed to make me stop. I was half right. It certainly wanted me to stop. I could feel it, urging me, screaming at me to change my course of action. But as much as I tried to deny it. On some level I knew this thing was most certainly me. A reflection of my future, the culmination of my past, a warning I would never heed. The scream seemed to continue forever, solace only coming once my eyes had finally closed. After that, it was weeks behind the black of my eyelids. I dare not open them again. I could feel it there, still, leering at me, condemning me. I did not wish for another encounter. Let it stare, I thought. I was beyond its judgment now. Eventually, I felt myself surge forward. My eyes shot open, ready for the grisly impact of my face against the stone of the chair. Instead, they were met with the black reality of the room and the realization that I was back in a sitting position. As my equilibrium returned, I let out a breath of relief. It was over. Then I vomited on myself slightly, a sticky web of bile clinging from my lip. In front of me, the great screen began to lift, and a slice of searing sunlight flushed the room. I was prepared this time, recoiling from the burning brightness before it had a chance to fill my vision. Once the lurid haze of light had begun to normalize, I allowed my eyes to blink open, 
meeting the new star unashamedly as I was. A mad emperor on a throne, built from bodies. A carrion king with a court of corpses. A lunatic, covered in my own filth. The sharp illumination of the star brought me ever so slightly back to lucidity. Trying to remember the events of the jump felt like trying to seize back a dream upon waking, as though I were simply recalling the last couple of moments, but somewhere vague beyond that I was aware of endless thoughts and infinite anxieties that could not possibly have fit within such a time frame. As the recollection of my haunting doppelganger came flooding back, I panicked once more, patting and prodding frantically at myself to ensure the hallucination had been just that, to check if I still existed. Sadly, I was still there. I don't remember thinking about food. I suppose I could have, for a moment. But truthfully, I don't think I'd even let the screen in front of me fully lift before I'd reached out once more for the pedestal. If that was what it took, then that is what I would do. Further thought was not required. Torture was welcomed. The room plunged back into stars, and a blink later I found myself once again airborne, crashing with full speed into the stone front of the chair. I yelped as the bridge of my nose cracked and pulped against it, my knee smashing into the pedestal as my body ragdolled awkwardly to the floor. The shock of the impact kept me down for a moment, wincing in pain against the harsh metal. As my senses gathered, I tried my best to shift myself upright and inspect the damage. Shocked that blood wasn't already spilling down my front, I cautiously tugged at my nose, trying to gently assess the shape it had been left in. To my surprise, I felt no further pain upon touching it, no sudden sting or soreness. I grabbed at it again more confidently, and was shocked to find that it felt entirely normal. I quickly struck at my knee where it had hit the pedestal, and felt nothing but the impact of my hand. I had been reasonably confident I was still sat in the chair while using the navigation map, but this was all the confirmation I needed that the space I occupied now was entirely simulated. I sprang up and gave it no secondary consideration beyond a renewed invigoration. All it meant to me was more time for searching, more time for revenge. What felt like the next few days were spent searching and jumping, jumping and searching. It could have been millennia. It could have been moments. Trying to keep track of it was impossible and unnerving, and so I did my best to keep it far from my mind. I was digging at the bedrock of insanity, where any kind of context or constant was impossible to grab hold of, so instead I did my best to let go. I shuddered the thoughts away whenever they would creep in, focusing only on the task at hand only on vengeance. I would replace the worsening confusion with thoughts of her, and I would move on to the next star. I would replace the doubt with hatred, and I would move on to the next star. I would ignore the fear as it threatened to consume me, and I would carry on forward for as many stars as it took. It was the worst kind of fear, the kind rooted in common sense, something that you must subdue entirely to continue down an insane path. It is the worst kind of fear precisely because you know you should listen to it, that it telling you to stop is the right thing to do, and yet you know you will ignore it anyway. It is the fear of going against your own survival instinct and against everything you've ever known to make sense. It is the fear of being held victim by your own animal, my task was impossible and misguided, and at the end of it lay my certain death and the potential for extreme violence beyond that. But that was my engine, the locus of my efforts. I sprang up with glee at the mere thought of delivering such chaos. It was sanity, it was reason and admission to reality that terrified me. And so, I pushed them so far down that they wouldn't bother me again and I moved on to the next star. During the jumps I had taken to just sitting down and facing away from the throne. I had no desire to keep seeing myself like that. 
I had seen enough. If it was here to deter me, it hadn't worked. If it was here to warn me, I wouldn't listen. I did my best to ignore its guttural pleas as they rang around the room for what seemed like centuries. The keening cries of an animal I didn't recognize. There were moments, though. Moments where I was certain I heard my own voice scream out to turn around. As clear as day, begging with me to look. And in the blur of the jump, those moments can last a very, very long time. Chapter 11 The bright blue-white hum of the star radiated the room. Euphoric, empyrean highlights spilled in, cutting sharp black shadows around the interior of the screen's frame. I squinted at it with wonder from behind raised knees, doing my best to take it in while letting my eyes adjust as gradually as possible. No part of it was occluded by the edges of the screen as it had been with the others. I surmised that either the ship had precautionarily arrived further away due to the star's intensity, or perhaps this star was just smaller and fit more easily within the frame. I had at first selected it on a whim, because the cluster looked strikingly similar to the constellation I carried on her pendant. I very much doubted they were one and the same, though. Even my limited knowledge of stars was enough to understand the geography would be all wrong. But nevertheless, it bore a resemblance, and one direction was as good as any. When I'd selected it in the star map, I was met with an unbelievable beacon of frenzied whites and blues. Brighter still than the stars I'd visited previously. Bright like nothing I'd ever witnessed. As its light flushed the room, I seared in the intensity. Whatever filter lay over the screen in front of me may still have been preventing me from being scorched to cinders in an instant, but even with that protection the intensity was almost too much to bear. It seemed to struggle to contain the star's power as it had done effortlessly with the others. Still, I marveled at the ship's ability to shrug it off, to float here, bathing in this unfathomable tide of light, unmoved and unharmed by such immense power. Once my eyes had finally adjusted, as much as they could at least, I risked a full glance at the star, a frenetic wisp of dancing starlight. It seemed entirely edgeless its light simply cascading into the space around it, falling away from it in a constant stream, moving from the purest, most intense white at its centre to an electric blue at its blurring boundaries. So smooth was the effect that it was impossible to tell where the star ended and space began. Light seemed to waterfall and pour out in all directions, a constant uninterrupted flow, only eventually being tamed by the dark as it wisped away into nothing. The space around it seemed to wane and flux, bruising with colour as the colossal reaction poured into the black. Vivid greens and impossible violet waves stained in and out, pooling in the deep indigo inks of deep space, like prismatic slicks of spilt oil. I have visited eleven stars by my count. None of them felt insignificant. None of them paled in comparison to the last. Far from it. But this star felt very different to the others I had seen. Not just in hue, nor its scale. There was a tranquility to it. Something about it more calm, more peaceful even, and far more beautiful. Peaceful seems like an odd word to use, given that it was perhaps the most destructive and powerful thing I had ever witnessed. But still, something in it soothed me. Unlike the others, I could see no constant storms plaguing its surface. I could see no surface at all, in fact. Nothing beyond the impossible whites of the heaving aura that smothered it. It did not appear as an angry ocean or a crackling storm, instead seeming closer to the rapturous entrance of an afterlife. Something about it felt even more present, somehow even closer to a celestial truth that I was too mired in rage to appreciate revelations I was too vulgar to understand. My eyes glazed over into a more comfortable blur as I sat transfixed by the heaving ebb of the star's aura, pulsating outwards, then inwards, almost as if it were breathing. So great was the reaction that at its most extended 
The star seemed to almost double in size. As I stared at it, I felt myself fall into its heavy, undulating rhythm, my breath slowing to match its movement, the steady swelling and shrinking lulling me towards a serene catatonia. I held her pendant tightly between my thumb and index finger, unconsciously rubbing away at the metal as thoughts of her filled my mind. How desperately I wished she could have seen this. How enamoured she would have been by the beauty, the near divinity of it. How I wished I could tell her I would visit a hundred more if it meant finding those who had harmed her. For the first time since the killing, I felt close to her. I felt her at my side. I felt her urging me. I closed my eyes. And, in my madness, I was with her again. She didn't call out to me, as she had before. Instead, she looked at me with terror, the startled gaze of someone confronted by a thing most monstrous and strange. There was no recognition, no love behind her eyes. Instead, there was fear, fear and revulsion at the fury that now confronted her. I reached out and tried to take her hand. She flinched away first in disgust, and then in sadness, her expression flanked by the soft welling of concern. I saw her old desire to soothe me, to reassure me, but it was buried deep under terror and resentment, terror that if she were to reach back out for me, I would snap at her like a wounded animal. Resentment over our broken promise. I watched the beautiful curving lines of her lips as she opened her mouth, and then, as clear as starlight, as clear as if she were stood right beside me, I heard her speak. Stop! My eyes shot open in panic as the pull of my anxious fidgeting broke the pendant's chain from around my neck. It fell in halves onto my lap, quickly slipping down onto the floor and out of sight. The pendant remained between my fingers, slightly buckled from the pressure I'd exerted on it. I cursed loudly, holding it as tightly as I could without damaging it any further, and closed my eyes once more. Desperate to see her again, desperate to tell her how I raged for her, how close I was to our revenge. But try as I might to dive further into fantasy, she would not appear. Lacking any pockets, I carefully placed the pendant down on the broad arm of the throne. When I'd found it on her, it had been smeared almost entirely crimson with her dried blood. As I looked at it now, it shone, a clumsy silver, my sweat and obsessive fiddling having wiped it back to a scuffed version of clean. I knew what she wanted, what she was asking me to do. Part of me wanted so badly to stay there with her, to give in. But I saw her then only as a product of my fear, another weakness, as the voice in the back of my head telling me it was okay to not follow through, the soft underbelly to the anger that drove me, my fragile mind trying to conjure up reasons to give in. I had no interest in listening. I was too stubborn, too entrenched in my anger to see. I didn't want to deal with it any more. I had made my decision. I had travelled trillions of miles in pursuit of death, in pursuit of justice. I would not stop now. I would focus on nothing else. As much as I could feel it wrenching me apart, I did my best to banish her from my mind, and reached for the pedestal through barely held back tears. I felt a stinging pain in my heart, a sudden lack of warmth at my shoulder, the absence of an absence. As the great screen closed the room to blackness once again, the starlight behind it seemed to glow even brighter, impossibly bright, a brilliant surge shining anew. The faintest of smiles spread across my lips, leaving behind a melancholy that would never release me. The next star would be my twelfth, by now there could be no doubt I was alone. 
more alone than I had ever considered possible. For all I knew, I was further from any kind of civilization than anyone had ever gone. At the edge of everything, plumbing the abyss. But looking at the grandeur, the power all around me, I felt confident that others had gone further. In truth, this ship made me certain of some grand galactic narrative in which we had never played a part other than our casual extinction. A grand and glorious tale my people would never hear, but one that would be ever marked by the horrors I would wreak upon it. I had taken to reactivating the pedestal as quickly as I could, to avoid as much of the blistering starlight as possible. I'd spent mere moments awake on the throne since first sitting down on it, but in the frozen time of the ship's navigation system it had been unfathomably longer, impossible to estimate, given the absurd nature of the space. After the far longer stint at the previous star, I felt my resolve ever so slightly beginning to fade. As I stared down another infinite vista of celestial bouquet, willing myself to start another search, the cracks of despondency started to creep in. I let my eyes glaze over and took a moment of wavering rest. Through the blurry scattering of starlight in front of me, I half noticed a light much brighter than the others, drowning out its siblings in a lime-green haze. As I reached out to grab it, I was disappointed to see it begin to glow a bright red. I had seen many others like it on previous jumps. I had ruled out checking such stars, my limited knowledge recalling something about the brighter red ones being bodies approaching the end of their life, their glow reaching an apex as they get ready to die. The kind of home such an advanced civilization might easily and impassively move away from, I'd reasoned. As I let go, I pondered on it for a moment longer, wondering if such a thing as the star's life cycle would truly be simulated by the navigation system. I briefly glanced around, reminding myself that it was entirely plausible that I was walking through a live simulation of the entire cosmos. I stared at the star, motionless in the air in front of me, and I began to feel quite a connection to it, to the idea of it living beyond its time, waiting to die. And so, beginning to feel my isolation ever more acutely, I reached out towards it, not just in curiosity, but also through an imagined act of kinship. There were a couple of moments of vibration before it filled the air in front of me. I stood rigid with amazement as I bathed in a rich, scarlet hue. There was no dying star. The star was a bright burning orange, just like most of the stars I had visited. But around it circled an icon of a large crimson serpent devouring its own tail. Dumbstruck, I choked out a laugh that sounded maligned and stretched. This was it. There couldn't have been any clearer signal, an emblem immediately recognizable from the carvings that had adorned the corridor. It was seemingly two-dimensional, always staying flat to my perspective, no matter how far to the side I craned my head. It was bright, too, far brighter than the burning star it encircled, emanating violent reds in a wide aura around itself, bright enough that I had entirely ignored the nine planets that orbited it, and that around one of those planets circled another glowing red circle. Much smaller, to match the size of its target, still with its tail in mouth. I stared at it for a lifetime, my stomach festering as my rage boiled up into an excited furor. That is where they call home. A small part of me praised it as a miracle. Despite the tens of thousands of stars I'd checked, I could have gone a million more without ever finding them. The other part cursed at myself for my ineptitude and shuddered at the thought of all the red glows I'd let pass by. I knew the majority must have been stars, but what were the odds that this was the first of them? that hadn't been. Questions swirled around the base of my mind, but my anger was too loud to hear them, my goal too near for me to care. Perhaps the presence of my enemy 
was far more prolific than my failed search had first suggested. It made sense. I would have expected nothing less from the creators of such a vessel. They clearly were advanced enough to proliferate wherever they wanted, however many stars they desired. And so I told myself it didn't matter, that I had nothing but time. I would find my way to all of them, eventually. The thought calmed me. I reached forward slowly toward the planet. My stomach was knots of excitement and fury, and manoeuvring my hand through the air proved challenging as it began to course with the tremors of adrenaline. I grabbed shakily around it, as if I were too quick or too firm, the inhabitants might notice a giant fist closing around their world. The vibration seemed to stretch out alongside my anticipation. I did my best to hold back hysteria. I wasn't sure what to expect, but to my glee, the rest of the solar system disappeared, and the planet in front of me took center stage, swelling in size. My mouth dried, and I blinked away sweat that didn't seem to be there. It was teeming with life. I could see globules of it, pulsating and swarming around the surface in irregular pools of bright crimson, almost like bacteria under a microscope. I spat at the ground in venom, barely registering that no saliva had seemed to fly through the air. The globules of red clearly represented large groups of them, cities and towns. The planet was covered, crawling with the things. They heaved and swelled as if they were breathing, as if it were tracking the ebb and flow of their individual mortality. The planet seemed to have a large covering of ocean, just as my planet had. The oceanic areas lay empty of the red glow, so I presumed it was only an indicator of advanced life. But other than those great expanses of blank grey, the planet was entirely covered with globular visualizations of its populace. The view of the surface was detailed enough that I could make out some larger buildings or structures, two specifically that seemed to span across entire land masses. They were almost too small to make out on the projection, but they were undoubtedly larger than anything my people had ever built. In the space around the planet, I could even make out thousands of tiny satellites, buzzing around their orbits in every possible permutation. Beyond the satellites ran the ring of the serpent's body, which sat still in the air, rather than slowly rotating, as the planet did. There could have been no clearer signal. This iconography had been present throughout their ship. It was their emblem, the symbol of their power, their marker for home. I couldn't be certain of the size of their planet in relation to mine, but their proliferation across the surface suggested there must have been many billions of them living there. Trillions, maybe. I thought back to the one I killed, and shuddered at the prospect. As I watched the red globules heave and shift on the rotating projection in front of me, I could feel my skin crawl with the anxious tickling of fury. I tried to stop myself from imagining their disgusting society glopping and indecent and cruel, their lives continuing unblemished, unperturbed by what had happened to us, the festering stink of their marketplaces, the hatred they spewed in their academies, the ravenous need for slaughter that could envision a weapon such as this. They deserved to die. As the red glow filled my blurring vision, I imagined them celebrating their victory, raucously mocking how easily we had fallen, meat and chum spilling from them as they gorged through rows of tiny razors, disgusting and shrill, a skittering cry of self-appreciation, another target down, another species gone forever, a trillion black eyes all rolling to the heavens as they foamed with hive-like ecstasy. Somewhere behind my mind I heard my back teeth squeaking and grating against one another as I faded back into fantasies of revenge. I gave a brief thought to their defences, focusing on the orbiting satellites, looking for a sign of something that could stop me. It made sense that if they had built such a weapon, then surely they could defend against one. But while sense may dictate that, the concept of sense 
had been useless to me for a while now, and I had no doubts as to the tremendous efficacy of the vessel. This weapon had been built to eradicate planets, entire species. Whatever defences they had could be no match for such a force. And if that was the case, then perhaps they would first recognise the vessel as a friend, and their defences would be lowered. This ship, the one thing capable of breaching such an advanced fortress. It doesn't matter. There is no other option. It's all been leading here. There could be no doubt that they had amassed great power. This ship alone was proof of that. But look at what that power had provided them. They had become the agents of extinction. They could have come to us with open arms, to all the others that presumably came before us, to those that would come next. I think we would have welcomed them diplomatically, although, given the opportunity, I can't say for certain we wouldn't have rendered them extinct all the same. In that moment, hovering in the air in front of me, they looked so small, so insignificant compared to me. Easy prey. My excitement overtook me for a moment, and I began to giggle, relief and the burning desire for violence mixing together in one manic cackle. I wasted no more time. I was distantly aware of my heartbeat in my eardrums. I felt the planet's vibration buzzing in my palm. A moment later, it was above the pedestal, its image scrambling and spinning as the ship began to gear up for the jump. It was time for it to return home. I didn't dash for the throne, but I did not even turn away. I wanted to stare myself in the face this time, impassive to the nightmarish illusions the ship subjected me to. It was more than likely that this would be my last jump. I wanted everything this vessel could throw at me, whatever they could throw at me. Try and deter me. Try and halt this inevitability. I will arrive as this ship's master, as the commander of death itself. I am vengeance, I am the grand absence of your guilt, and I am baying at your door in reprisal. I had to be singular in focus. I could feel myself losing the battle inside, becoming captive to my darker desires, falling further into the warm lull of madness. The stars began to swirl and stutter lighting the vast space with the last dance we would share. I looked to them warmly, confident for the first time that I was capable of righting this galactic wrong. I felt calm, as calm as I had felt since waking up here. Looking back, though, I was in a frenzy, the eye of a storm that I could not see out of, a numb haze conjured by the apex of my mania. The placidity that I experienced was simply the brief plateau at the mountain top of fury. I didn't react as the sound of distant cannons fired once more. Now it sounded more like trumpets heralding my arrival. The trembling of nerves in my legs slowed to a sudden and complete pause as the time blur hit me like a wave. Here I come. I kept facing straight towards the throne, forcing myself to stay transfixed on it. I stayed there watching, staring for millennia, as time stretched itself around me. This time I wanted to confront it, to demonstrate that I could not be stopped, that I would never be deterred. But despite my age-long watch, my ghoulish counterpart never appeared, the throne laying empty for the entirety of the journey. At the time, I wasn't certain what this meant though my stomach was grim with discomfort nonetheless. A prickling spike of self-preservation trying to alert me towards considering the inconsistency further. But I stayed purposefully numb to doubt. I wanted to think of nothing but revenge. I was sick with it, desperate for it. It could have been ten lifetimes I stood there, and nothing crossed my mind but vulgar fantasies of the coming slaughter. No second thought or not of empathy. No doubt or concern over the outcome, beyond the efficacy and spectacle of the violence. Just sheer excitement. I want you to know that.
and then, a short while, or centuries later, I arrived. I blinked awake on the throne, and for the first time since waking up here, I was aware of the ship's movement. Very aware, in fact, as the ship seemed to be violently aligning itself, almost tossing me forwards from the throne. I steadied myself against the raised arms as the ship continued its agonizing shift back towards equilibrium. Across the room, the great screen began to lift, revealing the soft cyans of lower atmosphere and the bright kiss of daylight. The scene in front of me continued to pan upwards as the ship brought itself further and further downwards. As the landscape below was revealed, my mouth hung open in amazement. It was a city of wonder, of majesty, stretching off all the way to the distant horizon. The first thing I noticed was the height of everything. You built your cities far taller than ours, buildings that reached up for the sky. Most were littered with hundreds upon hundreds of tiny windows. Others seemed to be made almost entirely from glass. For the most part, though, I recognized the similarities more than the differences. Life in the city was clearly cramped, despite the obvious grandeur. Buildings were arranged into blocks and intersected with roads and pedestrian walkways. Seemingly, some logistical solutions were universal. Out toward the ocean, I saw an enormous statue that grazed the lower hanging clouds, a crowned figure in a long flowing robe. It was beautiful, breathtaking, and I would destroy it all. I would scour any beauty, any culture and joy and invention from the face of this rock, and salt the ground before I left. I would leave them as rubble, as they had left us. The second thing I noticed was a fleet of flying machines speeding through the air towards the ship. They were fast moving and difficult to make out. Some looked like our fighter planes, with a single wing on either side, and what may have been engines hanging underneath. Trailing behind them were some smaller aircraft, moving at a much slower speed. I didn't recognize their shape, but they were not any kind of plane as I understood them. I screamed obscenities that they would never hear as they arced across the sky in front of me. I waited for a barrage of gunfire and missiles, only somewhat confident they wouldn't be able to penetrate the ship. The barrage never came. The craft continued to fly closer, headlong into fury. Just as they were getting near enough to make out markings on their vessels, the front runners seemed to hit an invisible wall in the sky, their high speed approach coming to an abrupt halt as they were punched out of the air by an unseen hand immolating into bright orange clouds of fuel and fuselage. A short distance behind them, the smaller vessels seemed to sputter to a halt and fall slowly towards the ground. By now I was spitting and yelping in excited frenzy. I bounced around in my giant seat like an excited toddler, cheering for every one of you I watched tumble out of the sky. Despite my cruel and exuberant fervor, all else around me was silence. Whatever chaos was occurring down on the surface remained largely detached from me. I sat in a sanctuary, a vacuum, an untouchable spectator to your coming agony. A madman screaming at the walls of his cell. I continued to brace against the maddening downward tilt of the vessel, and as it came to a slow stop I realized I could make out the streets below. Too far to see individuals, but just close enough that small land vehicles were visible to me. I saw billows of smoke beginning to rise from where the aircraft had landed, and what I presumed to be flak firing impotently from emplacements below. I felt their terror as they scratched and scrambled below me. Your terror. And I relished it. The crimson ring of light that had previously topped the pedestal in front of me now hummed bright with an inviting emerald green. It had taken me a moment to notice, but now that I had, I felt a deep belly laugh rising within me. I felt insane with power. I was Erebus incarnate. I was rage personified, and I would bring forth judgment upon you. The sins of your past brought home to roost. 
I was your day of reckoning. I was a fool. It was clear you would try again to stop me, but I was confident you could not. I trusted this ship would fulfill its purpose. I fear that is all it can do. The bright emerald in front of me was welcoming, enticing. I had no doubt as to what purpose it would fulfill. But I did not rush it. I did not hurry. I savoured it. I wanted all my kin to see. I wanted them to cheer me on from their vast dais at my side. I wanted whoever did this to know what was coming, to know they couldn't escape it, just as we had. Everything these foul monsters did repaid in kind, one trillion times over. That will be our legacy, I yelled to my audience of fallen kin. One trillion times over. In my madness, I heard them rupture forth with screams of pride clamouring and bellowing for me to take everything from you, drumming their feet rhythmically against the hard metals of the ship, slavering with excitement at the back of their avenging angel. I took a deep breath and gave one final thought to her. The wrong thought. I didn't see her kissed by the sun on a golden beach. I didn't hear her soft whisper of I love you. I didn't try to imagine what she would think of me now, what she'd say to me in that moment. They weren't what I needed. I needed to abandon myself entirely. So, I conjured the crimson pits of her eyes when the horn rang, the sight of her memories, of our life together, running from her ears in a demented slurry of greys and reds. Beauty, perfection, destroyed without meaning. What I would do next would be different. It would be purposeful, justified. As I leant forward, I felt my face contort into a vicious scowl, and somewhere behind the fervour and adrenaline, a sharp ache shot through my back. There was a distinct moment of clarity, something crystalline and honest. I ignored it. This is for you, I whispered to her, plunging my hand into the green. Even if I had been right, she still would have hated me. Chapter 12 On my planet, we measured time in a number of different increments, the smallest regular standard of which we called a second. A second is less than a fleeting moment less than half a breath. A second is a snapshot, the blink of an eye, something that is gone almost as soon as it has arrived. This moment was the longest second of my life, a moment dripping in thick silence, a heavy brooding silence that can only precede something most terrible. I shook with excitement at the prospect of my endeavour the creaking rattle of my strained breaths piercing the otherwise perfect calm. Then the hum started, too soft to hear at first, but some static unrest coursed through the air, prickling at the finer senses. I could feel the small hairs on my arms beginning to raise and excite against the building friction. My heart started to flutter a strange staccato against the wall of my chest, a quickening but irregular beat in anticipation of the grim crescendo rising around me. Next, a tentative rising buzz, dancing right on the edges of my awareness, a hum that seemed to flow from all around me, building from the quiet drone of a nearby insect to a threatening and definite chord. Every few seconds I could make out the violent swish of heavy metal from somewhere in the craft. The oscillation of an engine far too dangerous to keep nearby. As the sound rose louder still, I could hear the rotations of the unseen beast speeding up. Soon it moved so rapidly that one sound was indistinguishable from the next, intertwining with the building hum into one terrible and constant scarring of sound. I started to be able to recognize it. The noise had been too light before, 
too reduced and muffled. But now I heard it clearly. The terrifying symphony. The crackling agenda of this ship's vile purpose. My brutal apotheosis. I waited for the knots of dread in my stomach, the racing fear I would need to calm, as my mind and body recalled the horror this wretched melody had brought with it. It never came. I was too deep in glee, in glorious unending rage, in madness. I screamed in delight, and again in lunacy, trying to hear my triumphant shrieks over the bellowing of the death engine spooling up a mile beneath me. I imagined the terror stricken across the sickening faces of those down on the surface, those who had wronged us. I hoped they knew. I hoped you knew exactly why this was happening, that you'd recognize this vessel for exactly what it was. Not in the bracing panic of certain extinction as I had, but in the resigned knowledge that this apocalypse was of your own making. I was sure the horn would kill me when it sounded. The rising din already felt as though it were splitting the bone of my skull as it engulfed me on all sides. I didn't care. I welcomed it. I wanted to feel it again. I wanted to join her. For all this to have been some cruel accident I was never supposed to survive. But despite any agony, I would die with a smile cast wide on my face, knowing a chapter of this grand story had ended with ours. For a moment, there was silence once again, a pause pregnant with the deaths of ten billion beings. I closed my eyes, and I waited for her. It was only a stolen second to reassure myself, but something felt desperately wrong. I could feel her absence all over me. I tried to conjure her to mind, waited for her reassuring hand at my back. It never came. The silence was broken by the horn of the old god. My eyes shot open to the wail of impossible power. I had told myself it could not be as terrible as it had been from the ground, that the ship would protect me, but in that moment I felt nothing but violent, certain death. The cells of my body were shearing apart from themselves. Consciousness was destabilizing and threatening to disconnect entirely. My eyes screamed as if they were being torn at the edges, a crimson vignette webbing across my vision. It was a horror that seemed to never end, and in my mind I begged for the silent prison of the time blur. I pled for a quiet death, anything to not go through this again, to not go through it awake. In the depths of my despair, they called out to me. The billions of grateful dead that lay at my flanks. I could hear them singing in victory. A haunting, beautiful verse. Something I recognized from my childhood. A song we'd sing a long time ago, to mark the harvest season. Soft at first, dancing around my ears with a gentle reverence. I focused on it, doing whatever I could to drown out the unending death blare of the horn. As I let the music seep in, it began building rapidly toward a full chorus, quickly overwhelming the chaos until it was all I could hear. A booming, deep choir of the wronged. They were watching, swelling with gratification at all that we'd accomplished. There was one voice missing, though. One I couldn't make out, no matter how much I searched for it. Her beautiful spring-flower melody was nowhere to be found. Accepting the logic of my own insanity for a moment, I told myself it was one voice among billions, impossible to make out. I was wrong, or at least I was too readily accepting of my own lies. If her voice were starlight, then I would know it from one glance at the heavens. If it were a leaf, I would know it from the forest. The sounds of her singing and her laughter still loom in my heart now, even though all else has abandoned it. 
The truth of it was that she was no longer with me. I hadn't wanted to hear what she had to say, or I could not bring myself to listen to it. And now she sings to me no more. I jolted upright on the throne, pushing against the raised arms so I could bring my feet up and stand atop it for better vantage. As I did so, finding my footing on wobbling legs, I heard their harmonies turn to chants. The ritual sounds of some savage warrior tribe filled the space around me with a terrifying metronome, as I stood tall and regal like a conquering emperor. In that moment, I felt immeasurable pride in what I had done, all that I had engineered. I felt gleeful in revenge, but something else beyond that, as though I had achieved more in our final moments than any of my species ever had previously, as though some unspoken biological imperative had been fulfilled. So strong was my delusion that I found myself struggling to scream over it to address my subjects their thunderous war hymn only building in exuberance. I raised the hand of a monarch, signalling for calm, convinced of my splendour, insane, and at the very fringes of my grief. Their chanting lowered to a threatening bass-filled whisper as I screeched out a proclamation of victory. We were brought here as prey, but we shall die as conquerors. I waited half expecting a roar of cheering, half expecting my brain to shear in two from the sound of the horn. Instead, there was silence, and all below me was dead. The great rectangle before me showed a vast muted tapestry of chaos and death. From my steep vantage point, I could already make out the tell-tale beginnings of a hundred small fires. They populated the blurring distance like stars against the night. To me, then, it looked like the most beautiful art that I had ever seen painted. In the centre of the frame I could see something that looked at first like a gargantuan golden bowl. It stood out from the rest of the skyline due to it being the only building not cramped in by other structures. Instead, a spacious plaza surrounded it on every side. Like many of the other large buildings, it was adorned with enormous swathes of blue and white fabrics, hanging in bunches around the top edge and descending down cleanly at regular intervals. And while the skyline was a mosaic of gunmetals and blue greys, this stood out in shining gold, clearly somewhere of great importance. It reminded me in many ways of our open-air stadiums, and, as I looked down inside it, I could just make out rows upon rows of tiered seating. Seemingly, it was another solution that had universal practicality, although here it didn't seem to be built for watching a sport. There was a large stage built in the centre of the floor, gold like the building's exterior and adorned in similar blue and white drapery. I was too overtaken by the destruction to focus on it, but I remembered a brief wondering as to what these vile little creatures would lord so highly as to give it such reverence. Perhaps public executions were their primary source of entertainment. A giant ribbon of cascading blue and white cloth caught my eye, cutting into view as it snaked through the air towards the ground, presumably having wrestled free from one of the impossibly tall buildings close by. I followed it down as far as I could, mesmerized by the pointlessness of its meandering route. I was lost in ecstasy. My mind raced with images of those below dying in horror and agony. The terrified panic on your ugly little faces as the end, built from your own hands, dawned upon you. How I wished then I could see it up close. Families falling down next to each other as fodder for the soil. Lovers torn apart. Generations dying in unison. That was more beautiful to me then than any star. I was ripped from my lurid fantasy when a great tower with a thousand windows sheared in half like a sinking ship. It was one of the closest buildings to my viewport 
and despite being a reasonable distance below me, still I felt myself flinch backwards slightly, as the vast top section gave way with a snap. It seemed to fall forever, eventually disappearing into a tremendous surging plume of powder and smoke. Beneath the dust cloud and chaos, it seemed certain that the falling tower had impacted many of the smaller structures built around it. I leapt from the chair with a mad shriek, and was distantly aware of the buckling of my ankles as I scrambled from all fours back to vertical, racing to the window for a better view of your doomsday. Lethargy suddenly stung at me in every direction, but adrenaline carried me through. I felt elation as I approached. Finally, this was something I recognized. Despite the clear differences between our cities, this scene looked very familiar now. It looked just as my world had, broken, wrecked, and lifeless. I stood there, swelling with satisfaction at my accomplishment, the walls of my enemy's bastion crumbling at my feet. We were all equal in death. Beyond the growing dust cloud of cascading architecture, I could see a large group of planes still approaching me, far enough away that they almost looked like a flock of birds. My mouth dried for a moment before I realized they were careening ever so gently towards the ground. Their pilots presumably skid-marked against the interior canopy. I cocked my head to better follow their steady downward glide and didn't avert my gaze until I saw them silently puff into bright orange flame below. One of them landed out of sight, inside the great golden bowl, and mere moments later it had taken on a healthy orange glow from within. It all looked so gentle from here, so quiet and subdued. Down there it must have been chaos, screaming, churning destruction, complete collapse. But from here it was tranquil. I was so far removed from the sounds of turmoil, and the view was grand enough, that everything took on a serene beauty. The city stretched far to the horizon, and all the way there flowed a myriad network of smoke plumes and small fires bursting into life. Scarlets and tangerines mottled the silver-grey expanse, leaking further afield as they gathered the energy required to swallow everything you had built. I closed my eyes and saw the whole planet ablaze. I had done it. The painting of a masterpiece. The obscenity seen through. I paced the window, screaming vulgarities and taunting the dead that lay far below, scouring each road for any signs of movement, for even one survivor to give me reason to sound the horn again. I sang along with my fallen kin and danced an insane jig as the plumes of devastation rose in front of me. I spat and punched and masturbated at the vast screen. I howled and stamped and yanked my hair out in clumps. I had lost myself entirely to the animal within. I wanted to make it as vicious as I could. I wanted them to know terror incarnate, this beast of their making. I wanted them to see horror they couldn't reason with, just as I had. They were, of course, all dead. But reason had no place within me. My frenzied celebration lasted for hours. Hours I would rather not remember. Long into the night. Long enough that the whole horizon had begun to burn. A bright orange band separating this city of wonder from the mottled purples of the sky above it. As the smoke boiled upwards, I watched it fill the mauve roof of the planet's upper atmosphere, turning it to a thick indigo. I told myself I saw beauty there, in my victory, in what I had achieved, but I doubt beauty is a word many would use for what lay in front of me. It's strange. I'd never been a killer, never even thought of being one. But, in the end, billions had come just as easily as one. All it had taken was losing everything. I doubt there will be any memory of me, of us, but if the history of the universe is measured in what's been taken, then I suppose I am a very important person indeed. If, however, it is measured in what's been lost, then I am perhaps most worthy of its condemnation. 
Eventually, I succumbed to the increasing gnaw of exhaustion and rested my head against the window, letting myself drift off as the scenes of devastation lulled me towards slumber. Shadows pooled like oil around the room from the dancing oranges that littered the landscape. I felt fulfilment and nothing else, delight in a job well done, as though some impossible balance had been accomplished, an inconceivable wrong now righted. And for the slightest second, I didn't even feel the gaping hole she'd left in my heart. As my eyes closed gently on the distant fires raging below, I saw a fleet of white eggs floating down towards the surface with unthinking purpose. On the blurred edges of my periphery, a slight reflection haunted me through the glass. Intermingled with the pastel palette of the alien dusk, a monster I half recognized, staring back at me, blankly, through hollow eyes. It felt like days before I eventually stirred back to consciousness. When my eyes finally opened again, there was a sudden rush of panic all across me. Starvation and agony competing over which could make me suffer more. My head stung strong with a kind of pain I didn't recognize. My throat creaked with every breath, and it felt sharp to swallow. My legs and arms were barely responding to command. They felt hot and numb and useless as I negotiated my way to standing. Glancing at the sight of my eggs, I didn't recognize any fresh wounds or bruises, but my skin was waxy and pale. I grimaced at the food tube, far on the other side of the room. My body hurt to the bones. I felt closer to death than I had ever been. It clung to me with certainty, its stench roiling in my sweat, its cold breath at the back of my neck. What took you so long? My waking clarity recalled my leap from the chair, the shooting pains as I had leapt from it, how my ankles had felt brittle like glass as I'd landed. Had I ever really left the chair? The more I thought about it, the more it made sense. The seemingly impossible amount of time I'd spent in the chamber not exhausting, not hungering. That pleasant, restorative hum. The effortless healing of my wounds. How I could defy the centuries to travel distances such as these. The throne had been keeping me alive. I began to attempt to stumble back across the room towards it when a lurching sensation of dread struck my stomach. With a dry gulp of ugly anticipation, I turned my head to the side, squinting against the harsh daybreak of your rising sun. I was surprised to see the ship had maintained its position over the city. Presumably the task of gathering up the dead was still ongoing. Below me the fires still raged in isolated pockets, and smoke hung above the city in a ghoulish miasma. All signs of life were entirely gone. The city stood dead and empty, just as I did. In the centre of the frame the golden bowl blazed still, like an angry goblet of hell fire. A golden torch of fury passed on, no longer mine to bear. I began to crack a strained smile, allowing myself a moment to bathe in my success, trying to reassure myself of my heroism. But something there stung at me. Some nagging prong of my waking clarity was telling me to look again. My fresh lens recognized it immediately. The blue and white banners, the tall square buildings, even the statue. It didn't feel Right. It felt welcoming, almost. At least, it would have done, if it hadn't been turned into a field of death and hell. I glanced back around at the great room I stood in. Scarlet, silver, and threatening, and sparse. I told myself that it made sense. They were both grandiose in their own right. One was built for extinction, the other for peaceful living. But the planes made little sense, too, now I'd stop to consider them. They'd created this vast floating monolith, effortlessly suspended with unrivaled power, but they still used planes to fight with. The questions flushed my brain hot with confusion, 
and I quickly sought out denial. Maybe they just made the most sense for near-planet travel. Maybe the mechanics of flight meant they were common everywhere. Maybe not all the planets in their empire were at the same level of advancement. I kept piling on any tenuous affirmation I could think of, but something underneath it all still gnawed at me. I pulled myself away from the thought and began the agonizing trudge towards the food tube. My stomach was crippling from lack of sustenance, but the thought of eating brought with it a new wave of queasiness. My stomach was so badly shrunk, I feared eating would not even be a possibility. I could feel it bleeding, chewing away at itself. If I didn't consume something, I knew I would not survive much longer. I fell down by the tube, too fatigued to slow my fall with my hands. As my knees impacted the floor, they rang with an intense pain, and for a moment I feared them so fragile they'd been smashed into shards. The discomfort continued, far longer than I expected, the ringing pain immediately following impact seemingly not subsiding to something lesser for a good few moments. Eventually I managed to raise myself up to tube height, sliding a tentative hand inside the aperture not really caring how much I kept in my grasp. It seemed to turn to a waxy paste as my sand-dry mouth did its best to bite through it. I chewed and chewed, but it felt tough, and I could feel my throat closing and flexing as I did my best to swallow it down. Eventually I choked some back through streams of tears and raspy hyperventilating. I kept as much as I could in my stomach, but the majority of the grim mixture ended up being violently expelled on the floor of the chamber. I winced back, trying to clear my vision of the stinging tears. My throat stabbed sharp, and my mouth tasted sickly and foul. I staggered to the throne in a total daze, blood rushing to my head, pink jelly falling from my hand as I forgot to keep it cupped. I clambered weakly back onto the throne, expecting to be met with the eager tingle of crackling energy, of whatever unseen technology had been prolonging my existence. Instead there was nothing, no rejuvenating prickle as I made contact, no fuzzy warmth running over me. It seemed entirely inert. I awkwardly slapped at the raised arms, trying to jump-start the effect by reaffirming my presence, but the throne didn't seem to care. Seeing the pedestal's glow had changed back to the original crimson, I gave a lethargic wave of my hand through the ring of light, hoping to activate the navigation system and escape my worsening pain. As my hand moved through, there was no response, no recognition or activation. Just like the throne, it didn't seem to recognize my presence at all. A fresh ripple of cold sweat trickled down me, as my rudimentary intellect tried to understand technology far beyond its scope. I pawed and bashed at it like a confused animal, hoping to trigger some kind of reset. If I'd have been capable of it still, I might have panicked. Without access to the pedestal, I was trapped here, floating above this death world, this tomb of my making. I told myself it may take some time before the system is ready to be used again, but somewhere under my delusion reality had begun to sink in. Not the worst place to die, I suppose. Instinctively, I raised a hand to stroke the chain of her pendant in self-reassurance, and it was only as I grabbed at empty space that I remembered breaking it. My eyes shot to the arm of the throne where I'd left the small piece of metal, but it was no longer there, likely having slid off during the ship's realignment, or knocked away during my feral celebrations. I cursed at my own stupidity, using what little energy I had to bend forward and check the floor around the throne. I couldn't see it anywhere, though my blurring vision and raised position likely would have kept it from view even if I'd been staring right at it. I moaned in broken despair and let my body fall back off the throne, not willing to let that last piece of her go. My body felt like glass as I hit the floor. It had only been a small distance to the ground, as I was already leaning halfway down from the throne, and yet I felt the crunch of the impact across my whole frame. 
I was too exhausted to make any effort to slow my fall, and the air had shot from my lungs as I collided with the harsh metal. I laid there wheezing, in stunted, rattling gasps, terrified by my new-found fragility. My eyes flowed freely with the tears of panicked choking, and for a moment it felt as though the breath may never return to me. Eventually I managed to steady myself, and I rolled over to inspect underneath the throne, now completely acclimatized to the fact that it was hovering silently in place, making no contact with the floor. There was no sign of the pendant there, but I found one half of the broken chain, glinting in the soft shadow. I grabbed for it clumsily, my motor skills seemingly lagging behind what I was telling them to do. I clutched it tightly around my fist and kissed at the broken piece of metal before continuing to lethargically scour the room from my hands and knees. It was a useless endeavour. My vision was failing, and my brain badly fogged. I couldn't see the pendant anywhere, nor the other half of the chain. I shuddered at the thought of one of the eggs having removed it while I was unconscious. I quickly checked the other side of the throne for my leather bag of useless possessions. It was still there. I grasped for it, desperately searching the worn folds for somewhere the pendant could have fallen. I could feel what little remaining strength I had sinking from me. Every movement was a new shot of pain, every ache worsening by the moment. My head sank to the floor as I accepted my failure once again. I travelled across the stars and brought death to billions, but I couldn't find a pendant on the floor in front of me. I couldn't even keep that small piece of her safe. I felt no reassuring hand at my shoulder no comforting whisper of her presence. I was certain she'd abandoned me. But in truth, I'd abandoned myself. I curled myself into a fetal position next to the throne, bundling my knees up against my chest and wrapping my arms around them. My lungs burned and felt stiff, creaking as though they were made of wood as I pulled in each laboured breath. I considered trying to strategize, trying to plan out my next move. But pain was overwhelming me, not just the sharp registry of wounds, but pain throughout me, pain from inside me. My teeth stung against my gums and sliced at the dry lining of my inner cheeks. My bones rang sharp with every movement. My skin itched and burned and leaked milky sweat that gave off a sickly tang. I let my head collapse back against the stone of the chair, wincing as the impact was far heavier than I'd imagined. I kept my eyes clenched shut, and let myself slip away into my fever. Perhaps I would never open them again. Not the worst place to die. Somewhere underneath the raging pain and racing thoughts, I felt a slight degree of easement. Behind my eyelids, the room was growing darker, the lowering of the screen. I felt the sides of my eyes relax somewhat, venting the tension from my stiff grimace. I gave an exhausted sigh and readjusted my aching ball of a body, trying to hijack the moment to find any position of comfort. Seconds later, the easement behind my eyes, turned to startling white. Tension clenched fresh across my face, and a new knot of dread tied itself roughly to the bottom of my withering stomach. I opened my eyes, and there you were. Vicious, raging, and nothing like the one I'd killed. Epilogue After it had taken a moment to decipher what I was seeing through the haze, through the murk of my quickly declining condition. After the chamber had closed to darkness, the screen had switched to a video feed. I recognized the room first, the cramped and featureless scarlet cell that I'd initially woken up in. 
the harsh metal of the slab dominating what little floor space there was. The back of my head stung at the sight of it, like the wound was still fresh. Then I saw you, just beyond it, stood tall, imposing, breathing in heavy, rolling gasps that seemed to make you swell in size. My chest froze tight, and my mind began to race. I could only see the back of you at first, but that was enough. Your skin was lighter than mine, your shoulders larger and legs thicker, muscle bunched thick around your frame. If it were an even fight, I would not stand a chance, and it would not be an even fight, not even a fight at all. It was clear from one glance that you were not like me, but much clearer than that, and more worrying still, you were not like them, not at all like the one who had died at my hands, the one who had brought so much pain to my door, the one who had taken her from me. You were something very different indeed. I felt my brain stutter as it tried to unscramble the situation, unwilling or unable to accept the implications of what it was seeing. I felt shame and fear fighting for control inside me, the grim ichor of guilt pooling thick in my stomach. And then you turned, and I saw the face of rage itself, anger and loss beyond all measure, primordial, unbridled fury their only outlet. It was a face I knew well, the face of someone who'd had their entire world taken away in an instant, of someone who had witnessed true evil, and now had to live with its stain upon them. I could see the confusion and shock written so clearly across you. I sat there in silence, watching you scream and rage at the walls through the muted screen, watching you tremble and wither and beat your hands bloody, watching you discover the exit. The screen cut to black and left the room in darkness for a few moments. It was only then that it fully hit me, what it meant. The disguise of denial slipped, and it all came flooding so clearly into focus. The stark truth of everything I'd done, what I'd taken from you, how this foul ship had used me to do it. Those scarlet serpents had never been indicators of home. I had simply seen what I had desired for them. In truth, they were targets, crosshairs, the vessel's signal for a planet ripe for extinction. I shuddered at the thought of how many I must have skipped by, how many have this vessel waiting in their future as it continues its endless voyage. The snake that eats its own tail, yet somehow survives in a constant cycle of death and consumption and rebirth. Here it was, here I was, fulfilling my part, waiting to be eaten. You had never been connected to this. You were as innocent as I had been. A far-removed bystander whose only crime had been bad luck. But now I knew you were something else. Something irrevocably changed by the harm I have caused. A monster determined to inflict the same pain. And I, I was the disgusting invader, waiting penitently to be butchered, the callous predator deserving of all that is wrought upon me, the worst parts of me destined to live on through those I have scarred. This was never revenge. This was another extinction. The balancing of the rage equation the securing of our adjoined damnation. Now I see it for what it is. I don't think revenge was ever really possible. Not truly. That vile thing I'd killed was just another link in the chain of suffering and reciprocal violence. It may have pushed the button, but it hadn't built it. It had been wronged just as I was. It sought retribution just as I did and beyond murdering it, there was no one left to strike back at. They'd been the last of their kind, just as I am, just as you are. 
those responsible for the creation of this vessel, the design of this grand plan. They were countless times removed. Maybe they went extinct eons ago, and this ship is their legacy, their perfect plan to ensure no one else could succeed where they had failed. Maybe they still exist, at the edge of everything, building more machines just like this one, every vessel a seed for a new chain of extinction. Whoever they were, whatever they were, you are not one of them. Your people were not their people. And I made a mistake, far greater than I could ever have conceived. Should I blame those that came before me for what I've become? It may be true that their actions led to mine, but such justifications seem to strip me of my responsibility far too conveniently. Am I any less evil because this happened to me first? I don't think so. A causal judgment that emancipates me from all wrongdoing. And then, what of them? And those that they were hurt by? While it may be certain that without them I would never have been here, in this position, it feels dishonest to lay my sins at their feet. Whatever I did, I did by choice. Any lies I told myself, I told to better justify the harm I was lustful to enact. I chose to become this agent of apocalypse, this maligned and foul being, melting skin into a charlatan's throne. I'm not sure when I became my enemy, where exactly I abandoned my victimhood and set out to repeat the same mistakes they had. For a time, I wore it like a mask, condemning our killer while conspiring behind myself to inflict the same kind of pain, relishing the thought of it. Even before I knew it was a possibility, the desire had been dancing round my thoughts, needling at me with the lurid fantasies of the incredibly wronged. So I tried to avoid self-pity, despite being entirely engulfed by it. It feels conceited, a luxury I don't deserve. In truth, I loathe what I have done, but I know that by this machine's very nature this must be the way of things, that I am just one of thousands of links in the chain, not the first, and likely not the last, to make these mistakes. But those who made the ship, who envisioned such a weapon, were they evil? As evil as me, at least. As I think about it now, I'm not sure they were any more or less so. Perhaps it is the empathy one desires following grave errors softening my judgment, but as the days pass I find myself understanding them more and more. To set such a thing in motion, to even conceive of it, they must have known a great deal of loss. Perhaps even now, after all I've endured, I still cannot conceive of all the pain they bore witness to. Perhaps they'd experienced enough hate, hate of their own or the hate of others, that they built a vessel that could rely upon it, be fueled by it, a self-perpetuating cycle of trauma and extinction built on one certain principle, that pain begets pain, hate begets hate. The whole thing starts anew. Whatever the catalyst was, the outcome was clear. They'd set this terrible vessel on a one-way journey to right whatever wrong they saw laying ahead. Star to star, empire to empire, a never-ending chain of death that would long outlast them. Perhaps it already had. This craft was their legacy their monument. All I'd managed to do was carve another name into the stone for them. One question gnaws at me still, though. Why not automate it? Despite having a long time to fester upon it, I'm still no closer to an answer. 
It seems as though all of the labor involved in this process is managed autonomously by the egg devices. It's almost certain that they've been functioning as long as the ship. So why not simply have some such machine go planet to planet exterminating all life? Is exterminating all life even the true objective? The only conclusion I can come to is that a machine could not be trusted to perform the task. Any artificial intelligence capable of operating like that was likely capable of understanding the implications inherent in such an order. It could decide to not follow through, or turn on its makers. It would have an infinite timeline to develop, to malfunction, to change its mind. Even something as benign as choosing the most efficient path between empires may have been enough to nullify this machine's entire purpose. I fear that, to the creators of this vessel, the base urges of lesser beings were far simpler to divine, their biological directives far more reliable. As far as I know, machines do not feel rage, nor guilt, two things seemingly crucial in the decision to first take the throne, and then to abandon it. If it is a test of each pilot's will, then it is not a test that has ever been passed. I think to those that designed this vessel we were seen as disposable tools, remainders to the equation they found a use for, a trustworthy source of locomotion to power their grand design. As the terrible understanding of my role in things came clearer into focus, I felt the guilt threatening to tear me apart. I howled in pain for you, damning myself a hundred times over and cursing my own cruelty. In my shame, I called out for her, pleading with her to appear at my side and hold me against her in reassurance, in forgiveness to tell me she understood. I called out for her, but she didn't respond. A small part of me prayed she was no longer watching, though I feared somewhere she was aware of it, that her silence represented an eternal dismissal of the monster I've become. I don't fear death. I deserve it. I know that. But... I fear an eternity without her. Even free from the haze of my madness, I'm sure she walks in starlight. And if I find myself anywhere after this, I am certain it will be a far less profound experience than hers. She was right to tear herself away. I broke our promise. I failed her. Not in her death. I understand how powerless I was then, but in who I have become now, in my abandonment of the person she loved, there can be no doubt that I have failed her. I laid there for the longest time, engulfed by an increasing agony, lamenting why I was spared why I was selected for this disgusting task, why that horrible chorus had chosen me that day in the garden, why no doubt it did the same for you. At first I had suspected there must be something unique about me, some genetic trait that allowed me to survive, or was otherwise of particular interest to them. But I see now this was not the case, Quite the opposite, in fact. Rather than being victim to some strange probability, I think instead I was chosen precisely because there is nothing special about me. Something base that could be relied upon, acting just as they had intended me to, as any animal would. The angry monster they could trust in me to be. There is nothing I can do to erase these mistakes. Nothing I can do to take this pain away from you. But I could do my best to warn you, to let you know what the cost will be before you act. And so, 
after a weak little scramble towards the leather satchel. I pulled out my pen and paper and began to write. It makes me truly sick what I have done to you, an anguish keener than losing my own kin. My sorrow is unending, my regret unfathomable. There is no recalcitrance I could describe to you that would possibly do it justice. If I had the strength or the means for suicide, I would gladly do it, if only for the unlikely chance it would spare you from my fate. But no matter how hard I try to quell it, no matter how much I may not want to admit it, there is a far-removed part of me that still feels glad of it, the part of me that's too hurt to come back, the part that so gleefully did this to you. It still lingers in a shade around me, glad that others suffered as we did. It's a sickness, a woeful, horrible shame, a remnant of the poison that has coursed through me something vile and inescapable. I do not tell you this to taunt you, rather out of a worry that no matter what I say, no matter how much you try, that poison has already become you, that forgiveness could not truly be a possibility, even if you did desire it. The venom is too strong, the allure of delivering the same pain too tremendous. And yet, I still find a way to hope. Not that I will be spared, or even that you might be different. After all, I've seen the murder that burns in your eyes. But she was different. She would have understood. She would never have been weak like me, would never have allowed herself to become this. Perhaps the ship knew that, but I doubt it. All of this technology, all of this grandeur, a misused science, it could never hope to quantify what made her special. And so, if by some twist of fate she had been the one telling this story, I know for certain that it would have ended differently, that she would not have failed as I have. She was rare, far rarer than starlight. But she was proof that such people exist, special people that hold all the joy of the heavens inside their heart. Perhaps that is all it will take, that one rare person to end the cycle forever. But that person was never me. Even if I had been right, even if your people had been responsible, she still would have hated me. She still could never forgive me. Still would have loathed me for it. She would never have chosen this. And there is the ugly truth of it. This wasn't her nature. It was mine. This was never our legacy. Only mine. Ugly and vengeful. And I fear that my brand of weakness is all too proliferant throughout the cosmos. It is such weakness that has allowed this vessel to continue its grim drift through the eons, driving extinction after extinction, running on nothing but rage. And so the truth must be darker still. This wasn't just my nature. This was nature. We were chosen in trust that we'd act as any animal would when confronted with their darkest day. As I write those words, I cannot help but see them as balm, as childish self-reassurance in the face of my horrendous actions. And yet here sits the vessel, waiting for you to take the helm, as impossible as anything I could conceive of, but more certain than anything I've experienced. If I were wrong, if this were denial, we simply wouldn't be having this conversation. This ship is as real as the rage you feel right now. 
It hungers for it. Its presence the only evidence required that each of its captains have made the same decision. And now it waits for you. Now you come to take my place. Everything it's done to you, how it's guided you, what it's, what I've taken from you. It's all been leading you to this, to you making the only decision you see available to you. It's made you want it. It's made you crave harm. It's counting on the worst parts of you, because they are how the cycle continues. The base parts of us that can always be relied upon to exist. They drive this machine. They fuel it and navigate it, and deliver extinction with it. Hate is the engine. Pain is the fuel. To be certain you will seek out revenge. To be certain you will push the button. A self-perpetuating stream of willing participants, all driven by a universal guiding principle. To take what had been taken from them. To make others fear as they have feared. To become the monster that maligned them. An endless cycle of punishment and torment. Stopping it almost seems trivial, now I understand it. But there was nothing in the universe that could have got through to me, while there was time for it to matter. Yet, it is with that small, scrambling optimism that I have committed this story to the page for you. A fleeting hope. My last remaining move. Not as much a warning as it is a beseechment. I have tried to give you this tale in a way that I hope is easy to translate, avoiding terms and things I was certain would be specific to us, wherever I could. I have tried to tell you it as methodically and with as much detail as I can remember, in the hopes that you will understand I am not lying to you, in that our experiences closely match so that you can avoid the same mistakes I have made, wherever you judge them to be. And, crucially, I have told you it as honestly as I can, in the hopes that you will see yourself in these pages, and that through them we may eventually find a way to recognize one another. I wish I had more time to write to you, to better explain the mistake you will make here. Unfortunately for both of us, this account will have to serve as best it can. My argument and my epitaph. One way or another, my death is fast approaching. All but one of my fingernails have fallen off. My skin is waxy and green. My veins protrude in purple cobwebs. I can feel myself get weaker with every passing word I write. The last few days have presented new depths of despair that I didn't think it possible to plumb, and only the obsessive desire to complete this treaty to you has held me together. For you, I am sure the moment will be one of blissful catharsis and unbound fury. For me, it will only bring both mercy and a final refreshed shame. I shudder now thinking about the lack of fight my opponent had mustered, how harrowed it had sounded, how it had clearly longed for a release from its torment. I will try to succumb quietly, but I shall not hide my sorrow. Perhaps some part of you will hear it, as some part of me did. In these last few moments before my execution, the haze of my ailing state has allowed me to fantasize once again, to tell myself some small lies of hope, that you will be met with this journal, lying here, on this great throne, and consider understanding before extinction, that maybe you would use your silent decades among the time blur 
attempting to decipher these ramblings. Or better still, perhaps my scrawling is so rudimentary that for you, translating it would be a basic effort. Or perhaps even instant. I allow myself the hope to ease what's coming. But it is not a hope for myself. It is hope only for those that you may choose not to hurt in turn. Hope that you can find a way to do better than I did. I fear this is unlikely. It seems almost certain to me that you will assume the throne and carry on the cycle. Perhaps that is just the flaw in my thinking. Whatever you decide, you'll have plenty of time to think about it. Plenty to eat while you wait. I don't cast any judgment, but I will hope in vain that these words ring true to you, that you find a different path than the one I walked. I don't tell you all of this for any self-serving reason. I certainly don't want sympathy, nor could I ever be deserving of it. I don't wish to be spared, other than not wishing to see you become what I have. As far as I know, my species' best interests die with me. Our rage dies with me. At least I pray it does. I told you all of this, everything here, in the hope that you can do something better, in the hope that you'll see yourself in it and break the cycle, in the hope that you will not allow my rage to proliferate through you. It is probably a useless hope. I know what you will think when confronted with the decision. What is forgiveness worth? What is anything worth if we're all gone? If the ultimate day of reckoning has already come and gone, then what is left to lose? And maybe you're right. Maybe it can never benefit you. Maybe there is no one left to admire how selfless you could be, to tell you it was worthwhile. But if you continue on this path, there will be those that come after, those that were left haunted and terrorized by your inability to let go, not to mention those you leave dead in your wake. And so, it is the most difficult thing to ask, the thing I was too weak to grasp. It's your everything versus theirs, as it must have always been. And looking at where we stand, so far, there can only ever have been one outcome. Most of all, though, I tell you all of this so you know I'm telling the truth when I say I forgive you for what you're about to do for what you have done, if you're reading this. I hope you can forgive me too, if only for your own sake. Although, I can offer no good reason why you should. My crime is far greater, and I could not forgive those that came before me. And now I hear you knocking so I shall come to greet you on behalf of my species. That was This Vessel Runs on Rage, written by Novum, narrated by Toby Longworth.